Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe, vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous people. Are there any documents? Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for the committee to meet? Clerk. Yes, Mr President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. Uh, the question is that the um, committees be authorised to meet during the sittings of the Senate today. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Uh, remote participation in Senate proceedings. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for the remote participation of senators. There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. I move that the rules for remote participation in Senate proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its first report of 2021 have effect during the sittings of the Senate from 22 November to 2 December 2021. I will put that question. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Mo Minister Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the following bills be considered today at the time for private senators' bills. The COVID-19 vaccination status prevention of discrimination bill 2021 and public government's performance and accountability amendment improved grants reporting bill 2021. I'll put that motion. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Private Senators' Bills. General Business Order of the Day number 94, COVID-19 Vaccination Status Prevention of Discrimination Bill 2021. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Once again, I rise in this chamber with a heavy heart to bear witness to the demise of Australian democracy and freedom. Once again, I am forced to remind this chamber of the most essential foundation for a successful free democracy, the right to choose. Once again, I am moved to lament the theft of this most fundamental human right from the Australian people by the very representatives who are charged with protecting it. And once again, I am obliged to call out rogue premiers for authoritarian overreach and call on the prime minister to show some leadership and rein them in. Last week, the Prime Minister said he didn't support vaccination mandates enforced by governments. He said state governments should step back and let Australians take their lives back. Australians have had a gut pull, he said, and he's right. Not that Stephen Miles gives him any credit. This frightened little schoolboy masquerading as Queensland's Deputy Premier is so completely out of his depth that he panics whenever someone threatens Labor for the police to command and control Queensland's captive po um, population. The Prime Minister said people should be able to go to get a cup of coffee in Brisbane regardless of whether they've been vaccinated against COVID-19. But people in Brisbane can't get a cup of coffee if they haven't been vaccinated. People who call Brisbane home will not be permitted to return there from interstate next month if they haven't vaccinated. Hospitality business in Brisbane will be banned from opening if they don't enforce mandates against customers who haven't been vaccinated. 
Many people in Brisbane, including those with critical positions in health, education, freight and law enforcement, have lost their jobs because they haven't been vaccinated. And this Prime Minister has done nothing to prevent this pandemic of discrimination unleashed on the people of Brisbane or anywhere else in Australia. In the Northern Territory, anyone with a job involving public interaction with loss will lose their job and pay a $5,000 fine if they haven't been vaccinated. In South Australia, every adult who works or volunteers at a school won't be able to do so if they haven't been vaccinated. State governments are relishing this extraordinary power to command and control the people they are supposed to serve. They are desperate to keep this power for as long as they can. They have ignored the Prime Minister's national plan and the decision of the National Cabinet. The Victorian government relishes the, this power so much they're trying to permanently enshrine it in law, giving the Premier unprecedented authority to act like a dictator. And still the Prime Minister has done nothing to stop this discrimination. These vaccines were rushed. Their long-term effects are unknown. The Therapeutic Goods Administration has recorded more than 77,000 adverse reactions to the vaccines, including more than 600 deaths. We are part of a grand experiment. Australia is now a continental petri dish, and those Australians who exercise their rights to refuse this experimentation on their bodies face a bleak future as second-class citizens. What isn't experimental and what has been shown to be highly effective in treating COVID-19 is a medication called ivermectin. It's been in use for more than 40 years, during which time then three and a half billion doses have been administered by doctors with no ill effects. Last year, a data emerged on its effectiveness against COVID-19 and Australian doctors screamed for permission to use ivermectin to treat patients. The authorities just banned it and still the Prime Minister did nothing. No, all the Prime Minister has done is let state governments get away with their grab for power and leave his national roadmap and his authority in tatters. The cost to our economy has been staggering, but it is the cost to our democracy and our freedom which is even more concerning. One nation will not stand by and witness the demise of Australian democracy and freedom without a fight. We don't do this lightly. We do it with sincere regret that such legislation is even necessary. But make no mistake, it is not only necessary but absolutely vital. Australians' right to choose is protected from the vaccine discrimination running rampant across this country. You might not agree with the choices Australians people make, but that doesn't mean the right to choose should be stolen from them. Senators here are on notice. If you don't support my legislation, then you don't support Australian democracy and freedom, and you don't support the right to choose. If you don't support my legislation, you are saying to Australians their rights will be protected only so long as they do not conflict with the state. Australia is a democracy, one of the most successful in the world. We are not here to wield power against the Australian people. We are here to wield the power of the Australian people. We have no right to take away their rights. We are charged with protecting their rights and it is in this spirit that One Nation has introduced the COVID-19 vaccination status prevention of discrimination bill 2021. This legislation is urgent, urgently needed to arrest and reverse the pandemic of discrimination which has been unleashed on the Australian people. I'd like to relay the words of a doctor, an expert in immunology, which has taken the risk of speaking to me about his concerns about the COVID-19 vaccines. I'm angry and frustrated at coercive, va coercive vaccine mandates healthcare workers now face. After two years of sacrificing everything, we have to care for COVID patients at risk to ourselves and our families. We are now being stood down across the country for simply asking to have a choice, even our own health a topic we are, we alone are expert in. A recent Lancet study showed vaccination alone is not sufficient to prevent transmission of the Delta variant. This means that both vaccinated and unvaccinated are as contagious as each other. There's no evidence proving that unvaccinated healthcare workers pose an additional risk. Many of my colleagues 
are alarmed at the failure of Australia's COVID response to deal with the critical issues of informed consent and COVID prevention. We are further alarmed at the censorship of early treatment options. These failures cause direct patient harm, leading to further vaccine hesitancy and forcing doctors to break their Hippocratic oath. Following the position statement by the Australian Health Protection uh, practitioners registration agency on COVID-19 vaccination. Several of my colleagues have been threatened with the loss of their registration for simply and honestly discussing vaccine hesitation with their patients. Most of the more educated among my colleagues, the experts in their field, are in fact the most vaccine hesitant group in Australian society. As Health Minister Greg Hunt said, the world is engaged in the largest clinical trial the largest global vaccination trial ever. Australian patients need to know this. Trials like these must provide long-term data in order to prove safety. How is it possible in less than two years, by the definition of informed consent, doctors cannot and are not able to accurately weigh the risk of COVID vaccines without long-term data? We have no way of knowing if these vaccines will cause future autoimmune injuries, which only present months to years after vaccination. The government and media have placed doctors in an impossible position. The public has been told to speak to their doctors if they have concerns about the vaccines, but due to the APRA's gag orders, those doctors are not allowed to deviate from the current narrative for fear of losing their licence to practice. How can doctors possibly inform patients, consent and overcome hesitancy when we're gagged and have no long-term data? This is not informed consent at best. It is manufactured consent at worst. It is coercion. These are the same doctors when we were hit with COVID last year and no vaccination, that they are on the front line working in the hospitals beside the, the nurses. They put their lives on the line that we did not know what causes this pandemic would actually take. But now they are treated like criminals. They can't go into, into the hospitals. In Rockhampton Hospital, there are um, shift workers there, shifts that no doctor is available because they won't allow the unvaccinated doctors to attend. We are on the verge of, of um, dividing our nation and people with differences of opinion. As the doctor said, they have been gagged. They are in fear of losing their license or a heavy fine. This is not Australia. People, this by gag um, debate on the whole issue has been uh, stopped. Media cannot put across anyone who has a, a difference of an opinion and want to debate this. This is the only place we can do it on the floor of parliament. Hence my stance with regards to this vaccination, that we have a right, people have a right to actually choose whether they want to have this vaccination or not. As I have stated quite clearly, under the constitution, section 5123A, the Prime Minister cannot impose mandatory, max, mandatory vaccinations on the, on the people. That is what he has said, because it's true, he can't do it. And if we actually go back to the Constitution, at the signing of that in 1901 at Federation, they actually then, all the states agreed to this Constitution, they signed off on it. So therefore, it is arguable in the court of law, if challenged, that this Australian Constitution should override state laws to rein in these premiers of wielding their power and forcing people to have this vaccination against their will. Also on a section 109 of the Australian Constitution, if you have two conflicting laws, the federal law will override the state law, hence my bill. And if these politicians really care for the freedom and the rights of the people of this nation, they will support this legislation because it states you cannot force mandatory, mandatory vaccinations, exactly what the Prime Minister is stating. No forced mandatory vaccinations. But it's also stop the discrimination of people in this nation being stopped from going into pubs, clubs and even hospitals. They're saying now that you cannot go into a hospital unless you have proven that you have a vaccination. What is a country coming to? For those people out there who are saying, oh, well, get on with it, just get the vaccination. It's all right, you know, don't worry about it. 
No, it's not all right, because I can tell you the next thing. If you allow these states, these premiers, to have the power of you and your rights, what will be next? Are they going to say, because you don't work and pay taxes in this nation, that you are not going to have the right to vote? Are they going to say that, oh, well, because we've got a, a crisis with housing, are they going to say that just because you have so many bedrooms in your house that you don't utilise, that you're going to have to downsize, or you're going to have to open up your house to other people? This could lead to anything, the control of the premiers. This is nothing but a political stunt because we're coming into a federal election. Look at the three states, all premier state, all the premiers are all Labor. This is what Labor is doing to actually undermine the Morrison government so they are seen as weak. And I will say the Prime Minister is weak because he says there should not be vaccine mandates. Well, then do something about it. And all, what I'm also saying is the fact that if the Prime Minister is not happy with my bill, then change it. You have the, you have the Solicitor General, you have the means to actually do it, to make changes that you will, will um, give the people back their rights and their freedoms in this nation. Why do you think so many people have protested on the streets of this nation? They're, a lot of these people, they're not ratbags, they're not idiots, and that's what the media and the premiers are trying to say, that they are extremists. They're not extremists. They're everyday Australians. They could be your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your cousins, your neighbours. You know they're not extremists. These are people that have had a gutful. They've had enough. And I can't blame them because so have I. And hence that is why, and I thank my colleague Malcolm Roberts from the bottom of my heart to stand strong with me on this, that if I know that the Prime Minister has told me they don't intend to support this bill, either does the Labor Party, how weak and gutless they are, and so do are the Greens. And the whole fact is that these are the Labor Party are supposed to be there for the workers, um, that they're standing for, up for those blue collar workers. These are the people, these are the police, the nurses, the ambulance drivers, these are the people that are your voters that are screaming out, help us. That's why we've got 7,000 nurses in Queensland, 7,000 in South Australia and right across the country who are refusing to have this vaccination. Why? They're not anti-vaxxers. Remember that the states, under their profession previously, they've had to have all the other vaccinations. Why are they hesitant about this one? I'll tell you why. It's because they've seen the adverse side effects of people coming into the hospital now that have had the vaccinations. That's why they don't want it. They're not anti-vaxxers, but they know that they want to have good health for the rest of their life. And there's no one that can guarantee this. No one in the world can guarantee because we don't know the long-term effects from having this COVID-19. Australia's not against getting vaccinated. You have Perovsky um, uh, in South Australia. He's inventing a vaccine that's protein-based. Why aren't we taking it up? Why is the TGA slamming doors in his face? Why are we supporting Pfizer and AstraZeneca that are actually making billions of dollars out of this? No, I don't believe that this is right. And I wish the Prime Minister would stand up and be the leader of this nation with people because that's what they want. And for those members of parliament who are going to cross the floor and support this bill today, I thank you, and so does the Australian people. But I intend to show up the rest of you who are too bloody gutless to stand up for the rights of the people of Australia, because I hope they have their say at the next election and throw you out on the ear. This is about the people's rights and their freedoms, and I will fight them to the death for that for that reason. I thank the doctor for his words as thank well. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madding, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I, I rise to support uh, this legislation to end uh, unfair, cruel uh, and unnecessary and un-Australian uh, vaccine mandates on the Australian people. You should not need to undergo a medical procedure to earn a living. Everybody should have the right to work and provide for their family. And no government, no government in this free country that I was born in, has the right to take away people's right to work and provide for their family. Yet that is what we see, see a variety of state governments doing across the country. Uh, people are being forced to choose between having a medical procedure and keeping their business or keeping their job and ultimately keeping their house. I thought I was born in a free country. I think a lot of other Australians thought they were too. I think a lot of Australians respect the sacrifice that previous generations of Australians put in for us to have that right. But those rights 
are being stripped away from us and will be denied to our children unless we stand back up against this tyranny. I have been in the last week since the Queensland government announced its vaccine mandates, I have been inundated with small businesses, with workers who are at their wits end because they don't know how they're going to provide for their family. They do not know how they're going to put bread on the table next year. And I've always said the coronavirus is a serious thing. We've had to take serious action. And, and Australians have gone through. Australia, these businesses that are calling me, they've sacrificed. They've willingly shut their doors. They went through cash flow problems last year to lock down and protect people, but never did they think that their government would turn around after all that and put them out on the street. But that is what is happening. There's a coffee shop in Rockhampton. Half his staff is not vaccinated and don't want to be. He himself is not vaccinated. He might have to shut his doors in a month's time. His wife is currently pregnant. She doesn't want to be vaccinated. She is being told she can't go to antenatal classes while she is not vaccinated. What the hell happened to my body, my choice? Why are we making pregnant women, pregnant women uh, go through a medical procedure that they don't want to have? That is what these laws are doing. There are nurses uh, who have given their lives, put themselves on the front line last year. And now we're saying, thanks for your service, no more, you're out. No leave without, no leave without pay, no, 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 um, no payout of their terms, just you're gone. You're gone. Four, apparently 4,000 nurses have walked off the job in Queensland over the past month, and there are probably more. They're the ones we know about due to the mandates itself, or have said it's because of the mandates. That's 5 per cent of the health workforce in this country, in, in, in Queensland. Now, we're apparently we're apparently doing this to protect the hospital system, but we're losing 5 per cent or so of our health workforce. There's already a stretched hospital system. It is already a situation where people sometimes can't get a bed. So how is this? How are these policies actually going to deliver the objective they state they want to when 5,000 workers have walked off the job in our health system in Queensland over the past month? And I don't support these mandates and I support this legislation because vaccine mandates don't work. I am vaccinated. I support the vaccination rollout. I encourage others to be vaccinated because I think it does protect uh, oneself uh, from the severe disease that COVID can inflict. But, but these vaccines do not seem to be doing a good job at stopping transmission, and therefore there is no justification to require other people uh, to do what you have done. There is no justification to take choice off others because it is not going to work. And for those who support vaccine mandates in this place, for those who support Name me one country where vaccine passports are working. Just one. Just one. Because there are lots of countries doing it. We are in this lucky position in Australia where we have not had widespread coronavirus. We can see lots of other examples of other countries and what they have done, uh, what they are doing in response to it, lockdowns, the Sweden approach, lots of different varieties across the world. And a lot of countries have introduced vaccine passports and vaccine mandates. So, so, for the advocates of vaccine mandates, this, this incredibly authoritarian policy that strips rights off people, just name me one country where the vaccine passports have helped stop the spread of coronavirus. There just are, one. There are none. Senator McMahon is right. There are none. There are none. And let's go through a few of them. Austria, currently having more than 10,000 cases a day, a record. They have vaccine passports. Bulgaria, currently having nearly 5,000 cases a day. That's a record for them. They have vaccine passports. The Czech Republic, they're at 10,000 cases a day, just below their previous record of 12,000 cases a day. They have vaccine passports. France have introduced vaccine passports. They're experiencing massive coronavirus at the moment. Serbia are experiencing 7,500 cases a day, a record. They've, had, they've got vaccine passports. Germany uh, are introducing vaccine passports. They've got 40,000 cases a day. It's almost double their previous record. The Netherlands and Switzerland are in the same boat. Vaccine passports simply do not work. They are a failed policy that we should walk away from before this gets any worse for all of us. Before we inflict more pain, more pain on everybody, let's walk away from these mandates. Now, I do want to deal with the issue that will be raised about whether this is the Commonwealth government's responsibility. That's a fair point. These mandates have come in place by state governments, and they are no doubt within the purview of state governments with their 
constitutional power over public health. There's no doubt about that. Obviously, though, the Commonwealth Government does have powers from time to time to override the states. Indeed, the Constitution does say uh, that where a law at the Commonwealth level conflicts with the state government law, the Commonwealth Government will, the Commonwealth government law will prevail. The question is then, can we legislate in this area? Well, this legislation, this legislation uses a variety of powers that the Commonwealth Government has, like the corporation's power, which has been clearly established by the High Court uh, as one with significant uh, uh, reach. Uh, which we apply in many different areas, in environmental policy, uh, in industrial relations policy, and as no doubt I think it could apply here in public health policy too. But more importantly, more importantly uh, given the rights we are talking about here, this bill, this bill uses the Commonwealth Government's international treaties powers uh, uh, that are all, have also been backed up by High Court rulings, that we have the right then to make laws that enforce treaties. And where does the treaty come from in this instance that gives us this power? Well, we are a signatory to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And I'll refer to the Australian government's Attorney General website here. The Attorney General's website, the official Australian government website, says that the right to work includes the right to, of everyone to the opportunity to gain his or her living by work, which he or she, he or she sorry, freely chooses or accepts. It goes on to say, uh, where does the right to work and rights and work come from? Australia is a party to seven core international human rights treaties. The right to work and rights in work is contained in Article 61781A of the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. We clearly have the power here, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, to enforce these basic rights across Australia because that is clearly a job of the federal government to enforce human rights in this country. They are basic rights that should be available to every Australian citizen, regardless of where they live or where they are born or whether they are born overseas. It's a birthright of anyone in this country to have the right to work. We have signed up to that. We should implement that and stand by that by overriding these unfair, unethical and cruel uh, uh, state government mandates. Now, I, in saying that, I do think this bill has the power to do these things. I, uh, I do have. I would make some amendments to this legislation. I think it's important to note that this legislation has its origins with a bill that, in the other place, Mr. Craig Kelly and Mr. George Christensen uh, drafted. Uh, uh, Senator Hanson has made some changes. She's changed the 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 approach in that bill from vaccine passports to discrimination, but the basic structure. Uh, remains the same. I though, do think that it is worthy to have some amendments. I will support this bill regardless of whether those amendments are accepted or not, but I do think uh, that the Australian government should retain the power of deciding who comes to this country and whether they're vaccinated or not. That was something in the original Kelly Christensen bill that I would seek to reinsert. I do think that we do need to look at exceptions in high-risk situations, uh, such as aged care centres, such as uh, uh, COVID wards in hospitals where perhaps a requirement for vaccination would reduce risk in a high risk situation. Those, those, my amendments though, would ensure that any such exceptions are very narrowly targeted and don't otherwise impinge on someone's right to work and make a living. So, for example, in a hospital, if someone is, does not want to be vaccinated, that may mean they will not be able to work in the COVID ward, but hospitals are big places and will surely be able to find other means of work for those people. What my principle here is, is that we should just respect each other as Australians and respect each other's choices. And if someone else wants to make a different choice to me, I don't want to make, it, make their life miserable, as the head of the Queensland Medical Association said the other day, remarkably said, that he said anyone unvaccinated will be lonely and miserable. What, what an inhumane thing to say about a fellow Australian. And I don't want to take any lectures anymore from the Labor Party about compassion or refugees uh, or people's rights to work, because the Labor Party here are not standing by the unions. They're not standing by the CFMEU, who are fighting BHP at the moment on vaccine mandates. I am. I'm standing with the CFMEU. I support their case. I'm against big business telling people what to do. But the Labor Party now here are not supporting the labourers of this country who just want to work and provide for their families. They have deserted them. They have deserted them, and worse, they are vilifying them. They are vilifying them. We had the spectacle last week of the Deputy Premier of Queensland, Stephen Miles, say that those protesting, those people out there protesting, 
are the fringe elements of society. That's what he said. He said they were the fringe elements of society. We saw hundreds of thousands of Australians out there on the weekend. Thus far, I've seen just one arrest, one arrest in the whole protest, and the police in Victoria said that was actually unrelated to the protest. All right, they, these have been the most peaceful, large-scale protests we have ever seen in this country. And then we have the deputy premier out there saying to average men and women in this country who just want to work that they are fringe elements. They are fringe elements. That's the contempt that the modern Labor Party has for the average working man and woman in this country. Dan Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, Mr Daniel Andrews, he's out there saying that they're radical extremists. All these people that just want to work and own a business and run a coffee shop, you're a radical extremist at the moment. Now, according to the Victorian Labor Premier, that's how you've been labelled. Well, this division has to end, and passing this legislation would be, would be a strike for unity in this country, a strike against further division. Because I fear what's going to happen next year. I didn't think we'd end up in this place when COVID first hit last year. I supported the lockdowns. I thought we all had to, we're all in this together. Remember that? Remember we were all in this together? That's, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. And now we're dividing our community, uh, segmenting them up, segregating ourselves uh, based on the politics of fear. Because if we do not end this here, what will be next next year? Because as I said, the passports aren't going to stop COVID. We know that. Everybody here knows that. They may not express it, but they know it. They know it that the passports aren't going to end COVID. We will get outbreaks next year. We will have outbreaks. We'll go, even with we will have high vaccination rates. That's clear. But we will have outbreaks. And what will happen then? Because if I know governments well, I don't think they're going to get up in March next year and say, "Oh, look." Sorry about these uh, record coronavirus cases. We were at fault. We were wrong about the passports. That was our fault. You know, mea culpa. That's not what governments will do. What they'll do is they'll double down and they'll blame the unvaccinated even more. They'll seek to blame someone. They'll seek to say these outbreaks are all because of the unvaccinated, when it's clearly not true. It can't be statistically true in these countries. There's not enough unvaccinated people to have these spreads. But that's what they'll do and we'll further divide our society. And then what will happen? Then they'll say, we've got to have all the kids vaccinated. They've all got to line up. And that's, <laughs> you know, I'm on the front lines of this battle because that's where I draw the line. I am not ever going to support a government's forcing children to get these vaccines. But that is where we are headed unless we are put, put this to a stop now. That's what they will do. That's what governments will do when these fa clearly failed policies fail. Then they'll seek to say, let's go after the kids. We've got to vaccinate them too. Now, there is no justification for that in health terms. The Doherty modelling itself clearly shows that vaccinating children has almost no effect on coronavirus spreads. But that won't matter. That won't matter. There'll be new health advice from the failed uh, uh, and hopeless medical associations of this country who continue to say that opening up will cause massive lockdowns and then are wrong, then are massively wrong. These people should have no credibility now. What needs to happen is we restore freedom in this country. We let every Australian choice. I trust the Australian people to make the right decisions. I trust the Australian people to be, to make, be the masters of their own health care. I trust Australians to look after their own families. I trust Australians to work and cooperate and do business with each other without the heavy hand of government being over them all the time. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. Well, Labor supports vaccine mandates where they are guided by public health advice. And that is because we want to see as many people as possible vaccinated as soon as possible to keep Australian businesses open and keep all Australians safe, including Australian workers. We do not want more lockdowns. What we need right now, what Australians are calling out for, is leadership from the national government and especially from the Prime Minister on this issue. But instead, what do we have? We've got the bungled vaccine rollout, a Prime Minister who forgot to order vaccines, who lied when he said we were at the front of the queue. We were at the back of the queue. We had a disastrous, tragic third outbreak that saw hundreds of people die. That is what happens when people are not vaccinated. They get sick and they die. Lives and livelihoods are lost. 
Instead, what do we have? We have a prime minister who is dog whistling, dog whistling to extremists who drag around gallows in protests, calling for state premiers to be hanged. This is un-Australian. And yet the Australian Prime Minister cannot call it out, cannot unequivocally condemn it. The fact of the matter is we are debating this bill this morning because the government has given up its time to one nation. They have jettisoned Senator McMahon's bill. They have jettisoned Senator McKenzie's bill. Instead, we are debating Senator Hansen's bill. And the government has made that deliberate decision because the prime minister is pandering to these extremist elements. And let's understand why he is pandering. Let us understand this. As Pauline, Senator Hansen, Pauline Hansen said, in the Senate, I hold two of three votes. The government needs to pass their legislation. So I have the deciding factor of what happens in the Senate. I will not be supporting or voting for any government legislation from here on in until we get our, my private member's bill up. That is what we are doing here today. The Prime Minister has made sure we don't get to talk about Senator McMahon's bill. We don't get to talk about Senator McKenzie's bill. We get to talk about Senator Hansen's bill because he is doing a wink and a nod and a dog whistle to extremist elements. The same prime minister who can't call out and condemn unequivocally threats of violence and assassination against elected leaders in this country is here today allowing these same extremist elements to run their same arguments. It's another example of this Prime Minister who seeks to divide Australians rather than unite them, that seeks to undermine the tremendous progress we have made as a country because we are all in this together, because people have come together, because people have worked hard to ensure that they can get access to the vaccine, that people understand the benefits of the vaccine. And yes, where is guided by health advice where we have mandates for a vaccine to keep all of us safe. Now, we are yet to reach 80% double doses uh, rates for eligible people in Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, or the Northern Territory. Many vulnerable communities, vaccine coverage is much lower than that. Now is not the time to be sending mixed messages, Prime Minister, on the importance of getting vaccinated. And so I say here to the Chamber today that Labour condemns, without reservation, without qualification, the violent threats being made by anti-vaccination protesters, even if the Prime Minister won't do it. We live in a society, in a community, and that means we have obligations to one another. We have obligations to one another to tame this virus, to look out for one another, to keep each other safe. And the Prime Minister is trying to divide us. He is trying to diminish that collective effort and undermine all that good and all of that progress that Australians have made together. And he's doing it with dangerous dog whistling, with double speak that we hear from him. He is claiming credit for the high vaccination rates, but without taking responsibility for the measures that got us here. Now, what is especially troubling is that for mainstream Australians, for ordinary Australians, we see the kind of violent politics that played out in the United States over the last couple of years, that exploded in the January Capitol Hill riots. And we reject it. Mainstream Australians reject it. But the Prime Minister seems to want to give it a wink and a nod to curry favour with those types of violent views and violent threats. We know that there are government members and senators who prefer this division and who are instead spreading vaccine misinformation. Senator Rennick has been a relentless person in this space. His efforts to undermine the nation's vaccine rollout with anti-vax content. For months, Senator Rennick has been pursuing an agenda to undermine the vaccine rollout. Senator Rennick is the one running scare campaigns on social media pages. And as reported in the New Daily this morning, Senator Rennick has set up a taxpayer-funded website to publish unverified reports of alleged vaccine adverse events and claim a government cover-up of the side effects. And Senator Rennick tries to pretend that he's actually not a member of the government. 
The opposition condemns Senator Rannick's actions, and as has the Australian Medical Association Vice President, Dr. Chris Moy, who has called Senator Rennick's posts about as anti-scientific as you can get. Just this morning, Senator Canavan tweeted against workplace vaccination mandates, a position in direct opposition to his own government's mandate for aged care workers. And then there is Senator Antic, who's undermining the vaccine rollout and feeding these dangerous protests by saying, quote, Australians are being coerced into taking vaccine COVID vaccinations. Australians are not being discriminated against and coerced. It is their choice whether or not to be vaccinated. And of course, we cannot forget the member for Dawson, who has undermined health advice throughout this pandemic by promoting ivermectin as a COVID-19 treatment, which the TGA has banned for COVID treatment as, quote, there are a number of significant public health risks associated with taking ivermectin in an attempt to prevent prevent COVID-19 infection rather than getting vaccinated. The member for Dawson has also compared vaccine mandates to apartheid. Once again, we will remind the member for Dawson that the Morrison government, which he is a member of, has a vaccine mandate in place for aged care workers. And by the way, it's not just the vaccine mandate for aged care workers. Let's revisit some of the views of the Prime Minister from 2015. In 2015, this Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison, when he was Minister for Social Services, brought in the no jab, no play policy. Parents who vaccinate their children should have confidence they can take their children to childcare without the fear their children will be at the risk of contracting a serious or potentially life-threatening illness because of the conscientious objections of others. That was the Prime Minister in 2015. His policy, government policy, is that children should be immunized. Mr. Morrison, Mr. Morrison, in August this year, the same Prime Minister who brought in no jab, no play, said that he expected the COVID-19 vaccine to be, and I quote, as mandatory as you can possibly make it. Mr. Morrison then went on to say, and I quote, there are always exemptions for any vaccine on medical grounds, but they should be, but that should be the only basis. And then he went on to say, this year, he went on to say, I was the minister that established no jab, no play, so my view on this is pretty clear and not for turning. Here's the thing. You've got a slippery prime minister who lies as effortlessly as he puts on his socks in the morning. Was he lying in 2015 or is he lying now? Was he lying earlier this year when he said he supported vaccine mandates or is he lying now? Is he so willing to pander to violent extremists, to threats of assassination against elected officials, against premiers and members of parliament? Is he so willing to incite division and hatred and fear? Is that the path he wants to victory? Is that the game he is playing? That is why we are here today, because he is pandering to one nation. He is unwilling to say the things he said in 2015, to say the things he said earlier this year. This is a prime minister who will say or do anything. This is a prime minister who cannot be trusted. And on this issue, we are talking about the safety, the security, the lives and the livelihoods of our fellow Australians. The nation is crying out for national leadership. And if the prime minister of the day Mr. Morrison is unwilling to show that leadership, is unwilling to unequivocally condemn the threats of violence. If the Prime Minister of the day is unwilling to reject violent extremism, ideologically motivated violent extremism, then we not only have an opportunity to take him out of office at the next election, indeed, Australia, we have an obligation to do it. Thank you. Senator Keneally. Senator Steele, John, remotely. Oh, sorry, Senator Rennick. I'm so sorry. I apologise.
Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. <clears throat> and first of all, I'd like to start room. today by acknowledging all the people who have suffered injuries from the vaccines. <clears throat> Uh, when I signed up to become a senator two and a half years ago, uh, I signed up to protect the Australian people uh, and particularly to make sure that we always look after the health and well-being of those people. The name of the game uh, you know, with health is to make sure that everyone has a good health outcome. <clears throat> and It's not just about the vaccine rollout and reaching targets. That's a means to an end, and the end in itself is good health for everyone. And no, the best people to do that are the people themselves in consultation with their doctor. And we shouldn't be having mandates imposed upon people uh, by bureaucrats, uh, by governments or by the media. Uh, you know, what, what we have got, however, uh, is that we have got Australians who have been injured, who did the right thing, who listened to the government that said the vaccines were safe and effective. And what we've seen is many of these victims have been scorned uh, and ignored by the medical community. Uh, that must be, it must be particularly difficult to be, have, a, have an injury at the best of times, uh, but it must be so much more worse uh, when you go to the doctor or the hospital and you're not getting the attention that you need. Uh, so uh, that is why I'm speaking here today. Um, and in particular, what I would like to do, and the reason why I am withholding my vote from the government, uh, first and foremost, is to improve the indemnity scheme for those people who have been injured by the vaccine. People have been injured for months now. There have been people who have been paralysed down their right-hand side. There's people who have had strokes, pulmonary embolisms, myocarditis, pericarditis, functional neurological disorders. And these people have been left helpless by a government who are more than happy to indemnify foreign pharmaceutical companies, many of whom are convicted felons for past uh, misdemeanours, but now we are neglecting suffering Australians. I believe that these people should be compensated for every dollar they spend as a result of vaccine injuries. The threshold should not start at $5,000. They should be compensated as well for their loss of income as a result of not being able to work because of the vaccine injury. Furthermore, they need to be compensated straight away and not have to wait for months. I know one lady who was paralysed back in June. She's been bedridden most of that time. She's had a broken ankle. She has to spend $400 a month on potassium IV injections just to keep her alive. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that we've got an obligation to protect people who are going such shocking uh, medical uh, injuries. Furthermore, in the case of healthy people who had no underlying conditions, the onus of proof should be on the government to prove that serious injuries weren't caused by the vaccines and not the other way around. These victims should not be treated like criminals and expected to prove beyond reasonable doubt that their injury was caused by the vaccine, but rather the civil weight of evidence be used, and that is the balance of probabilities. You know, it would be very intimidating for someone who's sick and injured and who isn't a medical expert to go up in front of a board of lawyers and doctors who are trying to you know, basically talk these people out of compensation uh, merely because the government doesn't want to do the right thing by its people. But most of all, what these people want is their, for their voices to be heard, for their injuries to be treated with the same level of concern as a COVID patient. These people should not be shunned and scorned by the very people who are expected to care for them. To be fair to the medical community, this is not your fault. I have heard from countless doctors, nurses and patients that backroom bureaucrats, namely APRA and the TGA, are threatening the medical staff with deregistration if they speak up about vaccine injuries. This needs to stop. Now, this even leads to the more even egregious act in that people who have suffered an adverse re reaction from the first dose of the vaccine are now required to get a second shot. What kind of cruel, inhumane act is this? Seriously, what has happened to common decency and human compassion? Now, I note that Senator Keneally used the word violent extremism uh, and violence a lot in her speech, but can I say the threat of having to take a second vaccine if you've already had an adverse reaction from the first vaccine, I think is violence in itself. It is intolerably cruel 
and it is not something I intend to walk by. Furthermore, I don't understand why it is so necessary to force these people into getting a vaccine if we are already at 84 per cent double vaccinated for the adult population over 16. If you asked the Prime Minister and the Premiers last year if they would accept this figure as a reasonable rate uh, of progress and, and, and would that achieve herd immunity, I'm sure they all would have said yes. So why are the Premiers still pushing vaccination so hard? I have been contacted by thousands of people who have valid medical reasons why they can't take the vaccine. Many have even been granted exemptions by their doctors as to why they can't take a second vaccine, but, the, but they are still being excluded by the premiers from society. Now, if a doctor says that you can't take a vaccine and you're given an exemption, who are the premiers and the government to say to people we're going to exclude you from society. These people are already injured. Why are we shunning them? Why are we putting them down? Why are we putting the spin of the political narrative over the health and well-being of the Australian people? You know, this issue is way above politics. It is about the people, and we should not be playing political games with their health. Where there is a risk, there must be choice. This is especially so in regards to healthy people who have a very low risk of serious injury from COVID. From COVID. They should be entitled to weigh up the relative risk of an injury from COVID versus an injury from the vaccine. Instead, we have had their rights and their choices taken away from them. From them. And the problem with that is, is that federal legislation in the immunisation handbook itself says that you cannot coerce people into taking a vaccine. Section 5123A of the Constitution says that you cannot conscript people into giving the vaccine, you know, especially in regards to medical procedures. Now, that was put in the Constitution as a result of the referendum. That's actually one of the very few referendums about the Constitution that's actually got up. But that only got up on the condition that people couldn't be conscripted into taking the vaccine. So we need the Prime Minister and the federal government to stand up to the, the state premiers. At the end of the day, whilst I'm a proud Queenslander, I'm a much more prouder Australian, and the last thing I want to see is the premiers tear this country apart by playing political games at the expense of people's health and at the expense of our national unity. Enough is enough. <clears throat> the government overreach of the state premiers in destroying our civil liberties has gone too far. This is no longer about health, but rather politicians wielding power for the sake of power rather, doing, rather than doing what they should be doing and protecting the people. For those of you who say I should not be holding the parliament to ransom, I say this. Politicians should not be holding people to ransom. Politicians should not be holding people to ransom with their health. They should not be, the people should not be held to ransom with their livelihoods. They should not be held to ransom by separating them from their children. They should not be held to ransom by discriminating against their children. You know, I've had so many stories of upset parents who've chose not to get their children vaccinated, you know, children younger than 16, because they want to wait and see the longitudinal data. They know there's a low risk of children having severe adverse uh, events from injuries from COVID. And yet the children now have been stopped from going to school formals, uh, you know, attending schoolies and things like that. I just cannot believe that we are taking these mandates so far to be holding it against the children who basically, while they, you know, they have you know, their choices restricted by their guardians, which is you know, rightfully so, that's why we have things called parents and we acknowledge age of consent. Uh, but you know, just another example of the government overreach that has gone too far in dealing with COVID. And I'd also like to point out to my fellow colleagues, you know, especially my Queensland colleagues, we have the LNP values which is the dignity and worth of every individual. Surely if someone has had a serious injury from a vaccine, they have the right to say no to a second one. What type of intolerable cruelty 
is it that we are going to force people into possibly getting injured again? And I've had many stories of people who felt a little bit off after the first vaccine. They thought it was uh, you know, as a result of the vaccine. They went and saw their doctor. The doctor said, no, it wasn't the vaccine. You'll be right. Get the second vaccine. And then they've had a much worse reaction the second time around. You know, I know with Chantel uh, Yuran, the, the Western Australian police officer in Perth, when she went to go to the vaccine safety clinic, she thought she was going to get some counselling uh, as to how to deal with her injury. Instead, the vaccine safety clinic was trying to tell her to take the second vaccine. And her health has deteriorated markedly since that meeting. We believe in the freedom of choice. We believe in the freedom of conscience. We believe in free speech. We should enable, allow people to make choices based on their own medical conditions in consultation with their doctor. And if I could quote another doctor I spoke to last week, as he said, we're now in this upside down world where the doctors and nurses are being gagged and all the unprofessional, you know, unqualified experts, politicians, myself included, the media and celebrities are telling everyone to get the jab. And as another doctor pointed out to me last week, she said that is entirely irresponsible to be not uh, diagnosing and, and uh, looking at people before getting uh, a vaccine, especially a vaccine that is still undergoing longitudinal testing, a vaccine that is new technology that has never been used before. And this is the thing, you know, the arguments often split out into vax versus anti-vax. Every vaccine has to be assessed on its own merits. This vaccine was rushed. Now I understand why there was a serious risk from COVID, but we need to be honest about the fact that we are still undergoing testing. And we need to be honest to, uh, about the fact that what we're seeing out in the population, the population data of adverse events, doesn't correlate with the data from the testing that Pfizer did. Now, much of that uh, testing has actually, you know, when it got released, much of that data has actually been redacted. I mean, that in itself is a massive concern. How can anyone make a proper informed choice when the data from the trial itself has actually been redacted? Furthermore, the, the, the population and, the, and, and the, the people who got tested, the placebo group, they went and vaccinated the placebo group. So now it is almost impossible to do long-term testing because we don't actually have a, a, a trial of people who haven't been vaccinated. While I know the Prime Minister had good intentions by setting up the National Cabinet, the Premiers have abused his trust and the trust of the people. They are playing political games in order to score political points. They need to be reined in and the Prime Minister must assert his authority and stand up for the Australian people. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, I understand Senator Lambie will be speaking next. Thank, Thank you. you, Acting Deputy President, Madam Deputy President. If you want a champion against discrimination, you don't want one nation. One nation wants autistic children to be taken out of public schools because, and I quote, they're a strain on the rest of the class. People don't choose to be autistic. Taking them out of school is discrimination, and One Nation just loves it. One Nation wants a ban on any immigration from majority Muslim countries, even if the person isn't Muslim. People don't choose what country they're born in. That is discrimination. One Nation has no problem with that either. One Nation is opposed to same-sex marriage. People don't choose to be gay. That is discrimination. One Nation has no issue with that either. One Nation is not a fighter against discrimination. One Nation seeks to profit from it. It's just a fundraising exercise for them, and that's all this is. This bill is supposed to be about fighting the discrimination of people who haven't been vaccinated against COVID-19. The only people who need protection from discrimination are people who can't receive the vaccination for reasons outside of their control. They shouldn't be discriminated against. But if you're able to get vaccinated and you choose not to, dis not, not to, discrimination is the wrong word. That's not discrimination. You have freedom to make a choice. But if you make a choice, those choices have consequences. You can't call every consequence a choice, of choice, a discrimination. If you get behind the wheel of a car and drive twice the speed limit, you may be comfortable taking that risk with your safety, but you'd be putting other people's lives at risk, and you don't have the right to do that. 
and you will more than likely lose your licence. You are not being discriminated against. You choose to do something that puts other people's lives at risk, and you will be accountable. You will be held accountable for that choice. It is that simple. That's what we're talking about here. People who don't get the vaccine are making a choice. You have a choice. We all have choices to make. We all get a choice. You're making a choice that means you're more, more likely to get COVID and you're more likely to spread it to someone else. And that is your choice. It is your right. I want to make that clear. And I support that choice. I'm just checking with Steve. But you don't get to decide how the rest of Australia responds to that choice. You can't force someone else to react a certain way to you because of your freedom to choose. That's not how we do things in this country. We've got freedom of speech in Australia, but you can't stop people reacting to what you say with your freedom of speech. We have a freedom of assembly, but you can't stop the rest of us from calling you out if you're being disruptive and rude. Having the freedom to choose isn't the same as having freedom to avoid the consequences of that choice. Some might say that if you're vaccinated because you're required to in order to keep your job, you've been forced to get vaccinated. That's not right, and that's not being truthful at all. That is not correct. If you want to work with vulnerable people, you need to do a police check. If you want to work with kids, you do have to have a working with children check. That is the way it is, and we do that to keep people safe. How about that? We put others before ourselves. You can decide not to choose those checks. No one's forcing you. But if you don't do them, you can't work where you want to work. It's as simple as that. That is the way it is. If you want to work as a cabbie, you need a licence to drive a cab. People without licences are not being discriminated against. If you want to work in aged care, you need to have a flu vaccine. And that rule has been in place before COVID-19 was even a twinkle in a Chinese bat's eye, for goodness sake. That's the way it is. You have a right to choose. You don't have a right to put vulnerable people's lives at risk. You don't have that right. And so you shouldn't have that right. You don't have the right to go into an aged care home unvaccinated and risk starting a COVID outbreak for the elderly. I have constituents with autoimmune conditions who run businesses. If they're forced to serve unvaccinated customers, they'll have to choose between risking their lives or shutting down their businesses. You don't have the right to force them to make that choice either. We have pubs in Hobart that will have to close if a single COVID person walks into them. Those pub owners should be able to choose to protect themselves and their staff. And they should be able to say, I can't afford to have an unvaccinated person in here. They're already on their knees. They should not be forced to pay for another person's choice not to get the vaccine. This is the point. Nobody has the right to make someone's life less safe. That's not what freedoms mean. That's not what freedoms mean at all. You have the freedom to make your own choices. Everyone else has the freedom to respond to your choices. And you don't get to control that no matter how much you might want to. Now, I get that some people have a lot to fear about the vaccine. I understand that for some, putting that needle in your arm is a hard choice to make. It's good to ask questions about how the vaccine was developed, where it comes from and how we know if it's safe. And I've asked plenty of those questions myself. I put it to the Department of Health, I put it to the TGA, and I wouldn't have it any other way. That's a democratic process in this country. But the problem is politicians like Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts are using people's fear to boost their own election campaigns, and they're using fear to make money. And that's what this is about from One Nation. They're not being straight with you people out there, not straight at all. It's all about cash, it's all about power, and it's all about One Nation seats. And that's all this is, a grab for cash and seats from One Nation. I reckon a lot of their supporters would think twice if they saw the absolute hypocrisy of these politicians, these two, honestly. 
One nation to pretend to be on the side of the people, but they are happy to tell fibs to their own voters if it means they can make a quick buck or two. Take an example. Senator Hanson went on Sky News and said, said that the TGA had published data saying a whole bunch of people had died from COVID-19 vaccine, and the journalist pulled her up straight away and told her that's wrong. The journalist called her out for misleading Sky's viewers. And you know what happened? Senator Hanson backed down. She admitted she had the facts wrong, that she'd have to look at it again. But the next day, the very next day, she went right back to saying the same crap anyway, like nothing had happened. Like that's acceptable behaviour in this country. That's leadership, is it, Senator Hanson? My goodness. I've got things wrong in the past. I accept that and I'll admit it and I'll fix it and I'll move it on. That's how it works. If you get it wrong and say you got it wrong and stand by, stand by that. What sort of person accepts they're wrong but just keeps saying the wrong thing anyway? What sort of person does that? Let's be clear. I don't want people being forced to get vaccinated. I don't think we should ever do that. But I think there's a world of difference between opposing that and supporting this damn bill. This bill says the freedom of unvaccinated is more important than the freedom of the vaccinated. Really? It says that nine in 10 Australian adults who have gone out and got the jab don't get a choice themselves. That we don't have a choice to keep COVID out of our work sites, our wage care homes, our pubs, our cafes, our houses, away from our kids. It says some people should be allowed to make consequence-free decisions, that some people should be able to yell fire in a crowded room and get away with it scot-free. I don't think so. Not on my watch. Here's the thing. Being held accountable for your own actions isn't called discrimination. It's called being, you wouldn't believe it, a goddamn bloody adult. That's right as being an adult. It's putting others before yourself. And that's what this country's supposed to be about. We don't have lockdowns and border restrictions because state premiers love discrimination. That's rubbish. We have them because state premiers don't want to be, don't want people dying because they don't want to be playing Russian roulette with their own people's lives. That's why they're doing it. That is why they're doing it. One Nation is the champion for the right for unvaccinated, COVID-carrying mainlanders to, get, to come to Tasmania and create an outbreak. I don't think so. I don't think so. It's not going to happen under my watch, and I doubt very much if it's going to happen under Premier Gutman's watch. We're not going to stand for it. One Nation are just the enemy of health workers and officials who would have to clean up after the outbreak. Everybody pays for COVID-19. Every day we have to deal with lockdown and restrictions is a day when a business goes bust, a family breaks down in despair and a person takes their own life. The way out of lockdowns and restrictions is vaccinations because there is nothing else on the table. Let's be honest about that. It's how we protect ourselves and it's how we protect each other. It's how we stand together. It's how we fight back. It is the only weapon we have. And we need to do everything we possibly can to keep ourselves safe, our kids safe, our grandchildren safe, and our friends and family. That's what we need to do. And sometimes sacrifices have to be made. They have to be made. You are patriots. We should be celebrating vaccinated Australians. You're fighting for our freedoms to take control of our lives again. That's what you're doing. And good on you. It's a proud day for you today, and so it should be. Good on you for showing the courage to do so. You're the best we have. You are the frontline fighters, and you're displaying the kind of quality that makes this country the great country it is. Because that's what it takes, sacrifice. I was brought up in believing in responsibility, to look after people that can't look after themselves and that nobody owes you anything. So go out and earn what you want. Go out there and earn it. This bill flies in the face of all of that. 
and that's why I absolutely oppose every every bit of it. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Wong. I move that the motion be put. The question is that the motion be put. All of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, the question is that the bill uh, now be um, uh, read uh, a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the uh, the noes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Division required. Uh, sorry. Are there two, Senator, Senator Reddy, Senator uh, Canavan? Uh, is there a division required? Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Antic, teller for the eyes, and Senator Ciccone, teller for the nose. Order. Order. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Order.
The result of the division is eyes 5, noes 44. The question is resolved in the negative. Mr. Like Mr. President. President, Mr. President, I seek the call, please. Uh, are you seeking leave, Senator yes, Hanson? Yes, I am. Seeking, yes, I am. Thank is you. Is leave seeking granted? Leave. You wish yep. to make a short remark, Senator Hanson? Um, I just want that One Nation's vote be recorded in support of the bill, please. That's Senator Roberts and myself. Okay, it is. It is. No, leave is not granted. To record the vote that we were with, that we are in support of the bill that has it happened is. before. We have we have the right to record our vote Senator, as in support. Of Senator the bill. Hanson, you requested leave. Uh, leave was denied. Uh, we will move on. Clark, Mr. President, right. Mr. President. Sorry, we have the right to actually have our vote recorded in support of the bill. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, a point of order to perhaps uh, help the chamber in this regard. It, uh, I understand uh, that during the operation of remote participation rulings and uh, a proceed remote participation of proceedings, uh, it uh, has been enabled at times where divisions haven't been called or otherwise that a senator indicates their party's um, voting intention or position. Uh, the fact that they have simply stated that then means it appears on the Hansard and is, uh, and is uh, the case that it is reflected in, uh, in those Hansard proceedings. It doesn't change the tally uh, of the votes. Um, so, Mr President, I think uh, um, uh, there's no process to change the tally of votes, but Senator Hanson merely making the statement that One Nation supported the bill is a statement of, uh, of fact and would be recorded on the Hansard now. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. My, my only question is whether that needs to be done from the chamber. I'll just consult with the clerk. All right, it is, it, it, you have put that onto the Hansard record now, Senator Hanson, so the Hansard Thank has you. noted your position. And we will Thank now you. move on. Thank you. Clark. General Business Order of the Day number 82, Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Amendment, Improved Grants Reporting Bill 2021, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I rise to make a contribution on the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Amendment, Improved Grants Reporting Bill 2021. And it's pretty tough to start a speech by saying this bill will clean up some of the corruption and, and rorting of taxpayer dollars that's become endemic under this current Liberal National Government, because the only thing that's really going to fix it is getting rid of the government. This is only going to attempt to clean up some of the mess, some of the disgraceful behaviours that we've seen as commonly done business, just business as usual according to this government. And I'm talking about what people know as sports rorts, the better regions Fund, better, building Better Regions Fund, the commuter car parks, and the list just goes on and on and on. We need to ensure, as a House of Review, that we oppose this spending by this government of billions of taxpayer dollars as if it's their own Liberal Party campaign money, Liberal National Party campaign money. Now, the commuter car park fund is just one small example of incredibly poor governance and cynical politics, even for this Morrison government. This failed fund has built only three of the car parks that it promised before the last election. In three years, three car parks, and it's cancelled six car parks, double those that they've built, because they have shown an inability to plan properly. And there are 47 others that are unlikely to ever be built, using all the resources of government, having access to the entire capacity of the government of Australia. They couldn't get the plan right, and in three years they've built three car parks. It's a disgrace. It's a disaster of a project, and it was caused purely by political greed of those opposite and a planning process that was absent and based on an electoral timeline 
and no due diligence. This scheme is exactly what happens when the Liberal National Party decide to use your Australian taxpayer dollars as their personal re-election fund. They did it in 2019 and they're lining up for a replay in 2021 at 22. The Central Coast, where I live and has been represented in the southern end by Lucy Wicks, the member for Robertson, it's been an utterly failed and hapless and haphazard planning project. The local member failed Robertson when she did nothing for eight years. No planning. Despite handing out at the, sta at the station to people heading as commuters to Sydney, then she rushed a completely unsatisfactory process that's gone nowhere because it was always going to go nowhere. This was about an announcement and not about the actual delivery of vital infrastructure for coasties. Now, this bill before us today aims to stop rorts such as the grossly mismanaged commuter car park rorting fund. And it's intended to halt local members and their Liberal and National Party leadership from funnelling money into dodgy projects with incomplete data and commitments and announcements that, as if they're going to happen that never actually translate into reality in people's lives. Another one, sports rorts, wasn't an isolated incident. It was an evidence of an endemic culture of rorting and corruption. The Community Sport Infrastructure Grant Program was $100 million of taxpayer-funded coalition slush fund to save its political future. They didn't spend it appropriately and with care. They spent it to get themselves elected. A scathing ANAO report found that it was afflicted by severe distribution bias and that in the last round of funding, 70 per cent of the department's suggestions were overruled in place of electorates picked out on a colour-coded spreadsheet to help the Liberal National Party members and candidates have announcements that were likely to increase their vote and get them elected. The ANAO even found that this project may have been illegal. Now we see in the government, and I see Senator, uh, Minister Reynolds here, still trying to cover up robo-debt. We've seen them do illegal things where they actually had to pay back money to Australia. This, the ANO said, was not evident to the ANO what the legal authority for them to roll out this $100 million worth of sports rorts money was. And as shocking as that is, that's just the tip of the iceberg with this law. They really have a born-to-rule mentality and they really think that every taxpayer that dollar that comes into this place is there for their personal discretion, not to build the nation. God forbid that we should lift our eyes and look to the future and advance everyone. No, this is about personal victories, personal interest, power for the Liberal Party over good governance for the Australian people. And that's why we should kick that lot out at the next election. They do not deserve people's votes, not on the back of what they've done. Public governance and accountability is the basics. That's the basics for a government. And these guys do not know what that means. The Liberals and Nationals are happy to splash taxpayer cash wherever they see their own political interest, but rarely where the public interest needs to be served. And we've seen that with JobMaker. Right, a much lauded $4 billion plan that delivered just 1% of the jobs that were announced, the jobs that were promised, and it happened because this government rushed it. It was poorly designed. They don't care. They got the headline. They got the $4 billion number. They'll use it. It'll be in a lovely blue glossy brochure in your letterbox. But those brochures that this government will put out are based on a litany of lies and deceptions. With the better, uh, Building Better Regions Fund, uh, that, that, I, I have to laugh when I say it because it's a joke the way that they corrupted this one. 
I know what it means to come from a regional part of New South Wales. I'm only uh, uh, just over 100 miles out, 100 kilometres out of Sydney, but it's another world. When you get over to the other side of the Great Dividing Range and you're out in places like Cobar and Coonabarabran and Broken Hill, Wilcannia, the seat of Farrah, it's a whole different world. That's regional. This government doesn't seem to understand that, even though they purport to represent it. Under this government, your taxpayer dollars are wasted by incompetence and a failure to design proper infrastructure projects, or they're corrupted by a government that wants to save hapless, non-working MPs who just roll around every election, confident that they're going to get the vote from the National Party members out there in the bush, and they just show up. And the people in the community are not getting their fair share. Now, the, better building, the Building Better Regions Fund managed over $105 million in grants to regional communities across Australia. But at least that's how it was described. Yet there was a secret ministerial planning instrument that managed those grants. And it saw over half of the funds, more than $50 million worth of funds, awarded to projects that ranked so lowly, far lower than many much more worthy, higher rated applications as assessed by people who are building for the nation, professionals in government who understand getting value for your dollar. I come from a small business family. Like many of my colleagues, we know that small businesses are the heart of this country. That is where jobs are created. Entrepreneurship requires people to do their jobs brilliantly, with due diligence, to spend the resources in wise ways. This government wouldn't know what wisdom looked like when it comes to spending a buck. The only wisdom that they have is a self-inflated sense of their right to government and their willingness to corrupt the processes of government to fund what they want for their own personal advantage over the advantage of regional communities. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it for people from the regions of this country being dudded by their own government, being given an announcement but getting no swimming pool in their area, getting no funding for the roads that they know need to be fixed, getting no investment in infrastructure that will improve their local economies. Overwhelmingly, these poorly ranked grants went to Liberal and national elect electorates uh, at a rate that would have uh, completely been inappropriate if the proper scrutiny was applied. It's as simple as this. A swimming pool that was funded out of this pocket of money in North Sydney is being dressed up by this government as a regional infrastructure project. That's how cynical they are. And how stupid they think the Australian people are. They think they can pull the wool over our eyes, tell you that they're supporting regions, and then put money into the pool at North Sydney. What a con! A con from the ad man, Mr Morrison, and his whole team of minions who lined up behind him and continued in the same way. There is no program that those opposite will fail to rort. It doesn't matter what the experts say. It doesn't matter what the departments say. It doesn't matter what the community says. They only want to do what gets them re-elected, and that is way too low a bar for a government to set. The Australian National Audit Office was absolutely scathing about the car park rorts. It found that car parks were heavily centred in Liberal electorates, particularly in Victoria, and that the government, well, that, the government was clearly trying to save its seats down there. Mr Frydenberg must have thought he was under incredible threat because he got four of the car parks. The reality is that the department put on the record that most of the congested roads in Australia are found in Sydney. Now, I'm going to stand up every day for my state. But I'm going to stand up with integrity and fairness. And if money needs to go to another state to advance this nation, then that's where it should go when it's appropriately designed. You can't just look after your own at the expense of the rest. That is unethical behaviour. But that's the playbook of this government. 
unethical behaviour. And that is why we need this piece of legislation to rein in. We can't contain it. It's just endemic. It's just out of control. But this piece of legislation, public government's performance and accountability amendment, is merely a reining in of the most egregious practices of this government. The government don't support a federal national integrity commission. Well, is it any wonder? Is it any wonder? And they probably won't back this bill because they don't want any containment on what they've found as their political survival strategy. Their political power is based on the rotting, the corrupt use, the inappropriate use, the poorly designed use of public funds that are Australian taxpayer dollars, which should be used so judiciously to advance the nation, not the Liberal National Party. The kind of behaviour that I'm describing here has to be described. It has to be called out for what it is, and it takes a lot of work from opposition to get the facts from this secretive government that wants to hide the truth from Australians. And I don't like having to make this speech because it erodes public trust, public confidence in the rectitude and effectiveness of the government. But I'm putting it on the record now because pretty soon Australians are going to have a chance to vote. And when they vote, I'm calling on Australians to recognise the shame, the shameful behaviour, the disgraceful, corrupt behaviour of this government in an industrial scale rotting of taxpayer money to the benefit of their own political interests and not that of Australians. With this government, it's all about politics and division and themselves. It's not about you. It's not about our future. It's not about Australia's benefit. It's about their personal benefit. That is not satisfactory. Heartless political arithmetic only benefits those in power, not those on the ground. Because of rushed political announcements without any due diligence, the Central Coast is further than ever away from getting a car park. But all that was needed for Miss Lucy Weeks was to stand up with Mr Morrison and make an announcement to shore up a majority. Well, not twice. You won't get away with it twice, Lucy Wicks. You've lied to the Australian people on the Central Coast for long enough. It's over, and this legislation is there to help. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, <laughs> Senator O'Neill, would you like to um, consider the comments that you just made and respond to the minister? Um, I will withdraw even though it's true. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator O'Neill. If you are going to withdraw the comments, it needs to be done uh, without any condition. Draw. I just hope she can tell the truth. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Improving Grants Reporting Bill 2021, a bill introduced by Senator Gallagher. Uh, firstly, in my contribution this morning, I rise to dispel the myth uh, that saw the genesis of this bill, uh, that there is some kind of lack of reporting or a lack of transparency around grants or the grants decision making process. I'm sure that we'll hear, as we've already heard this morning, a myriad of examples from those opposite of what they deem to be scandalous conduct. Uh, but the fact is that if there was no transparency around grants reporting, they would have no idea that there'd be any occurrence of them. The very examples that they raise here are evidence of the significant level of transparency that this government undertakes and is very happy to undertake. We, on this side of the, of the Senate, uh, firmly believe that the Australian taxpayer deserves to know where their money is being spent and on what. We have no problem with transparency. If those uh, opposite were truly in favour of transparency and accountability, then they would subject 
to their mates in the union movement to a much higher standard uh, in those areas, because we certainly don't see much example of that happening there. There are already four levels of reporting relating to grants, uh, and Senator Gallagher's bill uh, simply adds a fifth with significant overlap and duplication. Now, uh, this adds new terminology, but uh, further bureaucracy and regulation, it might not be any consequence to the Labor Party, we know this, uh, but it's my preference and it's the preference of this government that we uh, do not add any significant duplication and overlap. Uh, uh, to avoid this uh, where possible has to always be the aim, and that's the aim of this government. It's also the preference of grant applicants who want a streamlined and simplified process. Uh, I've, in a previous career, previous work, uh, been involved in submitting grant applications, and it's an, it's an extraordinary process that you have to go through. And it's necessary. It's understood. It's understood. But we don't need to add to the red tape. We don't need to add to the burden that is uh, required. I know many organisations simply end up grant writing to grant write because there's so much. Uh, so much required in, in, uh, in being awarded grants. We don't need to add any further complication to it. Of course we need accountability. Of course we need transparency. And there are good reasons why. It's because it's taxpayers' money. And taxpayers expect there to be transparency and expect there to be proper oversight. Now, the most wide-ranging and obvious of these accountability measures that the government has put in place is the Grant Connect website. This was put in place in 2017. The government mandated that the requirement to report all grants uh, on the Grant Connect website. Now, this is a fantastic website. Uh, it provides a, a whole of government consolidated data on grant opportunities and grants that have been awarded. The Grant Connect website captures information on grant recipients, their location and the value of grant decisions. In this way, it acts as a very open and accountable record. The website also includes grant guidelines for each grant program, allowing people to look up who is the decision maker for the grant program and therefore identify which grants are decided by which minister, increasing the accessibility of the general public to the decision makers in the process. The website not only shows grants uh, previously awarded, but also grant rounds currently open and upcoming grant rounds enabling community organisations to plan, to get the ideas together for future grant applications. I know a number of community organisations find this website very useful, and I've been fortunate enough to visit a number of organisations who have received grants. Uh, people can not only search by key terms, but they can also export large data sets to find programs or decisions of, of interest. And Grant Connect this website can notify registered users on grant opportunities as they arise. You can put in key search terms and you'll get notified as these opportunities come up. Uh, further to Grant Connect website, reportable grants are also variously required to be reported to the Finance Minister under the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Rules and the, Australian, uh, and the Commonwealth Government Beg your pardon, and the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines, and also to Parliament under the Senate Orders of Continuing Effect. Now, Senator Gallagher's bill would add a fifth level of required reporting, a wholly unnecessary level in my opinion. To further uh, to, to this, the, the other furphy that continues to be propagated here is that if a minister disagrees with or overrules advice by a departmental staff, that there is that there must be some kind of conspiracy going on. Now, the Labor Party is so caught up with the uh, temerity of a minister apparently defying their department that Senator Gallagher has drafted a bill to deal with it. Uh, that is this bill. Uh, it, I must have missed the memo stating that uh, ministers are no longer in charge of their departments uh, and that the departments are now in charge of their ministers. Uh, I must have missed that memo, but the uh, Labor Party seemed to uh, have, have uh, got that, uh, and they're, they're, that's why they've written this bill. Indeed, I believe that Labor would uh, prefer this. We are, we are on this side of the uh, very uh, happy, uh, and, and we welcome ministers exercising their right to over, overrule advice that they don't agree with. Ministers have a far greater opportunity than officials do uh, to be able to consult extensively 
with communities, NGOs, with industries and other stakeholders. They travel extensively around the country and hear frequently from constituents, including from those who have been referred by parliamentary colleagues. Ministers are uniquely positioned as grant decision makers because they have a very broad understanding of the community needs. And this is what ministers are appointed to do, to consult, to deliberate and to decide. Of course, the Commonwealth grants uh, rules and guidelines state that where a minister, where ministers are deciding grant outcomes, they must consider official advice. But ministers are not rub the rubber stampers, and, they're not, and they are, of course, obliged to use their own judgment. At least on this side of the chamber, that's what we believe. If those opposite want to pretend that they're ready to form some kind of alternative gov a government, they should realise that the role of a minister is to lead and not to be led. It is inevitable on, on occasion that a minister may take a different view, may take a different view to officials, but ministers are elected. At the end of the day, they have the capacity to make these decisions, and so they should. But ministers are always required in the first instance to receive and consider official advice. This is in the guidelines. It's very clear. And that's what must always be followed and is followed by this government. Let's look at the recent Building Better Regions grant round. I've seen how this has benefited communities firsthand. Uh, the new taxiway at the, Kwanana, uh, beg pardon, the Kununara Airport, for example, where I've uh, landed on numerous occasions, or the newly announced Tom Price skate park. I was in Tom Price uh, last year. And, uh, Fantastic town. There's many people choosing to raise their families there, and my, my young son, he loves the skate park, and I know that kids up in Tom Price, why not? They should have a skate park just as much as a suburb around Perth. Uh, this is a town that desperately needs more facilities for young people. Uh, this is a fantastic grants program. It's providing funding to a wide range of organisations, strengthening and diversifying regional economies, and helping to provide facilities to remote communities. Of course, predictably, after the results of the latest Building Better Regions funding round, after they were announced, we saw headlines from those opposite claiming that 90 per cent of Building Better Regions funding went to coalition seats. The forks outrage was palpable, I say. Catherine King, MP, Ms. Ms. King labelled it as a scandal. The the, the supposed uh, shadow minister for I infrastructure, transport and regional development labelled it a scandal. But let's look at let's look at this. Let's look past the spin. Perhaps that funding breakdown could be explained by the fact that uh, that Labor barely holds a seat outside the inner city. This is, after all, the Building Better Regions grant program, not the Cappuccino Strip Improvement Project, the CSIP. This is the Building Better Regions program. Uh, it is, is it any great surprise that, as Labor have deserted the regions, that regional voters have deserted them? At this point, I will add that it's a great shame that the Labor Party is losing Mr Fitzgibbon, the member for Hunter. Mr Fitzgibbon was a true voice of the Labor Party for regional jobs and regional development, uh, probably the last one that they had left, but he's gone. And so it's little wonder that at the last election we had in the majority, the vast majority of regional seats, they were held by Liberal or National Party members. So of course, if you're running a regional grants program, that 90 per cent of those grants go into those seats, well, it's because the Liberal National Party uh, hold those seats. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, neither I nor the government shy away from transparency in awarding and reporting grants. In fact, our current regime actually contains a more rigorous reporting standard than is suggested by Senator Gallagher's bill in relation to the grants that a minister awards in their own electorate. The current grant standard requires that when such a grant is awarded, it is to be reported to the finance minister as soon as practicable. Now, Senator Gallagher's bill pushes that requirement out to 30 days, but after that 30-day period, the finance minister would be required to table the reports in the parliament within five sitting days of receiving them. This is bizarrely inconsistent, I have to say. 
This bill is uh, commendable in its intention. I, I, I grant them that. Uh, transparency is not something that should be shied away from, but it fails to take into account all the other transparency arrangements currently in place. This bill seems drafted as if they were the first movers on this, in this space, but it's simply not true. It duplicates, it creates inconsistency, it requires reporting of incorrect information, and it would require some information to be reported later than it is today. So that doesn't do anything to add to the level of transparency that Australian taxpayers would expect of a government. But this bill just complicates it. Why? Why is this the case? Because it's just a stunt. It's just another one of these stunts, just to claim a headline, just to create a bit of noise and attention to detract away from the fact that they really have got no other plan other than just to create smear and just to divert away from the fact that they really are not in a place to be the alternative government. It duplicates, it creates inconsistency, it requires reporting of incorrect information. This is, this is not necessary. While apparently attempting to increase transparency, Senator Gallagher's bill actually lessens it to some extent in some areas. Either by design or by oversight, this is not good enough. This bill is not well considered. It's seriously flawed. Further, it highlights that the Australian Labor Party's nervousness around ministerial decisions, with a preference for government by unelected officials to be able to be the ones solely making, uh, making decisions. Is that, is that what we can expect? Should the Labor Party form government after the next election? That they're just going to be led by their departments, that ministers won't be, won't be the ones actually making the decisions. I mean, they're the ones that ultimately are accountable back to the Australian people. They're the ones that have been elected. They're the ones that will be fronting up at, out in their communities, uh, facing the media, uh, dealing with scrutiny in this chamber, dealing with uh, in the other chamber, uh, having scrutiny of their work, not, not the officials. We have excellent officials. Australian is, Australia is well supported by wonderful, wonderful members of the, the public service and a high calibre and high standard, uh, arguably some of the best in the world. But at the end of the day, they're not elected, they're, they're appointed, they're, they've been given an important job to do, but it's, it's the members of the other house or this house uh, who become ministers that are ultimately responsible. So this is just an example why the Australian people have and will continue to to trust the, the Morrison government to lead Australia. So we're prepared to make decisions. We're prepared to stand up. We're prepared to be accountable. We're prepared to take those decisions to the Australian people and be accountable for them. Because we're an adult government. And that's why uh, the Australian people know that they can continue to trust us. And we look forward to prosecuting that case over the next six months or so as we lead in to the next election. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, I rise to strongly support this bill, uh, and I commend Senator Gallagher for her work in holding the government to account in this outrageous rorting of public funds for political gain. Having recently arrived in the Senate, I've been shocked at the lack of transparency and accountability by the Morrison-Joyce government. It isn't just that transparency isn't a priority for them, they are actively seeking to hide documents and shield their decisions from the public's view. So I support this bill as a step to hold the government to account and to get some accountability even where the current government doesn't want it. As other speakers have highlighted, this bill amends the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act to bring together the grant rules and guidelines uh, currently found in other legislation and to tighten the timeframes around these requirements. And it's probably worth uh, referring to Senator O'Sullivan, uh, who was making some commentary about the timing here. What the current requirements are, it's 12 months before the need to be reported. And that's one of the key things that this bill seeks to change, to bring that forward so you're not waiting 12 months for that level of accountability and transparency. So specifically, this bill would require reporting to the parliament 
where ministers are approving projects against advice of their departments or within their own electorates and doing it in a much tighter time frame. Grants are a critically important part of how our national government works, and it is important that the public can see exactly what is happening here and exactly where the money is going. So many community groups and sporting clubs rely on this type of funding to be able to keep their operations going or to fund much needed infrastructure upgrades. I know that a great many of South Australians will know of local sporting clubs that desperately need upgrades. They need a new pitch, they need better lighting, they need uh, change rooms or other facilities to help their clubs thrive. And the grants are vital for the larger scale projects too, whether it's funding for research projects or significant infrastructure works, new roads, bridges, public transport and other such um, required infrastructure. But at the end of the day, these grants are tax payer funded. People rightly expect that the government will spend public funds in a way that is transparent and accountable to them. These are worthy and much needed projects in just about every single corner across the country. And we accept that not every good project can be funded at the same time. But we need to be transparent and we need to understand what the evidence base is for each and every grant. What are the most urgent projects? What is the best bang? How are we funding these things? And what is the rationale? The system should work in that manner, that it is accountable and that it is transparent, and that people in communities can see that. But under eight long years of this Liberal national government, it is not what we are seeing. The Morrison-Joyce government continues to treat taxpayer-funded grants like this as if they were part of a Liberal Party campaign account, splashing money for political priorities not based on evidence and real community need. And again, just to um, counter another uh, point that Senator O'Sullivan made, those grants that he was particularly talking about, 34 per cent of those seats that are eligible um, do not sit within the LNP. So that's 34 per cent. I hardly think that's negligible. And of those seats, only 14 per cent receive grants. So that, is, that shows us very, very clearly how political these decisions are. The worst thing about this is when they are called out on it, the government just keep trying to hide the documents, hide the evidence from public view, and hide any form of scrutiny and deflect any form of attention. And that's exactly what this bill is trying to address. It's exactly why it is so badly needed. One of the most outrageous examples that we have seen has been the notorious sports rorts. This isn't just a case of public funds being rorted. It actually has real consequences on the people and the communities across this country. And we felt it keenly in South Australia. As a result of the 100 million sports rorts, worthy clubs across South Australia, clubs run by dedicated community members, mums, dads, aunts, uncles, granny, granddad, people who work very hard to make their local clubs um, as successful as they can be, to give everyone an opportunity to participate in these important community activities, they are just denied the basic upgrades. Um, and simply because they're not fortunate enough to be located in a Liberal target or held seat. In South Australia, we've seen some amazing things occur, and I don't mean that in a good sense. We've seen um, the spectacle of failed candidate for mayor, Georgina Downer, um, parading around Yankalilla with, um, with novelty checks, advertising the rorts, um, it's, it's exceptional. It's unbelievable. Of the top 50 unsuccessful applicants nationwide, 12 were South Australian projects, and seven of those were in the top 15. Now, these had all scored above 88%, 88, sorry, above 88 out of 100 in the Australian Sports Independent Merit Assessment Process. Merit Assessment Process. However, all 12 of these deserving clubs were rejected by the Morrison government, so they could instead spend the taxpayer money pork-barrelling marginal seats 
in other states. Clubs with a huge demand for infrastructure and less money, like the South Adelaide Football Club, home to back-to-back -back SANFLW premiers and also a highly successful SNAFL side, missed out completely. Meanwhile, we had the old Collegians Rugby Union Football Club in the Liberal state of Sturt, which was awarded 500000 for female change rooms, despite not having any female programs. They have no girls' or women's teams. McLaren Vale Football Club, which again scored 88 out of 100 on the Sports Australia merit criteria, was yet another club that missed out even though they exceeded those criteria. The club president at the time, um, Darren Lyons, called on the PM to go and visit the club and speak to the women who, were, who needed these change facilities and explain to them why the merit system was totally ignored. The PM never turned up and never answered that question. This was simply an outrageous slap in the face to local sporting communities who had worked so hard to get their kids out on the field or on the court or on the track, week in, week out. And it didn't take long for the South Australian Liberal government to catch on. Fresh on the heels of Senator Mackenzie's largesse to the Liberal, and mar to the Liberal marginal seats, we saw South Australian Liberals endow some of the exact same clubs with more funding, more rounds of sports rorts, just joining in of the Marshall Liberal government's grassroots football, cricket and netball facility program, just six out of 47 of the, of the electorates uh, were Labor who received money. And in June this year, just 22 out of 117 clubs to receive funding under three revised sports infrastructure funding streams were located in Labor electorates. And then to stick the boot in further, the additional condition that has been brought in is one that totally slams any low socioeconomic areas by now requiring a 50 per cent contribution, ensuring that only those clubs with more money in more wealthy areas actually have a chance to develop their sporting clubs. But we know it's not just sports. It's not just those funds that have been rorted by the Morrison and Joyce government. Just last month, we learned about the mass rorting of the Building Better Regions grant, support to much need, for much-needed projects in regional Australia. This is a $1.5 billion uh, bucket of money since 2018, money that was supposed to be spent on investment-ready projects that provide economic and social benefits for regional and remote areas. And that's a direct quote. The National Audit Office, not anyone else, the National Audit Office has found that 55 per cent of these regional grants um, announced since 2018 have gone to projects in major cities. Just let that sink in. 55 per cent of regional grants have gone to major cities. That's millions of dollars for projects in the regions who are screaming out for them that have just been put across to the cities. Analysis has shown that some 90 per cent of the funds granted has gone to just coalition-held or targeted seats. Particularly galling of that regional money is the $10 million for a, for a swimming pool in North Sydney that is right next to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. That is not regional by anyone's assessment. And the claim that it's regional because some people from the country go and swim there is absolutely ridiculous. Yet again, it's this government and this Prime Minister using taxpayer funds like a Liberal Party campaign account. So if you happen to live in a Labor seat and the coalition doesn't have its eye on you, tough luck. You are not going to get anything regardless of need. And that is shameful. That is exactly what this bill seeks to stop. It's obvious for all of us to see 
the decisions are being made for political purposes. But still, the Morrison Joyce government does the same thing as it always does. Dig in, avoid responsibility, avoid any transparency, refuse to answer the questions of the Australian public. Something needs to change, and it's those people in regional and remote communities who are missing out most of all here, losing their chance at upgrades for their town because of the Prime Minister's political objectives. So I sincerely hope that when the Australian National Audit Office releases its report into this issue next year, they're able to provide that transparency. There's a clear contrast here. Labor is on the side of those people in regional Australia and on the side of transparency and accountability. This bill is part of that. There may be a good reason for a minister to go against departmental advice or to fund a project in their own seat, but they should be upfront about that. They should be clear and transparent about the exact rationale for why it is happening. And they shouldn't be delaying or obfuscating. It should be timely. But there's more work to do as well, and we need to consider the steps beyond this bill. The legacy of this government's rorts and grant scandals has been an erosion in public confidence in government and government decision-making. The important work that grants can and should do is being totally undermined. A strong national anti-corruption commission would be a powerful tool to restore public trust in hold government decision-makers to account. The government committed to this before the last election, but has still been completely silent on it. Labor will deliver a strong, independent, transparent, national anti-corruption commission. And it is time for this government to do the same or just own up to the fact that they're not going to bother. In closing, I reiterate my strong support for this bill my strong support for accountability, transparency, trust in government decision-making, and a fair go for the regions of this country and for all the community and sporting facilities in this country, not just the chosen few. What we've outlined is practical measures to bring transparency to the decisions on government grants, transparency that is currently sorely lacking. And I urge all senators not just to support this bill, but to continue the work of restoring trust in government and in government decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Small. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. And I uh, join my fellow colleague from Western Australia, Senator O'Sullivan, in rising today um, to argue against the public governance performance and accountability amendment improved grants reporting bill of this year. And the reason is not because, as those on the other side of the chamber would have you believe, that this is a government committed to anything other than transparency in decision-making and, indeed, accountability to the people of Australia who send us here, but rather that there are five key flaws in this particular bill. Um, which seek to undermine its intent, complicate decision-making and, indeed, uh, do nothing to further the cause of transparency within government. So if we take this in turn, uh, in terms of transparency in grant-making decisions by ministers of the Crown, Senator Gallagher's bill would significantly increase duplication in existing reporting arrangements not only creating a second, but rather a fifth set of reporting rules that complicate reporting that already exists under four other separate and distinct sets of rules. So to Senator O'Sullivan's point that a lot of the hot air that we hear out of those opposite on this is in fact only caused by the transparency that's upheld by those reporting arrangements. So currently, uh, the, the grants that are awarded under ministerial discretion, either contrary to official advice that they be rejected or relating to projects in the minister's own electorate, are already disclosed 
to the Finance Minister. For corporate Commonwealth entities, this is required under the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Rules. For non-corporate Commonwealth entities, this is required under the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines. And there are many good reasons, uh, some of which even Senator Grogan touched on, that a minister may be rather. There are many good reasons that would require a minister to take a decision that isn't in line uh, with official advice, and we'll get to those a little later. However, uh, on this point that grant information is in fact already transparent, grant information is also disclosable to the parliament under Senate Orders of Continuing Effect number 16 and 23E where Order 23E covers most grants reported to the Finance Minister under those circumstances I just touched on, and Order 16 covers all grants. Transparency is ultimately achieved in our democracy through periodic reporting to this parliament, and transparency is achieved more directly and faster through online reporting to the wider public. This is what's been happening for years. In 2017, the government mandated the requirement to report all grants on the Grant Connect website located at www.grants.gov.au, which provides a whole of government consolidated data on grant opportunities and indeed those grants that were in fact awarded. Grants are uploaded regularly throughout the year to this site after the grant agreements are signed between parties. So we have a Grant Connect website that captures information on grant recipients, their location and the value of those decisions. It includes the grant guidelines for each of the grant programs under which those same grants are made, thereby allowing every person in Australia to look up who is the decision maker for the grant program and therefore identify which grants are decided by which minister. The website not only shows previous grants awarded, but also those grant rounds that are currently open and indeed upcoming grant rounds that are planned to enable community opportunities, sorry, community organisations to plan future ideas for coming grant applications. So this bill deals with just one set of grants those that are awarded based on ministerial discretion or indeed a ministerial uh, decision against advice. But governments have always considered, indeed governments of both sides of politics, have considered it appropriate to use ministers as decision makers in certain circumstances because the reality is that ministers have greater opportunities than those public servants and bureaucrats based here in Canberra to consult widely with the people of Australia, to engage with stakeholders and industries, uh, particularly in rural and remote parts of our country. They travel extensively around the country and hear from these people directly. And I think, as Ronald Reagan said it best, the nine most terrifying words in the English language can be that I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So having ministers of the Crown of the democratically elected government of the day travel our country hear directly from the horse's mouth on these important issues and take up the decision against official advice is recognised by both sides of politics as an important part of our democracy. That said, the Commonwealth Grants Rules and Guidelines require a minister to consider when making a decision on a grant that same official advice. Official advice from a department is not simply a rubber stamp. And indeed, ministers are obliged to use their own judgment, uh, and sometimes that means they form a different view to that of our officials. Ministers are always required, though, in that very first instance, to receive and consider the official advice and the very good reasons that the hardworking public servants here in Australia provide that same advice. So to the five key areas of defect within this bill. Firstly, the inconsistent treatment of different government agencies, which on the face of it makes absolutely no sense to me, because the bill proposes to introduce a new term, being a reportable grant, which covers most grants that are currently reported to the Finance Minister, 
by ministers in respect uh, of the 98 non-corporate Commonwealth entities. The bill does not cover any of the grants administered by the 71 corporate Commonwealth entities. Because, as you'll recall, I just touched on the two very different sets of circumstances in which these decisions are reported to the Finance Minister and the Parliament. So this is a bizarre oversight. The bill is oblivious to the fact that there are separate requirements in the PGPA regulations that cover those 71 corporate Commonwealth entities as distinct from the 98 non-corporate Commonwealth entities. So that will cause a divergence in the current approach which is aligned and uniform, uh, requiring the treatment of grants administered by both corporate and non-corporate agencies to be reported. That alignment was cemented in regulations on 17 July 2020, regulations that Senator Gallagher appears perhaps to have missed in bringing this legislation forward, despite the fact that she was shadow finance minister at the time. This bill would take those requirements from a position of uniformity to a position of inconsistency. The bill also places details in the PGPA Act covering practices that have until now sat within delegated legislation. It would require agency officials to delegate and depart from following a consolidated set of rules and guidelines, providing a single point of reference uh, that exists today in the Commonwealth Rules and Guidelines to expecting them to follow scattering rules that are separated between primary and delegated law. That inevitably increases the risk of inadvertent rule breach by officials within the Australian government structure and makes for ultimate confusion in the administration of our laws. Procedural information being appropriately in the regulations uh, with key principles sitting within the primary legislation that informs it. So the bill cuts that long-standing practice for procedural requirement around a grant application that have allowed officials within the Australian government structure to operate from a position of uniformity. There's duplication within the bill, requiring ministers who approve grants to provide reports to the finance minister within 30 days of their approval, related to three key areas of grant decision. However, the third category which is that those did not meet any relevant selection criteria in one and two, are completely overlapped by the first category, which is that those grant decisions that the government uh, department recommended against. So everything in category three will also have to be reported in category one. If a grant application doesn't meet the selection criteria or falls short in some way, a department official will, of course, recommend against it. The grant would therefore be reportable under Category 1, just as it is now reportable under the status quo, under the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines and under the existing Senate Orders 16 and 23E. The Gallagher Bill is also unclear about the time point at which an application is in fact reportable if it did not meet the criterion for a particular grant program. It has been accepted by governments of both uh, political persuasions for a long time to provide opportunities uh, for those applicants who are unsuccessful to approve their applications in some circumstances. If an application is then found not to have officially, initially met the criteria and later the proponent having bring, bring on changes that would improve um, the compliance with the relevant program criteria and before the minister approves, the Gallagher bill suggests it would have been reported as if it were outside guidelines. That is a misleading outcome. The bill only looks at what is in a grantee's application, not what is in the final grant agreement after a negotiation between proponents in the community and those government officials that sit here in Canberra. So the bill therefore leaves open those proponents to reputational harm for those who have ultimately brought their application into close accord with the program requirements. In addition to these two key defects in, in uh, this legislation, we also see a duplication with those Senate Orders 16 and 23E. 16 uh, provides that ministers are able to table grants approved between estimates periods, three times a year and at least seven days before each estimate's round 
The grant details are tabled to facilitate scrutiny of those same decisions by this very chamber. So this duplicates entirely the requirements of Senate Order of Continuing Effect 23E, um, which, as I've already outlined, requires the tabling of reports from other ministers to the Finance Minister about grants awarded contrary to departmental advice in any way, including those grants awarded in a minister's own electorate. Senate, 23, uh, sorry, Senate Order 23E only came into effect relatively recently. So the first tabling of documents accord, uh, under this accord occurred on the 23rd, sorry, 30th of April this year. There has been no review of that reporting and no suggestion that the additional reporting is not of some value in upholding the transparency with which Australians rightly expect we uphold in dishing out taxpayer money. If Senator Gallagher somehow thinks that Senator 23, Order 23E is deficient, then perhaps we ought to be having a conversation around extending those Thank terms. Thank you, Senator Small. The time for this debate has now uh, expired and you'll be in continuation. Senator Waters, you're seeking the call. I do, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the Glasgow Climate Pact. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is not granted, Senator Waters. Deputy President, pursuing to con uh, pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion in relation to the Glasgow Climate Pact be moved immediately, determined without amendment and take precedence over all other business for 30 minutes. Now, I rise to speak to the urgent need to consider this motion. Today is the first day Parliament is sitting after the Glasgow Climate Summit, and yet there is nothing on the agenda to debate this most pressing of global issues that will genuinely affect the lives of every single Australian and the species that we share this beautiful planet with. The text of this motion that we're seeking to suspend standing orders to debate is the text of the Glasgow Climate Pact. The Australian government agreed to that pact and committed to meet that agreement, but then just days later cast doubt on the pledge to review 2030 targets and continued to boost for the coal and gas industry. Ministers have attempted to crab walk away from key provisions of the pact on 2030 targets and on phasing down coal. It's an admission that the government effectively lied when agreeing to this statement in Glasgow. This motion provides the Senate with a chance to reconfirm our support for the Glasgow Climate Pact. In Glasgow, the Prime Minister and Minister Taylor set up Australia's stall with Santos as our country's sponsor. They didn't bring 2030 targets. They bought a 2050 pledge, which is so late it's meaningless. And once there, they did everything in their power to boost and bolster the interests of big fossil fuel companies and water down ambition for climate action. Australia refused to increase the ambition of our 2030 emissions target, and we were the only high-income nation to do so. Instead, we saw a projection from the Prime Minister that showed we might, if technology trends go right, slightly exceed our existing weak commitment. What's more, Australia refused to sign up to the United States and EU-led Global Methane Pledge to reduce methane emissions. And while nine of the 20 largest global methane emitters signed up, we get Minister Barnaby Joyce saying that supporting it would mean that farmers would need to, quote, go grab a rifle, go out and start shooting your cattle, end quote. Naturally a red herring to distract from his party's constant support for the gas industry. Australia refused to sign up to the UK and Canada call for the phase-out of coal-fired power stations and a moratorium on new ones being constructed. And naturally, Australia had earlier refused a G7 push to stop subsidising fossil fuels with public money by 2025. Instead, we get Minister Pitt now committing to Australia selling coal well beyond 2050, as if anyone will want to buy it. But the final text of the Glasgow Pact united the world around striving for that one and a half degree temperature target, the only target that would give Pacific nations any chance of survival and would give a fighting chance for the world's coral reefs. And on that point, there can be no climate justice without First Nations justice. Action on climate requires respecting, consulting uh, and genuinely uh, delivering the wishes of First Nations and Indigenous peoples and ensuring that they are partners and leaders in reshaping our society to avoid climate collapse. It involves listening to our Pacific neighbours and protecting their very lives. 
Glasgow united the world around the need to phase down coal and to commit actions to reduce methane, for the first time naming and shaming fossil fuels as the cause of the climate crisis and agreeing to plot a path away from the mining, burning and export of coal and gas. Now, Australia signed up to that. The text of this motion is the text of that pact. The motion that we've circulated echoes that text agreed to at Glasgow that the Australian government signed up to. So this motion and the need to suspend standing orders to debate it provides the Senate with a chance to reconfirm our nation's support for the Glasgow Climate Pact. But I can't wait to see how the National Party votes on it. Are they in fact still in charge of this nation's climate policy? Are we going to get more unhinged rants uh, from Minister and Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce about shooting cows? Anything to distract from the fact that their party continues to boost for the gas and the coal industry. So we implore the Senate to support this motion. It is nothing less than committing to do the things that the Australian government already said it would do in Glasgow and take those critical steps on climate that are consistent with what the rest of the world is already doing. What will the Nationals do when we vote on this motion? What will the government do uh, when it comes to delivering on those Glasgow Pact pledges? They said one thing in Glasgow. They've said another as soon as they've got home. The whole while they've been boosting for the coal and gas industries, and the Australian people are fed up with the lack of leadership on climate. Let's vote this awful mob out and put the Greens in the balance of power to deliver climate action. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I wish to advise the Chamber that while Labor finds that there is much in this motion, in the content of the motion, that is uh, uh, worthy of consideration, uh, we will not be supporting the suspension of standing orders at this point in the program. For the reason that right now before the Chamber we should be debating, considering and I would hope passing the Security of Critical Infrastructure Bill. This is a green stunt at a time when we have a pressing national security concern, a piece of legislation that needs to get passed. So the Greens want to say that only they care about climate change and only they care about effective action. If they actually wanted effective action on climate change, if they actually wanted this Senate to do something effective about climate change, pick up the phone and call us and tell us you're going to pull on a stunt like this. We might have given you some advice to do it later in the day, after the Security of Critical Infrastructure Bill had passed. This is why you cannot trust the Greens on national security, and it's why you cannot trust the Greens when it comes to meaningful action on climate change. They oppose the CPRS. They pull stunts like this when we should be debating critical infrastructure. And while the motion might have some things to commend it, the timing is terrible. This chamber needs to deal with the security of critical infrastructure bill, and it needs to do it now. And we're not going to play politics with the green stunts. Uh, Minister. Uh, Deputy President, I, ask, I move the question be now put. So the question is, the motion to suspend is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Oh yes, but sorry, we're putting the question first. Beg your pardon. So the question is um, that we're putting the question. Uh, moved by the minister. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. So the question now is: the motion is moved by Senator Waters to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion, the ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator McKim as teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. There being uh, seven ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, security legislation amendment, critical infrastructure bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020. In 2019, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, called a big press conference here at Parliament House. He fronted the media with his then Ministers for Home Affairs and Defence standing beside him. He told Australians we were under attack. He said Australian organisations and Australia's critical infrastructure, including all levels of government, were subject to sophisticated, malicious cyber attacks. The threat that Mr Morrison spoke about that day is very real and very sophisticated. It is a threat that demands an equally sophisticated response. Instead, in 2019, Australia got just another Mr Morrison photo op, an announcement. It's taken more than two years to get the follow-up. That's what this bill is today. Two years later, after the photo-op, we finally get the follow-up. In that time, the Morrison government's allowed its cybersecurity strategy to expire. Even as the Australian Cybersecurity Centre amplified its warnings, the cyber threat was growing in its scale and its complexity. In that time, the Morrison government ignored urgent advice to do even the bare minimum to uplift Australian cybersecurity, such as by introducing a mandatory ransomware payment scheme, instead leaving this to the opposition, to Labor, to introduce before finally adopting Labor's call for a national ransomware strategy. In the time since Mr Morrison's big announcement, the cybersecurity threat environment has continued to shift and evolve. 
And the bill we are considering today is very different to the one the Morrison government originally sought to pass, a bill that was referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. That this bill today is so very different to the Morrison government's original bill underscores the importance of the Bipartisan Intelligence and Security Committee and its important role in scrutinizing legislation in the national interest. This bill is so very different to the government's original legislation because the committee unanimously agreed that, quite simply, the Morrison government had not finished its work on this bill, and the work it had done, it had not done well enough. The original bill sought to uplift security and resilience in all critical infrastructure sectors, promising that the government would work in partnership with responsible entities of critical infrastructure assets to establish a clear, effective, consistent and proportionate approach to the security of critical infrastructure. And the government promised it would ensure these new requirements did not duplicate existing regulatory frameworks. The, the bill proposed four major areas of reform. First, to expand the coverage of critical infrastructure from four to 11 sectors. Second, to introduce positive security obligations for critical infrastructure assets. Third, enhance cybersecurity obligations for assets deemed to be systems of national significance. And finally, a provision for government assistance regime to allow, as a last resort, the emergency powers of the government to, to step in and secure Australia's secure critical infrastructure. In principle, these are sound, indeed crucial policy priorities. But the committee found that far from being a clear and effective approach, far from being an exemplar of collaboration, far from avoiding regulatory burden, the Morrison government's bill was an irreconcilable mess that it simply could not recommend passage. I quote from the committee's report. While the committee strongly supports the aims of this bill, it would need a significant amount of redrafting to pass in its entirety and respond adequately to many of the concerns expressed during the review. This would delay significantly the time-critical elements of the bill. So as not to delay the urgent provisions that will help us secure Australia's critical infrastructure from cyber threats, the committee recommended that the bill be split into two and the considerable work of co-designing sector-specific positive security obligations should be deferred to a subsequent bill. And so the amended bill that we have before the chamber today is but a, a portion of the original framework in the original government bill. The bill that Labor will be supporting today introduces the most urgent elements of an enhanced cybersecurity framework. Most importantly, it expands critical infrastructure coverage from four sectors, electricity, gas, water and ports, to 11, now encompassing communications, financial services and markets, data storage and processing, defence industry, higher education and research, energy, food and grocery, health and care and medical, space technology, transport, water and sewerage. The bill also introduces mandatory notification requirements by an entity to a relevant Commonwealth body, but within 48 hours, or sorry, excuse me, but within 84 hours, rather than as in 12, as originally proposed by the Morrison government. An important concession to the feedback received from stakeholders. The bill also defines significant impact in the context of a cybersecurity incident as being when the incident has materially disrupted the availability of essential goods or services provided during using the asset. And lastly, the bill introduces last resort emergency government assistance powers, whereby the minister may authorize the secretary of the department to direct an entity to gather information, undertake an action, or direct that an action not be undertaken or authorize the Australian Signals Directorate to intervene when a cybersecurity incident has occurred, is occurring, or likely to occur. This last measure has generated significant concern during the inquiry. Indeed, this, considerable power, this is a considerable power for the government to wield. The committee heard assurances from the department that this power would be used rarely, if at all. But to ensure against any mission creep and to build in stronger safeguards and oversight, the committee has made an important recommendation that the government has accepted in this amended bill.
That is, that the Department Secretary must now report to the Committee any use of these powers. And the stated intentions of cooperation and consultation are better enabled by the provisions of this bill. On the remaining elements of the government's critical infrastructure plan, the significant work of regulatory obligations that will apply to critical infrastructure assets and systems of national significance, well, on those, the Morrison-Joyce government's been told to go back, do better, listen better, and return with another bill that represents that consultation. And to make sure that Mr. Morrison and his colleagues have really heard the feedback that was overwhelmingly delivered to them uh, via the Intelligence and Security Committee, I want to draw out some of the issues raised during the committee's hearings on this bill. As a member of the committee, I can assure this chamber that we received substantial evidence in submissions to the inquiry. The submissions received were received from companies that will be directly affected by the bill, representative organizations, cybersecurity and technology companies, trade unions, state governments, commonwealth agencies, academics, international experts, and legal peak bodies. I'd like to thank all submitters for their diligent participation and constructive approach. Almost uniformly, submitters, submitters expressed reservations with the government's approach to developing its security critical infrastructure regime. They reported a lack of active engagement and consultation, a lack of information provided to them. They reported a rushed timeline, a scramble to review something incredibly complex, extraordinary in its breadth and gravity and with long-lasting implications. And consistently, submitters raised issue with the government's approach of legislating a mere shell of an idea, the significant detail of which would be left to delegated legislation, meaning neither the parliament nor the affected entities could fully know the impact, impost, and cost of the proposed regime. It was the unanimous assessment of the Parliamentary Joint Committee for Intelligence and Security that this chaotic Morrison government has rushed and botched such a critical piece of legislation. In the interest of national security and in constructive bipartisan negotiation, the committee has amended some important elements of the critical infrastructure bill, salvaged the portions that can be passed today, and hence Labour will be supporting this legislation today. Before finishing, I want to lastly highlight an important feature of the committee's report one that I commend to Mr. Morrison and his Liberal National colleagues. The committee heard expert evidence that cyber-enabled operations spanning disinformation, data theft, and technical disruption can render democratic infrastructure vulnerable in new ways. Such operations, as witnessed in the 2020 presidential election, target political parties, news organizations, <coughs> social media, and have the potential to undermine democratic systems. We heard from the former Director of Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the United States, Mr. Christopher Krebs, who said, Our strategies have to be connected against countering disinformation. This is important for critical infrastructure as well. If you go to the point about an uneven underinvestment for cybersecurity in the critical infrastructure community, there is virtually no investment in countering disinformation. Nowhere more important is that right now than in the deployment of COVID-19 vaccinations. We are seeing an active threat environment from Russia and China for vaccine diplomacy. We're also seeing it from the conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers in general. Mr. Krebs went on to say that in the context of election security, that ahead of the 2020 presidential election, the U.S. government prepared for attacks on electoral systems and hacks against media websites and voter databases. But he warned that the more pervasive aspect was, and I quote, the broader campaign to undermine confidence in leadership, government, and democratic institutions through disinformation operations. Reflecting on his own experience as a senior national security official of publicly announcing that his country was experiencing a major cyber attack, Mr. Krebs said it, that it should only be public officials, such as those from national security agencies, that make such announcements, especially during election campaigns, in order to avoid the perception of political interference. Mr. Krebs said, you never want the incumbent with the ability to put their thumb on the scale and change the outcome of the election.
You would not have wanted a White House press conference for those sorts of announcements because that, in and of itself, can be politicized. These are important pieces of advice from Mr. Krebs. And the Bipartisan Intelligence and Security Committee unanimously agreed and recommended that the government review the cyber threat to our democratic institutions. And the committee also recommended that the government review the caretaker conventions for cyber incidents in an election context. On this important point, I ask that the Morrison government heed the advice of the committee. I note that in Senate estimates, the ASIO Director General, Mark Burgess, has already indicated that he is reviewing and considering how he would approach a cyber event in the context of an election and has flagged he would seek to brief the opposition. I think it's important that the Morrison government takes heed of the advice provided by Mr. Krebs, takes heed of the evidence provided by Mr. Burgess, and takes heed of the recommendation of the Bipartisan Intelligence and Security Committee. The Morrison-Joyce government's attitude to cybersecurity is, quite frankly, dangerously one-dimensional. This is not just a defence or an intelligence issue. Cybersecurity must be understood as a whole of society endeavour. It involves the broader community. It involves small business. It involves large corporations. It involves individuals. It must be robust, active and collaborative partnerships across government, industry and amongst experts. At a time of, quite frankly, global crisis brought on by the pandemic, by disinformation, by threats of cybersecurity, what we need is clarity, certainty and confidence. I urge the government, as it starts its work on Bill 2 of the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, to do its work properly, to consult properly, to truly co-design workable, effective, positive security obligations for Australia's critical infrastructure. I look forward to that bill coming back to the parliament once that work has been done. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. The Greens will not be supporting this bill. In fact, very few key stakeholders support this bill, so we cannot support it in its current form. The government, as usual, is bringing even more half-baked legislation that no one actually wants so they can stand here and pretend to be doing something. This legislation is a greedy little power grab and the Greens cannot support it in its current form. I foreshadow a second reading amendment in my name which outlines our main concerns. But to recap some of those, this bill is not supported by key stakeholders in the logistics, technology and education sectors, among others. In the review of this bill undertaken by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, numerous stakeholders reported insufficient consultation by the government with their respective sector or industry. The government failing to consult is nothing new to me. Believe me, as a First Nations woman, I know that this government does not know the difference between consultation and consent. We know Labor has a problem with that too. But anyway, in the case of this bill, the government failed to consult and many of our key stakeholders don't consent. In fact, many stakeholders reported that this bill would result in the imposition of an excessive regulatory burden on their business, including the potential duplication of regulatory systems. These stakeholders will now have more regulatory and compliance burdens heaped upon them. And I note that for the education sector, there is no new additional funding to allow for them to comply. 
From the position of the Australian Greens, the critical flaw in this bill is that it imposes very, very serious obligations on entities that I remind the Chamber have not been properly consulted. These obligations include the potential for the takeover of business or operations by government security agencies and the ability for the minister to authorise the secretary of the Department of Home Affairs to direct one of these ent entities to gather information, undertake an action or direct that an action not be undertaken, or authorise the Australian Signals Directorate to intervene when a cyber security incident has occurred, is occurring or is likely to occur. In short, the government and its spy agencies can take over the operations of an industry based on the decision of the minister. I'm going to say that again. The government and its spy agencies can take over the operations of an industry based on the decision of the minister. This is wrong, and the stakeholders have not asked for this. This bill would give the minister considerable powers under the guise of protecting the security of critical infrastructure. As I said at the beginning, this is a greedy little power grab that has been done without proper consultation and without any real co-design. We know that government loved that word, co-design, with the affected sectors and the Australian Greens will not be supporting it. Um, Senator Thorpe, did you want to move your second reading amendment now? You did foreshadow one. Uh, yes. Okay, so we'll t take that as moved. Thank you. Thank you. As Senator Molan. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, Australia faces, Deputy President, without doubt, the most uncertain strategic environment it has faced since 1945. For the last 75 years, Australia has achieved prosperity and security to a degree almost unheard of in human history. Much of that security and prosperity is due to the stabilising presence of the United States. Now, I acknowledge, as someone who has worked with, trained and fought beside the United States, that the United States is far from a perfect power, but it is a far better world power than many others. And Australia has benefited from the relationship with the United States. But the world is changing, and Australia is trying to change to accommodate the new world. The new world has characteristics of the old world. The new world is still based on power politics. The new world has nations and leaders who do not have as much of an, in, of an interest in the world order as Australia does. The New World has revanchist powers like China who look back on the appalling way that the old world treated them and wants to take that out on the New World, on our world. For 75 years, when most of our critical infrastructure was built, Australia knew that because of our geographical location and because of our alliances, we faced no direct threat in this country. This was a luxury that we are only now really coming to appreciate. We now find that our region, the Indo-Pacific or the Western Pacific, or whatever you want to call it, is pretty well the centre of the world's strategic environment and certainly the world's interest. Several things are happening in our region which makes the Security Legislation Amendment, Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020 and the Government Amendments in 2021 very important indeed. The first is that the military power of the United States to stabilise our region has fallen by 30 to 50 per cent since the end of the Cold War. This is admitted by the United States in how they express their national defence strategy. And many of us, for a long period of time, have thought that the United States' power was infinite. It's not, 
and we might find ourselves on our own. The second is that we've seen an increase in the military power of China, Russia, Iran and North Korea. China has the largest army, navy, maritime militia, integrated air defence and what are called substrategic rocket and missile forces in the world. Qualitatively, they are approaching the standard of the United States. Let's not forget that Russia is a Pacific power with close military and economic links to China. Let's not forget that Iran is the source of just about every problem in the Middle East at the moment and supposedly is a month away from getting the bomb. And of course, North Korea is an unpredictable nuclear power with an unpredictable leader. The third thing that is relevant to Australia's situation in this bill is that we in Australia have seen over the last two COVID years how vulnerable Australia is to outside influence. Not just supply chains issues, which are terrifyingly real, but also an ability by external actors to reach into any country through cyberspace and impact on our day-to-day -day life. Much of our prosperity is due to our interconnected world. Much of, our, of the efficiency of how our country functions is due to that interconnectedness. Much of the way our security, internal and external functions relies on cyberspace. The use of actual space where satellites fly depends on cyberspace for the transmission of data. The crossover between cyberspace and the real world is now what is important. At present, we are probed in cyberspace thousands of times per day. Many of those probes are successful. Some are, criminally, uh, some are from criminals, some are from countries, and some are malign actors that exist between criminals and nations. What we see today, Acting Deputy President, is nothing compared to what we might see in the lead-up to conflict or to war. We have not seen one country, such as China or Russia, apply their full cyber resources to, an act to, to attacking another country through cyberspace. We have not seen it yet. We have seen small examples in the Baltic countries, probably by Russia. We have seen impacts on parts of India's electricity sector, probably by China. But we will only see the full cyber capability of certain nations applied to other countries in the lead up to or actually in war. And the prospect of war in our region is real. China says it will reincorporate Taiwan, even if it has to use force. President Biden has reaffirmed US support for Taiwan, which makes the US policy of ambiguity even more ambiguous. These are worrying times. Australia, as a nation, is vulnerable. And this bill is one step in addressing our vulnerabilities. The level of cyber attacks on Australia's critical infrastructure is bad enough now, but in certain circumstances it could be much, much worse. Most of us are aware of the reliance of our hospitals, our transport, our financial systems on the internet and, of course, our military systems. But what many do not realise is that many of our military systems rely on exactly the same civilian systems to pass data, as do hospitals, transport and banks. Our infrastructure has never been more important than it is now, and we need this bill. Acting Deputy President, amendments to this bill will ensure the government is well placed to assist entities and those responsible for critical infrastructure assets to respond to serious cyber attacks as the first step in strengthening of Australia's critical infrastructure security. The reforms outlined in the amended bill will strengthen Australia's ability to respond to serious cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. This bill expands the definition of critical infrastructure to include energy, communications, financial services, defence industry, higher education and research, data storage or processing, food and grocery, healthcare and medical, space technology, transport and water 
and sewerage sectors. It introduces cyber incident reporting regime uh, for critical infrastructure assets. It makes government assistance available to industry as a last resort and subject to appropriate limitations. Under this bill, government will be able to provide assistance immediately prior, during or following a significant cyber security incident to ensure the continued provision of essential services. The Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018 uh, strengthened the Australian government's capacity to identify and to manage the national security risk of espionage, sabotage, coercion, uh, resulting from foreign involvement in Australia's critical infrastructure. The government amendment to this bill amends the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018 and is the first phase. The second phase of these reforms will be implemented by further amending the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018, capturing the remaining elements from the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill. Uh, the risk management programs, systems of national significance and enhanced cyber security obligations of industry as the second phase. The recommendations from the Parliamentary Joint Committee Intelligence and Security, recommendations 6 to 14, are currently being considered by the government. Uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I recommend this bill to the Senate. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr <coughs> Acting Deputy President. It is pleasing to see the government's recognition of the increasingly increasing cyber security threats facing essential services, businesses at, and all levels of governments with the introduction of this bill. To understand the need for this legislation, you only need to consider the recent cyber attack on the, ma on the major US oil and gas pipeline. The pervasive threat of cyber-enabled attack and manipulation of critical infrastructure assets is serious, considerable in scope and impact, and increasing at an unprecedented rate. Australia is facing increasing cyber security threats to essential services, businesses and all levels of government. In the past two years, cyber attacks have struck federal parliamentary networks, the health and food sectors, media and universities. Queensland's largest regional water supplier, Sunwater, recently revealed that it was targeted by hackers in a cyber security breach that went undetected for nine months. In this case, the hackers left suspicious files on a web server to redirect visitor traffic to an online video platform. A recently published report produced for the, for the World Economic Forum revealed that 80 per cent of senior cyber security leaders see ransomware as a dangerous, growing threat that is threatening our public safety. The cyber incident in the US underscored that, increasingly, providers of essential services are more vulnerable to widespread cyber threats, both here and abroad. The increasing digitalisation of critical infrastructure sectors such as oil and gas and the associated industrial systems is changing the nature of cyber risks. The government's original approach to address this alarming and growing threat was to expand the definition of critical infrastructure from four sectors to 11 systems of national significance, namely communications, financial services and markets, data storage or processing, defence industries, higher education and research, energy, food, health care, space technology transport and water and sewerage. At the same time, the government also sought to introduce additional reporting requirements for cyber incidents affecting critical infrastructure, along with new government assistance 
measures for critical infrastructure assets and additional positive security obligations for critical, for critical infrastructure assets. When the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security considered the government's initial approach, they noted that threats to critical infrastructure are often complex and serious and usually require a swift and comprehensive response. Given this, the Parliamentary Joint Committee formed the view that the government's attempt to introduce both the assistance measures and the new positive security obligations, along with the sector-specific requirements, all at once would end up achieving neither. Following the release of the findings of the Parliamentary Joint Committee, it is pleasing to see that this legislation reflects a more considered approach than the one the government originally proposed. By accepting the recommendation of the Parliamentary Joint Committee that legislation relating to the security and protection of our critical infrastructure should be split, the Senate is now able to consider this first bill, which relates to the expansion of sectors deemed to be of national significance the additional reporting requirements and the new assistance measures. The positive security obligations and sector-specific requirements are to be covered in further legislation, which should allow the government to con conduct genuine and meaningful consultation with industry. The threats to Australia's critical infrastructure are not solely contained to cyber attacks. They can include natural hazards, espionage, chemical oil spills and insider actions. These all have the potential to significantly disrupt our critical infrastructure. Delays and disruption of fuel supplies and other pressures on our supply chains have made Australians increasingly aware of the vital role played by key parts of our national, national supply chain infrastructure. The global pandemic has also led to heightened awareness of the essential roles undertaken by our transport and logistic workers. Essential workers play a key role in, obscure, uh, to, in securing and protecting our critical infrastructure. They access key transport infrastructure and ensure that our goods that our economy and society need are delivered where they are needed, when they are needed, Mr Acting Deputy President. For this, we can thank the maritime workers and truck drivers of our nation. These critical workers have kept our country and economy going throughout the pandemic, with little thanks or help from this government. In fact, the government won't even officially recognise the essential role played by our maritime workers. The federal government has done nothing to facilitate the vaccination of these key workers, nor have they acted to ensure maritime crew changes can take place in a safe and effective manner. Instead, we have seen repeated outbreaks of COVID on board ships transport, transporting goods to and from Australia and crew being forced to remain on board vessels for over 12 months because crew changes are rarely facilitated in Australia. I remind the government there is much more to critical infrastructure than the physical premises or assets. In addition to the provision for government assistance and mandatory notification requirements provided for in this piece of legislation. The bill also provides for oversight arrangements. On the recommendation of the Parliamentary Joint Committee, the Secretary of the Department is required to report to the committee as soon as possible after, after government assistance measures are requested. This is an important safeguard that will ensure that the Parliament through the committee will be aware of the operations of the Act and whether they are meeting the threat that they have been drafted to address. In addition to this, the Parliamentary Joint Committee will review the operations of the Act three years after it receives royal assent. This measure will help ensure that our security regime put in place to protect our critical infrastructure remains fit for purpose. Security legislation is often complex and can have dire ramifications if we get it wrong. That is why consultation and review processes 
are so important. As I understand it, there, there was considerable concern from stakeholders that the consultation process leading to the government's initial proposed legislation was too rushed and that input, concerns and feedback were not acknowledged or addressed. It is my sincere hope, Mr Acting Deputy President, that by splitting the original legislation into two bills that the government will avail itself of the renewed opportunity to consult with stakeholders that their concerns and suggestions will be given due consideration. I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Security Legislation Critical Infrastructure Bill, and I associate myself with the comments made by my colleague, Senator Thorpe. The bill gives considerable and too much power to the minister under the guise of protecting critical infrastructure. It creates the potential for government security agencies to intervene and take over businesses and operations. This bill is not supported by key stakeholders, including the logistics, technology and higher education sectors. As a Green spokesperson on education, I'll focus my comments on how this bill could impact the higher education sector. In a nutshell, this bill will require the higher education and research sector to have and comply with a critical infrastructure risk management program. It will require universities and research bodies to notify the government about cybersecurity incidents under increased regulatory obligations. The government will be able to directly intervene and take over their computer systems when they experience a cyber attack. National security is important, but there is no clear or compelling reason for the powers this bill gives the government, nor the burdens that it places on higher education and research. This is a misguided bill. I recognize the concerns of various universities that this bill, as it applies to the university sector, is not proportionate, it is not workable, it is not risk-based, and nor is it carefully targeted. The definition of critical education asset and critical infrastructure asset are too broad in scope. Universities have tens of thousands of staff and students, cafeterias, gyms, and swimming pools. None of these assets are distinguished in the bill. Instead, everything in a university would fall under this law. As a number of universities and their umbrella organizations noted in their submissions to the inquiry related to this bill, the regulatory obligations imposed by this bill are likely to be extensive and quite costly for them. The government doesn't even in intend to offer financial support to critical infrastructure owners and employees in meeting the proposed obligations. The innovative research universities have concluded that imposing further legislation on universities without a clear overarching strategy risks blurring the lines of responsibility for action adds complexity to large, diverse organizations and highlights compliance over effective, responsive action. The group of eight have said that the regulatory impact and costs that may accrue in the sector and its members will be significant, far greater than so far estimated by the government, especially when added to the regulation cost already borne by the sector for compliance with other foreign interference laws. For the group of eight, the catch-all nature of the legislation proposed for higher education and research is highly disproportionate. Universities, we know, are in crisis, as the government has cut funding, hiked fees, and offered no support to them or to their international students during COVID-19. Thousands of staff have been let go already, casualization is rampant, and wage theft is systemic. And what does the government do to address this devastation and problems that the universities are facing? Nothing. But here we have a bill that further makes life difficult for them. It's clear that this government has no plan for universities beyond a slash and burn anti-intellectual, anti-education agenda. We can't sit back and expect that the government will take any approach than the one that they have taken for the last eight years. 
That's why the rest of us have to proactively take back some power and reimagine what the universities in future should and hopefully will look like. Last week, I published a new discussion paper on what this could look like. The Greens propose a range of bold ideas that would completely transform higher education in this country. The government should fully fund learning, teaching and research by providing a big boost to funding. Education should be free and student debt should be abolished. Moreover, universities should be places where you can be guaranteed a secure job, where casualization is reversed, where wage theft has ended. Staff and students deserve so much better than what they are experiencing at the moment. Universities should be places where student activism is encouraged, academic freedom is assured, and where political expression is part and parcel of campus life. Universities should be institutions that are equitable, anti-racist, and that platform First Nations knowledges, research, and leadership. Contained in this paper is parliamentary library data we have analyzed, which reveals that over the past 20 years, the number of elected members on the governing bodies of Australian universities has decreased by 43% from 274 elected members in the year 2000 to 155 elected members in 2020. As a proportion, in 2000, more than one-third of positions on these bodies were elected. By 2020, it was down to fewer than one in four. This is nothing less than a crisis of democracy in free fall at our universities. The corporatization of universities by government and neoliberal university management has occurred while staff and student representation on government bodies has shrunk massively. This business model sees staff and students as expendable cogs in the machine of a corporate campus that makes a mockery of the notion that the university is a public good. Universities are at crossroads. They can continue hurtling down a path of corporatization, austerity, and job insecurity, or they can chart a new course based on democracy, equity, and the collective public good. Rather than focusing on the real issues that universities face, this government is imposing another unnecessary, disproportionate burden on university communities. The government is once again trying to grow its ever-expanding surveillance powers under the guise of national security. It presents a real threat to the independence and autonomy of the university sector. It allows the government to extensively intervene in university operations. The ability of government agencies to reach into and possibly take over external systems, including those of our education sector, raises serious issues of organizational integrity and autonomy. And this ever-increasing surveillance creep should be concerning for all of us here. Let's not become desensitized to how much surveillance power we are giving this government. The Greens will not be supporting this bill. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Now, we undoubtedly live in, a, uh, live in a digital age, one where no corner of the globe has been left untouched. This interconnectivity has brought with it a significant number of benefits to society. However, this also means that human life and society has become increasingly dependent on modern information technology. Recent advances in new information and communication networks have led to a shift towards new emerged paradigms, such as smart grids, IoT, or the Internet of Things, cloud computing, big data, and edge and fog computing. One of the most resp the fundamental responsibilities of a government is to ensure the security of its citizens. This means that we must ensure that the infrastructure that underpins the very functioning of our society is secure. While past cyber attacks were focused mainly to IT environments, the trends show that cyber risks are now greater in the operational technology environment. Software and data critical to the provision of essential services, such as power, water, healthcare, transportation and communications, must be protected from criminals and terrorists if the nation's security is to be assured. 
The imperative is to ensure the continuous delivery of essential services is not only clearly legal but also moral. The cyber threat to critical infrastructure continues to grow, and this represents one of the most serious national security challenges we must confront. The increased integration of uh, IoT technology, as well as the digitisation of many systems upon which our, our critical infrastructure rely, means that many of the systems that our society relies on are increasingly under threat from cyber attacks. As outlined in Australia's Cyber Security Strategy 2020, the Australian Government is committed to protecting the essential services that all Australians rely on by uplifting the security and resilience of critical infrastructure. Australia is facing increasing cybersecurity threats to essential services, businesses and all levels of government. In the past two years, we have seen cyber attacks on our federal parliamentary networks, logistics, the medical centre and universities, just to name a few. Internationally, we have seen cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, the recent attacks against Colonial Pipeline in the United States, which supplies half of that country's east coast with fuel, was shut down for six days and led to the president declaring a state of emergency. It led to fuel shortages and the company having to pay a $4.4 million ransom. We have seen attacks against the Ukraine's power grid in 2015 and 16, resulting in large parts of the country losing power for hours on end. There are countless examples, however, that these two go to show that this is a real and present threat that has real-world consequences. All Australians rely on critical infrastructure to deliver essential services that are crucial to our economic prosperity and our way of life, such as electricity, communications, transport and banking. Critical infrastructure is increasingly interconnected and inter interdependent. Connectivity without proper safeguards creates significant vulnerabilities. Interconnectedness means that the compromise of one critical infrastructure asset can have a domino effect that degrades or disrupts others and results in cascading consequences across Australia's economy and national security. Threats across a range of hazards, from natural threats, including meteorological or climate hazards, to human-induced threats, including unlawful interference, cyber inc incidents, espionage, chemical or oil spills, as well as from trusted insiders, all have the potential to significantly disrupt critical infrastructure. As a majority of Australia's critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private industry or state and territory governments, it is vital that our approach to ensuring the resilience of Australia's critical infrastructure is clear, effective, consistent and proportionate. That government alone can succeed in addressing the challenges and vulnerabilities regarding cyber security should not be our expectation. Critical infrastructure owners and operators, whether public or private, must take every precaution to protect their digital assets and networks. However, we believe the government must take necessary steps so that it can protect critical infrastructure from various threats. Amendments to the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020 will ensure the government is well placed to assist entities responsible for critical infrastructure assets to respond to serious cyber attacks as a first step in strengthening Australia's critical infrastructure security. Reforms outlined in the bill will strengthen Australia's ability to respond to serious cyber attacks on critical infrastructure by expanding the definition of critical infrastructure so that it includes energy, communications, financial services, defence industry, higher education, research, data storage or processing, food and grocery, health care and medical, space technology, transport and water and sewerage sectors. It will introduce a cyber incident reporting regime for critical infrastructure assets and by making government assistance available to industry as a last resort and subject to appropriate limitations, this assistance will be available immediately prior, during or following a significant cyber security incident to ensure the continued provision of essential services. By defining what is and isn't critical infrastructure, 
the government is better able to allocate resources and responsibilities during a crisis. The definitions have been refined in partnership with industry to ensure that only those assets that are truly critical are captured. The assets have been identified as critical based on their impact on the social or economic stability of Australia, the defence of Australia or the impact to Australia's national security. Currently, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act of 2018 requires entities responsible for critical infrastructure to provide ownership and operator information for the register of critical infrastructure assets. The cyber incident reporting regime builds on the existing obligations in the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act and once turned on for each sector will require infrastructure entities to report incidents to the Australian Cyber Security Centre through the Report Cyber Portal and provide ownership and operator information for the register. This will enable a quick and effective government response to cyber security incidents by providing greater situational awareness of threats to those assets. Critical infrastructure entities will have up to 12 hours to report a critical cyber security incident once they become aware of it and up to 72 hours to report other cyber security incidents. The time frame for reporting cyber security incidents aligns with the reporting regimes such as uh, APRA's Prudential Standard CPS 234 and the EU's GDPR. The reporting of cyber security incidents is vital to help the government develop an aggregated threat picture and comprehensive understanding of cyber security risks to critical infrastructure in a way that is mutually beneficial to government and industry. Reporting of cyber security incidents will provide better proactive and reactive incident response options which can range from providing voluntary assistance to industry to building a better culture of cyber security. These reforms will provide for these reforms will provide for government assistance measures. These measures are necessary as there may be situations where a cyber threat or incident is occurring or has occurred which can or will pose a serious risk to our national security interests. The assistant measures will focus on protecting and defending assets which provide a critical role in Australia's economy, society or defence when the owner or operator of those assets is unable to do so. Noting the importance of these assets to effective functioning of Australian society, it will be a criminal offence not to comply with directions made under the assistance regime. These assistance powers are necessary due to the current threats we face and expectations from the community that when national, Australia's national interests are under threat, the government will use its technical expertise to ensure essential services remain functioning. Senator Van, we've come to Senator's statements. You'll be able to continue your remarks when the bill is brought back on. I should now proceed to the two-minute statements. Senator Billick. Thank you very much. Amazon's CEO, Jeff Bezos, was the first person in history to build a personal fortune worth more than 200 billion US dollars. Despite his wealth going up by $13 million an hour in 2020, Amazon workers face dangerous working conditions, especially during the COVID pandemic, and they've had little or no increase to their pay. Amazon has retaliated against these workers who have made efforts to collectively organise for better paying conditions. In Australia, the Transport Workers Union and the SDA have represented Amazon workers who have experienced wage theft, unsafe conditions and unfair sackings. Courier and truck drivers across the transport industry have taken industrial action to stop the Amazon effect because Amazon's actions have driven down paying conditions across the entire industry. Amazon con conducts surveillance of its warehouse workers and has admitted to calling the police on TWU organisers engaging in lawful right of entry. While hugely profitable, Amazon's tax arrangements mean they barely pay any income tax in the countries where they derive most of revenue. Yeah. Amazon paid zero tax in the United States in 2017 and 2018. Despite breaking through the $1 billion revenue barrier in Australia last year, 
Amazon paid little more than $20 million in Australian income tax. By not paying their fair share of taxes, they're ripping off public services like health and education, not just in Australia, but throughout the world. While Mr Bezos has acknowledged the climate crisis, Amazon's carbon footprint is greater than that of two thirds of the world's countries. Citizens across the globe are starting to unite with Amazon workers, political representatives and civil society organisations Senator to Bellick, push your back time has against Amazon's poor record on workers' rights. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. As someone who worked for the ABC as a journalist and presenter for, for nine years, I'm a great supporter of our national broadcaster and the important role it plays in our democracy. However, I want to see an ABC that is the best possible version of itself, trusted by all Australians and with a reputation for impartiality in its reporting of news and current affairs. I am also a strong defender of the ABC's editorial independence. Regrettably, the ABC has not been meeting the high standards Australians rightly expect in all respects. I'm very pleased that the chair, Ita Buttrose, has agreed to meet with me about my deep concerns, which includes the ABC's decision to cut regional Victorian radio services at a time when the ABC should be investing in more Australian regional services. While I welcome the ABC's review of its complaints process, the responsible Senate committee has every right to also inquire into these matters, and it's quite wrong to suggest, as Ms Buttrose did, that this interferes with the ABC's independence. I hope the result is a more robust, accountable and independent complaints process where complaints are taken much more seriously. Regrettably, the ABC continues to allow its employees and contractors to freelance on social media in a manner which is inconsistent with Section 8 of the ABC Act, which requires the ABC to disseminate news and information accurately and impartially. This risks damaging the ABC's credibility as a source of impartial news. Of course, this could be fixed if the ABC required its staff to comply with its editorial policies when posting on personal social media accounts, but it has declined to do so. Uh, in the 1990s, when I worked for the ABC, if I had done a similar thing, made a public statement not authorised, um, that would have been uh, misconduct. So, as I say, the ABC must be a broadcaster for all Australians. Thank you. Senator Cox. I'd like to read from the Wadi Council's statement on the West Australian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill 2021, which was handed to Premier McGowan in Port Hedland. We, the law holders of the Pilbara, strongly reject the proposed changes to the draft Aboriginal Heritage Bill 2020, particularly the consultancy amendments. This act provides a false sense of security for First Nations people under Section 17 when it comes to blocking development on sacred sites. The proposed changes are unjust, flawed and disadvantageous in several aspects and will not save cultural sites. We, the First Nations people of the Pilbara, have no confidence in the Draft Act or the government who are proposing the enactment of this act. It is unclear how this process how in this process First Nations people are being adequately consulted or given the chance to save sites that hold significant religious and cultural significance. This is a basic human right which the government continues to ignore. Our basic human right to practice our cultural and religion on sacred sites that have held significant meaning for thousands of years for First Nations people. We are entitled under international laws to input reg regarding our cultural sites. The traditional people or law holders of sacred places where there is proposed destruction development planned should be consulted adequately and the law should reflect that adequate consultation is necessary. The government's continued failure to consult with First Nations people to identify these sites, this failure, is pro this failure to properly consult with Aboriginal landholders has led to unnecessary destruction amounting to cultural genocide. Take note, the world is watching the West Australian government as they continue the impression of our voices when it comes to destroying our sacred cultural sites. Senator Smith. Acting Deputy President, we live in a world where misinformation not only runs rife, but where spreading it has become part of a business model. 
In the midst of a global pandemic, the spread of misinformation is not only disingenuous, it is extremely dangerous, and it is everywhere. Misinformation is entrenching division, fraying communities when we should be sticking together. Now, more than ever, trusted information, trusted news matters. And yet, in Australia, where we should rightfully be proud of our national broadcasters, the ABC and the SBS, we see public broadcasting yet again under attack from this government. We've seen a politically motivated inquiry launched, which has nothing to do with improving national broadcasting and everything to do with this government's obsession of secrecy and averting accountability. And of course, this is just the latest in a long line of attacks from the Liberals on our ABC. $83.7 million worth of funding cuts in the 1920 budget alone. This lot cannot be trusted with public broadcasting. Only Labor will back the independence of our ABC. Only Labor will deliver a properly funded ABC, including funding certainty over five years instead of three. And only Labor will continue to fight for the communities which rely on our public broadcasters as a trusted source of information on the ground in their communities. It was only recently, during the black summer bushfires in my state, that we saw how much the ABC really matters in times of crisis to South Australians. And during this pandemic, the SBS was vital in ensuring in-language information went to communities who needed it, who needed that information to be safe. The work of our broadcasters, our public broadcasters, matters, truly matters, and that's why Labor will always defend it here. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, you're on mute. Thank you. Fake Christians are the Judas goats of the 21st century. We have a fake Christian Prime Minister and in New South Wales a fake Christian Premier. Both are forcing the faithful to, to break their covenant with God or be destroyed, unable to provide for themselves and their families. Both are not ambassadors of God's light. Both are harbingers of hatred. That the billionaires who own the world would advance these two men as their pawns says more about the billionaires than it does about Prime Minister Morrison and Premier Perrottet, who we already know are the elite sock puppets. Elite billionaires clearly consider Christianity as nothing more than attendance at church and pious words. In the case of our Prime Minister, throw in a little happy clappy Christian theatre. How little they understand us. The book of Matthew tells us that Jesus did not turn away lepers. Jesus healed lepers. In many such lessons throughout the Bible, Jesus was instructing the faithful, quote, purity laws that categorize and isolate others are not of God. Our inner beings, our hearts must be pure, and purity involves integrity of the whole person. These teachings support religious objection to COVID injections. If these fake Christians were indeed men of God, they would know this fundamental Christian belief and would defend that belief, not destroy it. There's nothing Christian in these men's actions. Maintaining this facade of Christianity leads the faithful away from God, towards segregation, towards persecution, towards the destruction of our families and our communities. That's the role of a Judas goat. The faithful will flourish. Those who desert their faith for anti-human corporatism will not. Perhaps this Christmas, Scott Morrison and Dom Perrottet can contemplate Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 8 to 22. Thank you. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On Friday evening last week, I was thrilled to be at the opening night of the third annual Croatian Film Festival. A huge congratulations to the Croatia House Committee for not only keeping this event going, but for continuing to grow and introduce non-Croatian Australians to the history, art and community of their homeland. I want to acknowledge the strength of this community. We've all lived through probably the worst period we will ever see throughout our lifetime. And this has certainly been an unprecedentedly difficult time filled with isolation, separations and perhaps health, both physical and mental challenges that we have never experienced before and hope to never again. A highlight of the festival was the showing of the film Countryman, and we were joined by director Peter Pekatic, who followed in his migrant father's footsteps on a 10,000-kilometre round trip around the Northern Territory. 
A highlight of the story is the links between Croatia and an Indigenous artist, Joseph Williams, whose father was a Croatian who came to Australia to cut sugarcane. A friendship develops between Peter and Joseph as they share each other's Indigenous and Mediterranean history and culture. We were also joined by world-famous artist Charles Billich and his wife Krista, along with Steve Ravick, who produced and directed the documentary Beyond the Canvas, previously screened at Cannes Film Festival in a further celebration of Croatian filmmaking. The film festival has almost fit perfectly with us entering the Christmas season, where for those of us with family pretty much anywhere in the world other than Western Australia, you'll be able to see them, hug them, spend time with them and make up for the lost time that we've lost. So congratulations, Miana Sesta and the whole committee on another wonderful event. Thank you to the Croatian community that has made me feel so welcome, and I look forward to supporting Croatia House well into the future. Senator Lyons. Thank you. Well, how timely that is. Um, I'm speaking today on the criticisms of the Morrison government against Western Australia's hard border, and we just heard from Senator Hughes in this place had a go at Western Australia. We've had the Prime Minister having a go at Western Australia. We've had the Deputy Prime Minister having a go at Western Australia, and yet not one Western Australia senator or MP in this place from the Liberal or the Nationals have actually stood up for Western Australia. You would think that they don't really care about Western Australia, and that's pretty evident, to call us cave people, to liken us to the crudes, to uh, declare Western Australia, as uh, Mr Joyce did, to be similar to North Korea. How insulting is that? How insulting is that? Well, we've had an excellent state Labor government who has looked after Western Australia, and life in Western Australia is going pretty well, thank you very much. We've not had COVID cases. We've got an economy that is um, going gangbusters. In fact, the GST it's generating for the rest of the country should really be appreciated. And yet all we've heard from those over there is uh, denigrating Western Australia's. And where are, where are those Liberal and National uh, West Australian representatives in this place. They're not sticking up for West Australians. In fact, we had Mr Porter, who we think is going to resign uh, in the next uh, sitting period, um, try and pretend to Western Australians that he wasn't backing in Clive Palmer's bid uh, to challenge our closed borders. And then we had uh, Senator Cash goad people, suggest that another challenge would be on the cards and would likely succeed. Again, a Western Australian senator who is not on the side of Western Australians. Vote them out, I say. Senator Griff. Deputy President, earlier this month we marked National Cervical Cancer Awareness Week. It was a timely reminder about the impact this terrible cancer has on women in Australia and around the world. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer amongst women globally. More than half a million women are diagnosed each year and more than 300,000 women die from cervical cancer each year, often after enduring years of suffering. 300,000. It's an incredible number, and even more incredible because a vaccine is available. And for those who aren't vaccinated, the cancer can be successfully treated when it is detected early and appropriate care is available. Cervical cancer is caused by the HPV virus. The first vaccine to protect against cervical cancer was targeted at the HPV virus. I'm proud to say that vaccine Gardasil was an Australian development, the product of work by professors Ian Fraser and Jian Zhu while at the University of Queensland. Once Gardasil was developed and approved by the TGA, it was rolled out nationally. Today, more than 100 countries have their own HPV vaccination program and more than 300 million doses are administered worldwide. More work remains to be done on cervical cancer. But millions of lives have been saved and a huge amount of suffering avoided thanks to the work of these two remarkable Australians. National Cervical Cancer Awareness Week is an important reminder of the cruelty of cancer in our lives. But it's also 
a reminder about the power of science and that vaccinations alleviate suffering and improve all of our lives. A reminder that we need now more than ever. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. With the stroke of a pen from a foreign nation, whole groups of people can be disqualified from sitting and standing, from standing in parliament. That's what our constitution says. According to our constitution, a person can't be a sitting member of parliament if they are a citizen of another country. If a foreign parliament decides to make someone a citizen, even against the person's knowledge, even against that person's will, that person can't be a member of parliament anymore. We're handing over the power to decide who our representatives are to another country, and I'm sure the constitution was never meant for that. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's completely bizarre. But even bigger and more troubling issue is not around citizenship at all. It's with a provision around holding an office of profit under the Crown. This rule prevents teachers, nurses, police officers, doctors, members of defence, anybody that's profiting from a Crown. If you have a contract, if you have a contract with the government, guess what? You're out. You're not in. You're not allowed to. People who have cared for their communities, who have led carers of public life, who have sought to make a contribution to the lives of people around them, are being told they will not qualify to become politicians unless they throw that job in and quit. This is so absurd, and it absolutely diminishes the political pool that should, we should have up here. You're knocking a heap of people out, and it is not fair. Those are the kinds of people that we need in here, leaders in their community, their own fields, who actually want to help people, who are prepared to make a difference and put it on the line for it. The fact we don't have more people like that in parliament today is depressing. The fact that rules preventing them from getting here is inexcusable. Any government with a spine will go to a referendum to get rid of this rule altogether. Every Australian citizen, everyone that is born in here, should be allowed to run for public office. Everybody! You've just chucked out a whole pool, pool of people, and it is not fair. It is not fair to the electorates, and it's not fair to them. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise today not to have an argument with the Victorian Premier, but I will say this. The Premier willfully misrepresented the facts by saying that the PM forgot to order the vaccines in a media conference last week. The Premier knows full well the vaccines were ordered. The PM's media release of uh, the 5 November 2020 highlights that 134 million doses had been ordered. The Premier's willful misrepresentation of the facts is just another political ploy by Mr Andrews, and I can tell him now Victorians see right through him. Just as they have over his complete overreach for unfettered political power. No one is arguing states don't require emergency powers. However, he has had ample powers that included parliamentary oversight, and he still managed to lock Victorians down for longer than any other place in the world. The powers he has put to the Victorian lower house already are the greatest power overreach Australia has ever seen. The Victorian bar says, and I quote, the bill provides grossly insufficient parliamentary supervision over the minister's exercise of power. The bar and 60 eminent QCs said it provides extremely broad and unchecked powers on authorised officers. Now, let's be clear. These officers are not sworn officers. They are surge workforce on temporary contracts being paid approximately $90,000 a year. Mr Andrews' introduction of this bill is giving him totalitarian-like powers, and this shows why he's earned the nickname Dictator Dan. Senator Patrick. Mr Acting Deputy President. This morning, in the other place, my colleague from South Australia, Member for Mayor Rebecca Sharkey, introduced a customs amendment in brackets banning goods uh, produced by forced labour in brackets Bill 2021. Now, the name might sound very familiar to people because, in actual fact, on the 23rd of August uh, this year, the Senate dealt with a bill of exactly the same name. Uh, the bill was designed to pro prohibit the use of uh, slave labour by banning any product that came to uh, Australia that either used slave labour in full or in part from being allowed to enter this country. The Senate voted in favour of this bill but the bill has languished in the House. 
We don't want to have uh, goods coming to Australia that uh, are made from slave labour, and there's three reasons we don't want that. The first is because it incentivises uh, slave labour. It causes misery in other countries uh, with uh, other people who are forced to do uh, jobs uh, and are not paid in any way to, to, to do these jobs. Secondly, Australia needs to stand tall on the international stage in standing up and saying slave labour is not OK. And thirdly, slave labour carried out overseas hurts Australian businesses. Australian businesses have no way of competing with, uh, with any product that comes in from overseas that basically is made without any labour costs. So uh, this abhorrent trade helps no one, and yet we find the Morrison government unable to support it. Hopefully, Ms Sharkey will put the bill to the House of Representatives, and hopefully we'll find some uh, go government uh, members who will cross the floor and support it. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to offer my deepest sympathies to the hard-working South Australian men and women working in the state's oyster growing industry, who have had their jobs and their industry threatened by an outbreak of the Vibrio virus. Last week it was discovered that the virus had broken out in the Coffin Bay region and that 45 cases of gastroenteritis have been linked to it since September. The South Australian oyster industry has had some really tough times in recent years, including the knock-on effects of the Tasmanian Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome outbreak that had a devastating impact, and more recently, COVID-19. And just as the nation is about to reopen and there was light at the end of the tunnel after two years of no interstate or international tourism, the industry has been hit with this temporary shutdown. Of course, it's not just the growers and the shuckers, it's the transport workers and the hospitality staff and many others who are being impacted by the temporary shutdown of the oyster industry in South Australia. SA Oyster Growers Association Executive Officer Lindley Lowe last week told The Guardian newspaper that the industry is deeply concerned, but is working with a number of government agencies to try and identify the cause. There's since been speculation that issues such as strange weather patterns, unusual ocean currents and the unseasonal water temperatures um, that we are experiencing who could have been spurred on by climate change and may have been a contributing factor. Slow said, we are, extremely high, we are examining highly unusual environmental conditions, something which has not been seen before in SA and which has coincided with this outbreak. This latest outbreak will no doubt put further strain on growers and the industry more broadly. I sincerely hope that the cause of the outbreak, whatever it may be, is discovered sooner rather than later. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I rise to call out today the government's full blown attack on the Australian broadcaster, the ABC. Just around the corner is an election, and like clockwork, we already see this government going after the ABC attacking them in whichever way they can. And this is all happening while the public broadcaster is in negotiations with this government for their next round of funding. It's not enough that under this government they've cut $783 million since the time that Mr Abbott, when he was the leader of the opposition, promised there would be no cuts to the ABC. And now we see every time Every time Mr Morrison wants to create a distraction, he goes after the Australian people's broadcaster. Now, I know we don't always, as politicians, like the stories that the media publish. We don't always like the way things are reported. But the sheer arrogance of the Morrison government to try and interfere in the independent process of the ABC as a quick, cheap, political game, doing the bidding of the Murdoch press, doing the bidding of right-wing media in this country. Well, Australians are sick of it, and they are sick and tired of every time Mr Morrison has something he doesn't want to talk about, that he attacks the ABC. And what we've seen over the last week 
is now a strategic move to undermine the sheer independence of the broadcaster with an inquiry that would undermine their ability to look at their own processes. And I urge members in this place to not let Mr Morrison off the hook. Senator Macdonald. Acting Deputy President, the Queensland Labor government continues to fail in, in administering the state, particularly regional Queensland, and it's an E by any measure. I rise with deep concern at the scandal-ridden Queensland government's dereliction of duty in so many basic functions, but most seriously, hospital ramping at Bundaberg and Toowoomba and across the state, with ambulance officers increasingly desperate for support. On 17 December, one of the busiest Fridays of the year, as people roll out of work to celebrate before Christmas, Pubs and clubs should be optimistic about increased takings after a very lean past 18 months. But now the Labor Premier talks about rewarding people with less restrictions. However, there is no reward for pubs and clubs, hotels and cafes who have been smashed at every turn. They were the first to be closed during snap lockdowns, forced to destroy food with no compensation. They struggle to find staff to work in venues. And now, just when there's a glimmer of hope that normality will return, small business owners are expected to man every entrance and have their staff be the policemen for public health requirements. Queenslanders are rolling up their sleeves in droves, but now coffee shop workers and bar staff have to check vaccination status, and our under-resourced police service is expecting, expected to respond to complaints. The lack of consistency is that you can travel on public transport, buy a sausage at Bunnings, or groceries without being checked. This imposition of restrictions will have the greatest Im impact on our Indigenous communities and others who, while vaccinated, are deeply concerned at the state overreaching its mandate on keeping us safe. Even returning home for a family or frequent business traveller will be financially impossible, as the Queensland Labor government insists on tests that are $150 Senator per McDonald, person. Senator MacDonald, your time has expired. Senator McCarthy, remotely. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Northern Territory is experiencing its worst COVID outbreak since the pandemic began. It's incredibly serious for us up here in the Northern Territory, in particular around the Catherine region and those west and east of Catherine and also across our borders. I encourage the vaccination process to occur in Catherine and right across the Northern Territory we still have so many Territorians that need to be vaccinated, and I encourage them to do so immediately. But also those residents who border us uh, with Western Australia and with Queensland also. I'd like to update the Senate on the developing COVID outbreak here. Uh, we've just heard news that Catherine has recorded two more new cases overnight. On Saturday, the remote. I'm sorry, Senator carried. McCarthy. Given it's 2 p.m., we do have to move to questions without notice. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On the 31st of October, LNP MP George Christensen posted a photo of Victorian Premier Dan Andrews on his Telegram account, inciting violent comments threatening Premier Andrews' life. These posts have been drawn to the attention of the Minister for Home Affairs, Karen Andrews, and have been referred to the AFP. What action has Mr Morrison taken in response to Mr Christensen's online activity? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Keneally uh, for the question. Um, I, uh, I note that, uh, that Senator Keneally indicated that the posts had been either drawn to the attention of or referred to the Minister for Home Affairs. Uh, and uh, uh, this, I can say, is the first I'm aware of the posts in question. Uh, so in terms of any other uh, engagement uh, that government may have had, I will take that on notice, Senator. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. On the 26th of August, Mr Christensen posted a video of Catherine King MP which incited threatening comments directed at Ms King. The post was drawn to the attention of the AFP. What action has Mr Morrison taken in response to this online activity from Mr Christensen? 
Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Once again, I will take that on notice in terms of uh, uh, any further information that can be provided uh, beyond uh, beyond what the senator has referenced in uh, in relation to whether uh, any agencies uh, or others are looking at uh, those matters. Again, I'm not aware, in particular, of the specific content of the post that the senator is referring to. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Given Mr Christensen has fomented anger and failed to moderate comments inciting violence on his own social media account, has the Prime Minister directed Mr Christensen to remove posts and comments inciting violence against the Premier of Victoria and any other public figure? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Um, well, uh, let me uh, be very clear in, uh, in stating in the chamber, as, uh, as I said on radio this morning and have said in a number of other places, and as the Prime Minister has said as well, uh, there is no place uh, for uh, violence uh, or remarks that incite uh, violence or create uh, or inflame um, unnecessary tensions in, uh, in ways that could provoke violence uh, in Australian political debate. Uh, I've taken on notice that the specific references to Mr Christensen's um, apparent posts or apparent content uh, on sites. As I said in response to those questions, I'm not aware uh, of the particular posts that Senator Keneally uh, refers to or the particular content she refers to, um, uh, but if, uh, if there's information in terms of engagement uh, in relation to those matters uh, that, uh, that I can add and bring to the chamber, I'll do so. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government's national plan is securing our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and will deliver more economic opportunities for Australian families and businesses? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator McLaughlin very much for his question. Uh, and I know his interest in seeing uh, Australian business, Australian families uh, continue to be able to enjoy the benefits uh, of the dividend of Australia's management of COVID-19. Management that has saved more than 30,000 lives across our country, management that has saved many thousands of businesses and many hundreds of thousands of jobs across our country. Uh, and pleasingly, the national plan that the Prime Minister took to national cabinet, underpinned by scientific modelling, is charting the pathway that is enabling each of the states and territories uh, to open up, to take the progress forward that gives businesses the confidence to plan and to invest. And we're seeing that across the country, uh, Mr. President. Uh, new unpublished payroll jobs data shows that in New South Wales, new hires have increased by some 25 per cent in the fortnight to the 24th of October. This data also shows that in Victoria, new hires are up by 15 per cent. And here in the ACT, they're up by 22 per cent. It shows very clearly, Mr President, that businesses are getting Order. back on with the business uh, of creating jobs and creating prosperity across our country. Uh, indeed, payroll data shows that small businesses across Australia have created more than 300,000 jobs for Australians in the period April 2020 to September 2021, while medium-sized businesses created another 300,000 jobs. That's 600,000 additional jobs right across our country. For small businesses alone, it's showing around 18,000 jobs per month or around 4,500 jobs per week uh, being created. And job ads showing at a 30 per cent higher level than they were at the start of the pandemic. In fact, job ads in Australia, Mr President, at a 12-year high, underpinned by high levels of business confidence, high levels of consumer confidence, all of it thanks to the fact that we are Minister, well on that path to reopening. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. What are the next steps in the government's plan to reopen our international borders, and why is it critical to supporting jobs and economic growth? Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, as the Prime Minister said today, we're making significant progress on the delivery of the national reopening plan underpinned by uh, that safe, sound scientific advice uh, that the Prime Minister has relied upon and has taken through National Cabinet. Uh, it's another win for Australians that we're seeing uh, today, uh, with the nation in excess of 85 per cent double-dose vaccination around the country, uh, that we can move uh, to enable from the 1 December this year 
fully vaccinated eligible visa holders to be able to come to Australia without needing to apply for a travel exemption. This includes skilled and student cohorts as well as humanitarian working holiday maker and provisional visa holders. The closure of Australia's borders was one of the most important decisions taken to keep our nation safe, but this reopening, including reopening to fully vaccinated citizens from Japan and the Republic of Korea, uh, shows that we are now back on the path to welcoming visitors back to our country and making steady progress on the implementation Minister, of that national plan. Your time plan. has expired. Senator McLaughlin, a second supplementary question. How has the government's plan for lower taxes supported Australian jobs and businesses throughout the pandemic, and why is it important to continue this approach to ensure confident confidence through the COVID recovery? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, indeed, the government's economic policies have provided not only a safety valve but an underpinning to the economy and to Australian businesses and Australian jobs throughout the pandemic, but crucially they have also provided the platform for this strong recovery and rebound. In the September quarter just gone, $10.2 billion flowed into the pockets of Australians in tax cuts that had been delivered by our government, representing the largest quarterly tax cut in over two decades. We, suspect, we expect a further $15 billion in tax cuts will flow this financial year, around $1.5 billion every month going to the pockets of Australian families and households to be able to support their investment, their plans and, through that, our economic recovery. Small business benefiting from some $5 billion worth of lower taxes that we have delivered to them. All of that contrasted, though, if you saw the shadow treasurer yesterday, not able to give any commitments about Minister, taxes under a future Labor government, expired. whereas the proof Senator from us. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In August last year, Mr. Morrison declared that he expected the COVID-19 vaccine to be, and I quote, as mandatory as you can possibly make. Does Mr Morrison stand by this statement? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, the Prime Minister has been very clear uh, right throughout uh, the course of the pandemic uh, that we have no appetite uh, for mandatory vaccinations, aside from where the health advice makes it very clear uh, that there is a real benefit in doing so. Now, in that regard, uh, where that health advice so led, uh, he led, the Prime Minister led and the government led, particularly when it came uh, to aged care uh, and uh, requiring uh, and asking the states to pursue mandatory vaccination around aged care workers. That was something the Prime Minister took to National Cabinet, asked the state and territories to agree with, uh, and they then progressively uh, set about uh, implementing that. We have supported them in relation to decisions about disability care workers and in relation to essential health workers working with those who are most vulnerable, most exposed when it comes to COVID-19. We have been clear that, more broadly, the best way to achieve the high levels of vaccination rates that Australia has achieved, the more than 85 per cent double-dose vaccination across the country, is to ensure that Australians understand, first and foremost, the benefit of being vaccinated. The fact that it provides greater safety to them, their loved ones and those around them. And Australians have responded most positively and in world-leading terms in regard to receiving those vaccines. They have done so overwhelmingly voluntarily. We thank them for it. We acknowledge the fact they have heeded those messages. And we continue, through public communications campaigns and other efforts, to pursue and to urge Australians who have not yet been vaccinated to add to that 85 per cent double dose rate to date. Minister, we... Minister please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill. I think um, Senator Birmingham for his um, Senator O'Neill, why for are you his on comments, your but, feet? Yes. But the point of order is relevant. Um, so I thank the senator for his comments. The question was senator about O'Neill, the minister was mandatory. being directly relevant. I the mean, question I'm happy was about to hear mandatory. Your point of order, if I please go ahead. So, Mr. President, the point is a, is a point of relevance. The minister has been talking about vaccinations and applauding Australians. I'm always going to acknowledge that. But the question was about mandatory. 
as mandatory as you possibly can make it, and I don't believe that the minister, with respect, has answered that part of the question at all. With respect, I listened carefully to the minister's answer. I believe he was being directly relevant, minister. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said right at the outset, the government's always been clear, and we have no desire for mandatory vaccinations except uh, where it is absolutely essential in relation to the health advice. But minister, we urge every single time, Australian to time get vaccinated. Your answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Mr Morrison then went on to say, and I quote, there are always exemptions for any vaccine on medical grounds, but that should be the only basis. Does Mr Morrison stand by this statement? Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. And well, Mr President, the answer is precisely as I said before, uh, that as a government, from the Prime Minister down, uh, we've been consistent in regards to not expecting COVID-19 vaccination to be mandatory across the country, but to supporting and encouraging every single Australian to get vaccinated and to supporting and to leading the states and territories in relation to vaccine mandates uh, where the health advice has argued it is necessary for the protection of our most vulnerable. Senator Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Direct relevance, Mr President. Uh, th this does go to a specific question about a past statement from the Prime Minister and whether or not he still stands by that statement. Now, nothing the minister has said actually goes to that statement. In fact, it's the new line, not the line that he's been asked about. Uh, I'm happy to rule. I've been listening very carefully to the answer. I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister has said on countless occasions when asked about vaccinations that he was not going to mandate it uh, across Australia. Uh, he was very clear on that, very clear on that on many, many occasions over a very, very long Senator period Watt. of time. That's the position he has continued to hold uh, and that the government continues Minister, to hold, Minister, except in those exceptional your time circumstances. has expired. Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. When asked if he's going to have campaigns from the anti-vaxxers, Mr Morrison boasted, and I quote, I was the minister that established no jab, no play. So my view on this is pretty clear and not for turning. Does Mr Morrison hold the same clear views? Or was he lying when he said that? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the Prime Minister absolutely holds the same clear views in support of encouraging every single Australian to get vaccinated. And indeed, more than 91 per cent of Australians over the age of 16 have had a first dose, have heeded that message, have responded positively. And more than 85 per cent of Australians over the age of 16 have followed through and had that second dose to become fully vaccinated, ensuring that we are one of the Senator most Andrew. highly protected countries in the world now. That in terms of vaccine uptake, Senator we are one of the most highly protected countries in the world. Well above the OECD average now, above countries like Israel or the UK, a nation that Order. has demonstrated that you Senator can have a pathway to vaccination overwhelmingly voluntarily applied, but that Australians will respond to the merit of those arguments which have been laid out to encourage them to do so. Minister, they have. We thank Minister, them and we continue to encourage them Minister, to do so. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout and how Australia's health outcomes compare to other countries? The minister representing the Minister for, for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson, for your question. President, on both health and economic fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. Australians have been rolling up to get vaccinated, and I join everyone in the chamber, I think, in thanking them for doing that, for protecting themselves, protecting their loved ones, and for protecting the country. More than 91 per cent 
of the elig eligible population over 16 are now protected against COVID-19 with the first dose. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has had the second lowest number of COVID-19 cases per capita, the second lowest. The USA and the UK have had more than 40 times the number of COVID deaths compared to Australia. For example, over 12 per cent of people in the US and 11 per cent of people in the UK have had COVID. By contrast, 0.4 per cent of Australians have had COVID. We estimate, President, that our vaccine program has saved more than 30,000 lives. 30, lives. While Australia has been doing it tough, our economy remains resilient. Australia was the first advanced economy to have more, than, more people in work than prior to COVID. Nearly 900,000 jobs have been created since May last year. After last year's recession, Australia's economy, the GDP, recovered to be larger than prior to the pandemic, ahead of any advanced major economy in the world. President. And now, thanks to our high vaccination rates, we can start to safely reopen our borders to the world and Aussies can get back to doing the things they love. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What is the Liberal and Nationals government doing to further protect Australians against COVID-19? Minister. Thank you, President. To provide even greater protection against COVID-19, Australians aged 18 and over who have received two doses of a vaccine at least six months ago are now eligible to have a booster shot. This follows advice from Australia's vaccine experts, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, and approval from Australia's medicines regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. The booster program has commenced its rollout directly to people living in residential aged care and disability homes through in-reach programs. Mr. President. This makes Australia one of the first countries in the world to commence a whole-of-population booster program. With over 151 million Pfizer, Novavax and Moderna vaccines already secured for supply into the future, Australia is well prepared to provide booster doses as approvals are provided by the medical experts. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Minister, as our borders reopen and we welcome international visitors back to Australia as part of our economic recovery, which vaccines will be recognised in this country? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has recognised two additional COVID 19 vaccines for this purpose recently uh, for the purpose of establishing a traveller's vaccination status. This includes Covaxin, manufactured by Bharat Biotech India, and BBIBP Core V, manufactured by Sinopharm in China. Covaxin is recognised for traveller, travellers aged 12 and over, and BBIBP Core V is recognised for those aged 18 to 60. President, this means that many citizens of China and India, as well as other countries where vaccines have been widely used, will be considered fully vaccinated on entry to Australia. And this is especially important as we welcome back international students to our shores. There are now eight COVID-19 vaccines that have been approved, all recognised by the TGA for entry into Australia, and work continues to acknowledge more. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to Minister Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. Minister, in March 2019, the Christchurch mosque attacks were carried out by an Australian far-right extremist, killing 51 innocent Muslims. ASIO is now reporting that up to 50 per cent of its domestic counterterrorism caseload relates to ideologically motivated violent extremism, which is off the back of a sharp rise in far-right extremism. The past weekend, we saw far-right extremists on the streets again, and some have issued death threats towards public figures. Known neo-Nazis and fascists are in attendance at rallies. Some protesters held anti-Semitic and offensive signs. Does the government admit that far-right extremists are spreading their hate, abuse, and threats? And will you and the Prime Minister today outright condemn 
far-right extremism. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question. Um, she uh, she uh, is right that uh, that ASIO has uh, has identified threats from ideologically motivated violent extremism, uh, particularly nationalist and racist violent extremism, is growing uh, and does present uh, a serious threat to Australia's security. Uh, and they've estimated that it comprises around 50% of their priority onshore counterterrorism caseload. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, we uh, unequivocally condemn all such terrorist activity, all such uh, um, motivations that seek to promote any form of violence or threat uh, to, uh, to Australians uh, based upon such ideology. Mr President, Australia's terrorism laws, which our government has, uh, has worked in a bipartisan way, uh, I acknowledge, uh, to strengthen uh, target criminal activity, uh, not ideologies or communities' background, but they target the criminal activities, uh, but have also sought to empower uh, our agencies, in particular ASIO and the Australian Federal Police, to be better placed uh, to be able uh, to respond uh, and to ensure uh, that where uh, such views manifest themselves into potential threats, uh, those agencies are as well placed as possible to be able to respond, disrupt, counter and prevent those threats. Now, I do acknowledge the bipartisanship uh, that we have had in relation to the passage of such legislation and such reforms, because, Mr President, it has required bipartisanship, uh, given the fact that there have often been efforts on the crossbench to weaken some of those legislative measures that we have sought to bring forward. We have backed those tougher uh, legislative reforms, Mr President, with additional funding, uh, additional funding uh, both in terms of measures in relation to social cohesion as well as support for our security agencies to be able to undertake that important work uh, of identification Minister, and disruption. The time for your answer has expired. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. It's pretty disgraceful that this government and the Prime Minister keep refusing to outright condemn far-right extremism. Minister, on 9 December last year, I asked you whether the government— Order. Minister, 9 Mr. President. Minister, on 9 December last year, I asked you whether the government would respond to the Royal Commission into the Christchurch mosque attacks. You gave me the commitment that our government will examine the report thoroughly. Has the government examined the report, and what are you doing about it? Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. And, uh, and as I said in my initial response, uh, I do provide uh, very clear condemnation uh, for extremist uh, ideologically motivated violence. Uh, that is, uh, is very clear in my comments, uh, and I do so for any and all forms of such uh, extremist ideologically motivated um, uh, activities. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, we have not only made the type of legal reforms uh, that I indicated, uh, as well as the type of investments that I indicated in my response to the primary answer, but we have also led internationally uh, in terms of, uh, of seeking to tackle the sharing of such materials, such as the tragedy of the Christchurch attack uh, in online platforms, uh, the Prime Minister's work there and the passage of legislation through this place, but also seeking to ensure uh, that other nations take actions uh, to be able to prevent such, uh, such sharing of such uh, horrific content Minister, in the future Minister, is an important Minister, part of a holistic please resume response. Your, seat. your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, a second supplementary question. Minister, amid the rapid rise in far right extremism, which threatens the safety of communities across the country, will the government now finally commit to funding a national anti racism strategy? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Senator Faruqi, uh, our government did provide uh, $63 million um, in, uh, in the most recent budget uh, towards social cohesion uh, measures to help uh, to bring Australians together. Uh, that included some $37.3 million uh, in relation to measures that help to promote unifying Australian values, identity and social Order. cohesion, and countering malign information online. Now, we do recognise that Order. such disinformation 
poses a very serious threat. $17.7 million was provided to enhance engagement with multicultural communities uh, and $7.9 million towards research initiatives to help the ongoing work in relation to, uh, to these areas. The Department of Home Affairs has had more than 13,900 engagements with key multicultural groups in supporting these efforts, uh, a 519 per cent increase Order. in terms of direct outreach in that regard uh, to make sure Order. that we are able to be able to respond as Minister. comprehensively Minister. as possible. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Order. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In August this year, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, a business under property law has the ability to say, no, you can't come in, and they can ask for that. That's a legitimate thing for them to do. It's got nothing to do with ideology. But last week, he claimed that at 80 per cent, unvaccinated people should be able to get a cup of coffee at a cafe in Brisbane. Why did Mr Morrison change his mind? I'm sorry, Senator Gallagher. I actually missed who you asked the question to because I was calling the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Prime Minister has continued uh, to be clear in, uh, in the other chamber and in comments in, uh, in recent days uh, that he believes that Australian businesses, as he said in that interview on the 25th of August uh, this year, Australian businesses uh, should and do have the right uh, under existing laws uh, to be able to make decisions in relation to the operation of their businesses themselves, uh, that it is a matter for those businesses in terms of how they, uh, how they uh, structure their arrangements in relation to uh, customers and those entering their businesses uh, and requirements around vaccination status. Uh, we've been clear all along it was not the government's intention uh, to change the laws in relation uh, to those arrangements to either uh, uh, motivate or encourage more businesses to apply such, uh, such uh, provisions, uh, nor uh, to do so in a way that would prevent Australian businesses from doing so. We, uh, we provided and published, uh, as the, uh, the Minister for Workplace Relations did uh, through her agencies, uh, the information to Australian businesses uh, that provided them uh, with the choice and the opportunity in terms of how they respond. That's what the Prime Minister said in the, uh, in the interview of the 25th of August that, uh, that Senator Gallagher referenced. That remains the case, and it's what, uh, what he has repeated, I believe, in the House during the course of question time today. Uh, but crucially, Mr President, uh, it is the fact that uh, the vast majority of Australians, more than 85 per cent double-dosed, have done so. And that number continues to keep growing each and every day uh, that ensures uh, we can and should have confidence uh, that we can move through as the nation is the stages of reopening under the national plan uh, taken by the Prime Minister to National Cabinet. Uh, that means uh, steps are taken uh, to reopen progressively uh, from particularly the 80 per cent double vaccination level. That's what we've continued to do. And another important step was taken today in announcing the reopening Minister, of our international borders to, uh, to visa category The holders. time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary yes, question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. Recently, Senator Pauline Hanson declared, and I quote, he has listened to me because that's why he's changed his tune with the whole lot. Is Senator Hanson right to say she changed Mr Morrison's mind? Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I think I just, uh, on the primary question, uh, uh, when it was put to me that there had been some change of position, uh, went through the fact that uh, the Prime Minister's position, the government's position, uh, was consistent and is consistent in relation to the fact that businesses uh, have that choice, and it's the choice of individual business owners. Uh, the Prime Minister listens to people right Order. around the country, uh, listens to people right around the country, including, uh, including those in this place. Uh, he doesn't always agree with the positions put by others, uh, and indeed uh, he was very clear, and I believe Senator Hanson uh, made, it, uh, made it public, that he was very clear that the government would not be supporting the bill that she brought to the parliament uh, this morning. Uh, it was debated, it was voting on, voted on. Uh, the government did not support uh, that bill. Uh, that is what the Prime Minister said to Senator Hanson, what she has confirmed publicly that he had said to her, uh, and uh, that was the position the government applied uh, in this chamber this morning. Senator Gallagher, second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Has Mr Morrison changed his mind, or is he engaging in doublespeak in order to campaign to a small and extreme element of the Australian popul population? 
And when Mr Morrison tries to tell everyone what they want to hear, how can anyone believe a word he says? Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, Mr Morrison has provided exceptional leadership throughout the pandemic from the moment on the 1st of February last year when the decision was made to close our international borders and to start that process, a decision that perhaps more than anything else kept COVID out of this country and provided the time and capacity for Australia to save 30,000 plus lives and to be able to roll out a vaccine program that has now penetrated and reached far greater proportion of Australians than nearly any other country uh, on this planet. A huge accomplishment Order. to see that occur. The Prime Minister led in relation to questions of mandatory vaccination when it came to protecting our most vulnerable, those in the aged care Order. sector. But then the Prime Minister also led in terms of saying we need to be able to reopen. He took a scientifically endorsed plan to National Cabinet, outlining a roadmap to get the states and territories to see that path to reopening and well, as well. It's been leadership to keep Minister, Australians safe, to protect Minister, Australian jobs, but Minister, also to make sure we can successfully and Minister, safely reopen. Time for your answer has expired. Uh, Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The British Medical Journal has published an article revealing the company that conducted part of the phase three trials of Pfizer's community COVID vaccine, covering 25,000 people, falsified data, unblinded patients, employed inadequately trained staff, and was slow to follow up on adverse events. Minister, the Morrison-Joyce government failed to conduct an Australian trial of the Pfizer vaccine and instead simply took Pfizer's word for it. Was this a failure in your duty of care to the Australian people? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator, uh, I can't agree with the statement that you make as a question, <laughs> Senator Roberts, at all through you, through you President. Uh, the Australian government took, uh, undertook a comprehensive assessment of each and every vaccine that is being used in this country to ensure Australians had the confidence that we had a safe and efficacious vaccine for utilisation in the pandemic. Uh, and, Mr President, I think the results speak for themselves. If you look at the circumstances in respect of what's occurred in aged care this year compared to last year, the impact is provoked. Profound. Mr. President, it is very clear that we took all steps to ensure that the vaccines that are being used in this country were safe and that they worked. Uh, we, we took evidence and advice, yes, from the companies. We received the data that they used in their trials appropriately. But we also had the advantage of being able to use data from other jurisdictions around the world. And we've remained in close contact with those agencies that consider vaccines to ensure that they are safe to use, Mr. President. Can I say to all Australians who are still contemplating whether or not they should get a vaccine, please be assured that our public health system and our authorities, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, recognised as one of the best in the world has done the, 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 um, yes, Senator Reynolds, amazing work to ensure that we have access, Australians have access, anyone living in this country who wants a vaccine has access to a safe and efficacious vaccine. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. Prior to the TGA's approval of community vaccine, Steve Anderson, the director of the US Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, released data detailing potential community adverse outcomes, including Guillain-Barre syndrome, acute myocarditis, autoimmune disease, and death. This is exactly what's happened. In approving Pfizer's community injections, did the TGA fail in its duty of care to the Australian people? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. No, it did not. I couldn't be any firmer than that. And as I indicated in my answer to the primary question, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has considered 
all data in relation to the vaccine. And in fact, it continues to monitor the data in relation to the vaccines. Uh, we've, we've been extremely open with respect to that. We've published uh, reporting on the outcomes of the vaccination program here in Australia. We've published data in relation to adverse reactions uh, to the vaccines of all types, Mr. President. So I reject any assertion that the TGA has failed in its duty at all. No, it has not. I could not be any firmer, President. Uh, we have one of the best, and we should be proud of the fact that we have one of the best um, therapeutic goods as assessment uh, Minister, organisations Minister, in the world, uh, and we have safe vaccines for expired. Australians. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary question. Thank you. Latest data from America's CDC indicates that children aged 12 to 17 are likely to experience myocarditis and related conditions at the rate of 9.5 cases per million vaccinations. Yet after the second vaccination, that rate rises sevenfold from 9.5 to 66.7. In approving two doses of Pfizer community for our children without testing, other Minister for Health, Greg Hunt and Professor Skerritt at the TGA risking our children's lives, health and future? Minister. The very simple answer to that question, President, is no. Uh, as I've said in my previous answer, uh, the TGA continues to monitor all of the data, not just from Australia but from around the world, in relation to the uh, impact and the utilisation of the vaccines, particularly those that we have uh, to be administered here in Australia. We continue to monitor uh, all of the data so that we have the most up-to-date up -to -date information and that we can continue to assure Australians that the vaccines that they are taking are both safe and efficacious. And all of the data and the advice continues to demonstrate that, Mr President. Are there uh, contraindications in relation to the vaccines? Yes, they are. We publish the data so that we're open with that. But we need to make sure that Australians have confidence Minister, that the vaccines Minister, we have access to are safe time, and efficacious. The answer has expired. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government funding for skills and training is securing our economic recovery from COVID uh, by helping Australians to take up a trade, reskill or pick up new skills? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for the question. And Mr President, in the last two years, the Morrison government has made an unprecedented investment in skills and training. And we've done this in particular to secure the pipeline of skilled workers that Australia needs. In fact, the Morrison government has delivered the highest number of Australians in trade apprentices on record. What we now have is new department program data, which demonstrates that Australian in training trade apprentices reached 217,400 in July 2021. That, Mr President, is the highest number since records began in 1963, 217,400 in July 2021, the highest on record since they began actually collecting the data in 1963. And, Mr President, evidencing the positive impacts of the investment being made by the Morrison government's record funding of skills and training is now the number of Australians undertaking skills and training. It has actually now surged with total in-training apprenticeships and traineeships for June 2021 at 347,266. And this is up from 268,435 in June 2020. And again, this is a direct result of the policies that the government has implemented, understanding we needed to make the investments to secure that necessary pipeline of skilled workers. And Mr President, 
What we've done is we have supported tradies across the board, whether it's tax cuts, whether it's through full expensing measures, uh, which has now seen order books for tools, machinery, etc., fill up across the country. We are supporting our skilled workforce, and the numbers that we now have Minister, are proof of that. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. With these strong numbers, how has the government continued to boost funding to vocational education and training to secure the pipeline of skilled workers? Minister. Thank you very much. And Mr President, we have now seen over $8.5 billion in vocational education and training investment. That is what the Morrison government has done since the commencement of the pandemic. In 2020-2021, we invested over $5.1 billion in skills and training. And what we did there was we helped Australian businesses retain their apprentices, and then if they could take that one step further and take on an additional apprentice. For this financial year, we've boosted that investment again with a record $6.4 billion in vocational education and training investment. This two years of investment it also includes around $3.9 billion for the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Wage Subsidy. And that was, in course, in recognition of the fact that businesses did need assistance to take on an additional apprentice, and we would provide them with the necessary support to do that. And of course, we've now gone Minister, further and expanded that program. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, a second supplementary. How will a skilled workforce support Australian jobs and businesses as part of our economic recovery and reopening from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. Well, Mr President, the government understands that investing and upskilling our workforce is a win-win for all Australians. It is certainly a win for Australian workers, and we've seen that with the numbers uh, that are now actually undertaking a trade, undertaking an apprenticeship, etc. Uh, they have this great opportunity for career progression, but also as you progress through your career, of course, you have higher earning potential. It's also a win, though, as we know, for Australian businesses, because with the numbers that we are seeing, they now know they will have access to a skilled workforce, a skilled Australian workforce, in fact, to enable them to actually invest in their business, to grow their business um, and to create even further jobs for Australians. But it's also, as we know, it is a win for the Australian economy by ensuring that, with the numbers that we are seeing, we are more globally competitive. And in fact, the incredible number of apprentices in a trade now show that we've made the right decision as a government in backing Australian businesses to take on even more apprentices. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did, the, why did Mr. Morrison, when posting video of his media conference to Facebook, delete? delete any criticism of the violent protesters in Melbourne and only include those sections in which he criticised vaccine mandates. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, um, I uh, am pretty confident that Mr Morrison doesn't sit there and post the video content himself. I'm not aware of the edited versions Order. or what content Order. Senator Wong in particular refers to from which post. Uh, I am certainly aware that Mr Morrison's clear condemnation uh, in relation to uh, violent activities, uh, extremist activities that provoke, promote uh, or provoke violence in any form uh, has been clear, resolute and repeated time and time again, despite the fact that those opposite uh, try to paint some picture otherwise. Uh, we have been very clear, very clear in relation uh, to uh, the condemnation uh, of uh, such violence. Uh, and as the Prime Minister has said from the very first day uh, when he became Prime Minister, uh, that his aspiration is to see uh, policies pursued that bring Australians together, uh, that Order. support the best, the best ability. Those opposite those opposite want to provoke these debates, I know. Uh, they, uh, they, of course, uh, want, to line up, want to line up the different state Labor premiers to go out and, uh, and in their coordinated attacks, mount their attacks. Uh, obviously, they don't think their own lead is very good at making those attacks. They have to rely on others uh, to make uh, those attacks on the Prime Minister. Uh, but 
uh, Mr. President, this insinuation somehow uh, that the Prime Minister has not made those statements condemning, condemning violence uh, or, the, uh, or the attempt to provoke violence uh, is frankly false. The Prime Minister has been clear on that time and time again. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. This morning on radio, this minister twice refused to condemn without qualification violent protesters and violent rhetoric. Will he now do so? Will he now condemn them without qualification? And if so, will the Prime Minister follow his lead? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, perhaps that goes to the tone of all the questions we've seen today. That, of course, you know, the ability of the Labor Party to want to take any type of comment out of context, any type of remark, and twist it so they choose. I was crystal clear in my condemnation on radio this morning. I know precisely what I said, even if I haven't had the time uh, that they pretend to have had to twist or contort or selectively edit Order the Prime Minister's statements and what they choose to go from. I know that I was crystal clear in my condemnation and that I made sure and that I made sure Mr President as I have in previous public remarks and iterations uh, that I indeed uh, condemned those who have shown violent signs those who have sought to promote uh, or provoke violence now Mr President those opposites seem to think that there should be no acknowledgement no acknowledgement that there might be some Australians who are not undertaking such violent actions, but who do hold concerns. Well, we're not going to be deaf to Minister, all Australians. Minister, that is not Minister, the approach our government will take. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, a second supplementary question. Why are Mr Morrison and this minister pretending to have condemned the violent protesters when instead Mr Morrison is engaging in doublespeak in order to campaign to a small and extreme element of the Australian population. Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, why, why does the Labor Party always seek to divide? Why does the Labor Party always seek to pursue, to pursue arguments based on selective quotes, contorting different statements that others have made? Why does this Labor Party uh, always seek to make sure they personalise the argument, as they do against Mr Morrison time and time and time again. Why is this Labor Party so grubby in all of their tactics that they deploy? I mean, last week it was revealed that they are paying, they are paying people to put content on TikTok personally attacking the Prime Minister. That's what this Labor Party is up to. They're using the Chinese-owned website TikTok to be able to go after the Prime Minister in the most personal way they can. Why, of course, are they doing all of this? Because Order. they're not willing to talk about their own policies. That's what was clear when Mr Chalmers yesterday refused to rule out tax hikes, refused to say where they might be spending any money, refused to detail Minister. their policies because they're Minister. just about a vicious personal smear Minister, campaign. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister advise the Senate on the recent strengthening of Australia's ties with our ASEAN partners? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, uh, and I thank Senator Fawcett for his question. The uh, Australian government has been very strong in our support of an Indo-Pacific region that is stable and secure and prosperous, and, we, and in which all states, large and small, are sovereign and resilient. And ASEAN is at the heart of this vision, and Australia's relationship with ASEAN is fundamental to promoting it. On the 27th of October, we took a significant step forward in that relationship. As part of the first annual ASEAN Australia Summit, ASEAN leaders agreed to Australia's proposal to enhance relations to a comprehensive strategic partnership. This is a decision which reflects the strength of our ties as neighbours. Australia is ASEAN's first dialogue partner, and this is the first time that ASEAN's leaders had agreed to establish a comprehensive strategic partnership. And enhancing our relationship to a CSP positions that partnership for the future and to help us address complex and emerging regional challenges together. This is all about substance and deeper cooperation between ASEAN and Australia. During my recent visit to Southeast Asia, I also met again with ASEAN ambassadors and the ASEAN Secretary General in Jakarta and had productive discussions on the implementation of the CSP. 
To support that cooperation, Australia will invest over $150 million into our cooperation with ASEAN, including a new Australia for ASEAN Futures initiative, projects that address complex challenges, including health security, terrorism and, and transnational crime, energy security, promoting the circular economy and healthy oceans. Also, additional Australia for ASEAN scholarships to support those emerging leaders uh, engaging here in Australia, and an Australia for ASEAN Digital Transformation and Futures Skills Initiative that includes VET scholarships. These are measures which build on the $500 million investment in Southeast Asia's recovery that we announced last year in the context of COVID-19 and our very strong bilateral partnerships across the Indo-Pacific region. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Could you update the Senate on Australia's diplomatic engagement with Southeast Asia and how we're working with them to address shared challenges such as maintaining an open and secure Indo-Pacific region and particularly the crisis in Myanmar? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, and I thank Senator Fawcett uh, for his uh, important supplementary question. As I said, uh, earlier this month, I visited uh, a number of Southeast Asian countries, including Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam and, in and Indonesia, to meet with counterparts to further advance our relationships, including our cooperation on the region's important COVID-19 recovery. The range of issues that we covered demonstrated uh, the depth and the breadth of these partnerships. They included the strategic environment, including the situation in Myanmar, cyber, counterterrorism, mental health, maritime security, uh, transitions to uh, low emissions technologies, uh, trade and investment relationships, and women, peace and security. This was an opportunity to deepen our practical cooperation with Malaysia, to welcome Cambodia's role as ASEAN Chair in 2022, to progress the Australia-Vietnam Enhanced Economic Engagement Strategy, and to reaffirm our strong links and commitment to a COVID vaccine partnership with Indonesia. Minister, you... Minister, your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, a second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Could you advise the Senate of Australia's continuing efforts to partner with our region uh, on the COVID-19 recovery? Uh, I thank Senator Fawcett again for uh, his uh, supplementary question. Australia has made a commitment to share 60 million COVID-19 vaccines with our Indo-Pacific partners by the end of 2022. That includes 20 million vaccines for Indonesia and 7.8 million for Vietnam. We have also committed $300 million in vaccine support to Southeast Asia and a further $100 million to the Quad Vaccines Partnership. Already, we have shared more than 6.2 million doses with ASEAN countries. That includes 4.6 million doses to Indonesia and 1.5 million doses to Vietnam. We've also partnered with Indonesia to provide emergency COVID assistance, including oxygen-related and other medical supplies, support for Indonesia's health response and community resilience through our work with NGOs, with UN agencies, community organisations and provincial governments. We'll continue to partner with Southeast Asia as we stand together to strengthen our region's health security through the recovery and beyond. Thank you, Minister. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In August, Mr Morrison said businesses had a legitimate right to refuse entry to people who refused to be vaccinated, stating, and I quote, the sheer fact of it is, if you're not vaccinated, you represent a greater public health risk to yourself, to your family, to your community and to others about you. So it's only sensible that people will do sensible things to protect their public health. Last week, Mr Morrison declared unvaccinated people should be able to get a cup of coffee in Brisbane, regardless of vaccination status. Why should people in Brisbane be able to get a coffee regardless of vaccination status, but not people in Sydney. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And Mr President, I, I thank Senator for her question and, uh, and indeed acknowledge the interview that, uh, that she was referring to. I think it's important uh, that it's understood uh, if you go up the page in that transcript in that interview uh, that the Prime Minister was asked whether he had an appetite for mandatory vaccinations and the answer he gave uh, in that interview was no. 
Uh, he did not have an appetite uh, for mandatory vaccinations. Now, of course, Mr. President, I qualify that with the statements I've already made in question time. Uh, that, uh, that the government uh, did indeed lead in relation to mandatory vaccinations uh, to protect those most at risk uh, from COVID-19, to protect uh, those uh, in aged care facilities, to protect those uh, where they are engaging with disability care workers, to protect those in our health systems generally who are at greatest risk and to, uh, to ensure that we supported mandatory activities in that regard. Uh, Mr President, uh, in relation to businesses, as I've already touched on in, the, in this question time, uh, the government has also been consistent uh, that the legal advice from the pre-existing legal arrangements is that Australian businesses, be they a coffee shop, be they any other business, uh, have the power and the choice themselves uh, to make rules and decisions about accessing their business, including to determine as to whether or not uh, vaccinated individuals uh, can only be the only ones to uh, access those, visitors, those businesses as customers. Uh, they're the laws of the land that we have supported. Uh, we've not sought uh, to change them in ways to force businesses uh, to make greater mandates, nor have we sought to remove the choice from businesses in relation to their choice to make those decisions themselves, regardless of which state they are in. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, can the minister confirm whether Mr Morrison has ever required journalists attending his press conferences to be fully vaccinated? And is this a current requirement? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. Morrison has, uh, has complied uh, at different times with, uh, with health requirements uh, put in place or requested by authorities, uh, be, they the recommendations of, be they the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Australia or when he has been in New South Wales, uh, restrictions in place at particular points in time in New South Wales or restrictions put in place here when, in, uh, when he's been in the ACT. Uh, oftentimes, those restrictions have had to be particularly targeted to deal with the Prime Minister returning from necessary overseas work uh, and in engaging in that necessary overseas work uh, for him to then meet requirements of quarantining and isolating upon return, uh, but also to be available to be able to handle um, the duties of the office of Prime Minister, be they the way in which he's engaged in Cabinet or other deliberations or with the Australian media. Uh, where it's been a condition that health authorities have suggested uh, that, uh, that uh, vaccination status be a factor in relation to those isolation periods, Minister, the Prime Minister has Minister, complied with that. Minister, your time has expired. Senator McAllister, a second supplementary. Thanks, Mr President. Why does Mr Morrison want journalists attending his press conferences to be fully vaccinated? but thinks a barista in Queensland shouldn't have the same protections from COVID-19 that he demands for himself as Prime Minister. Minister. Thanks, thanks Mr President. Well, could you, imagine, could you imagine what those opposite would have said if the Prime Minister, whilst isolating at the lodge on return from international business, had been advised by ACT health authorities or the chief medical officer that anyone attending a press conference needed to be vaccinated if the Prime Minister has said no, Minister, no, they're not going to be if Minister, he had denied that health advice. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. The question doesn't go to a hypothetical about the opposition. It goes to the Prime Minister's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and consistent falsehoods. Senator Wong, I'm listening closely to the minister's answer. Minister, you have the call. And Mr President, I, I paint that scenario because those opposite would be the first to condemn if the Prime Minister was not following health advice and health recommendations at the time. What he has done, what our government has done, is listen to and act on the health advice of our Commonwealth health officials at every step of the way. And that has included, Mr President, in relation to questions around mandates and vaccinations as they apply. We have been very clear in the sense that we have acted where the health officials have recommended to apply those mandates to those most vulnerable. But the National Plan also makes clear that we should go through the stages with these high levels of Minister, vaccination to reopen and to Minister, reopen thoroughly. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am uh, seeking the call uh, pursuant to Standing Order 74.5 Alpha, seeking an explanation from uh, the minister representing the Prime Minister as to why 
my question 3985 relating to the costs of national cabinet have not been uh, has not been answered within uh, the required time frame indeed this question uh, has been on the notice paper since august oh minister thanks um, uh, thanks uh, mr president mr president i understand that uh, that answers will be provided uh, as soon as uh, as soon as they can be made available uh, that uh, finalization of those is uh, is um, uh, being undertaken, uh, and I hope that they can be brought to the chamber um, uh, and will be brought to the chamber as soon as that is possible. Uh, Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam, uh, acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to uh, take note of the, mem of the uh, minister's answer to this question. Well, again, we find ourselves in a situation where uh, we, we're not getting answers back from the executive in response to questions, questions that are relevant to our uh, constituents. In this particular case, uh, what I was uh, seeking by, the, by, uh, by way of uh, question number uh, uh, 3985 was an answer from the Prime Minister as to how much money was spent by the Commonwealth defending uh, their erroneous claim that National Cabinet was in fact a committee of the Cabinet. I would have thought that would be a relatively simple answer to get, just to go and have a look inside the, the uh, the uh, accounting system to find out how much the, uh, the Australian government solicitor had been invoiced. But no, we still don't have an answer. In fact, there's a second part to the question. It relates to a matter that was brought against the Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, over the censoring by uh, the former Attorney General Christian Porter uh, as to a, an Auditor General's report. That matter concluded more than 12 months ago. So I'm asking the government, can you please provide cost information in relation to, uh, in relation to the, uh, the, uh, a matter that settled more than a year ago? No answer. Uh, somewhat un inexcusable. So it's with regret that I have to stand uh, and ask to take note uh, of the Prime Minister's failure to provide uh, the, the answer to these questions. Um, as senators will be aware, this, the matter uh, of National Cabinet involved a comprehensive defeat for the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, especially for its secretary, Mr Philip Gaitchens, and the head of the Cabinet Division, Ms Le Leonie McGregor, who were, act, uh, who were acting as the Prime Minister's agent in this matter. In his decision on 5 August 2021, Federal Court Justice White determined that under the Australian uh, law National Cabinet is not a committee of the Federal Cabinet, uh, and the documents that I sought were not subject to any blanket exemption under the FOI Act. In his decision, Mr. White, no, sorry, Justice White, um, was absolutely scathing, absolutely scathing of Mr. Gaitchens and Ms. McGregor, finding that their evidence was wrong in fact and in argument. Among other things, he observed their evidence tended to be generalised and conclusionary in form, I'm quoting from, from the judgment. In some respects, the evidence of each was inconsistent with documentary evidence and seemed to assume the truth of the matter to be decided by the true tribunal, i.e. whether or not National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet. And in some respects, both the respondents, Mr Gaitchens and Ms McGregor, expressed opinions about the effect of the disclosure of the minutes on a view of their uh, content, which is not borne out by an examination of the documents. I do not accept all their evidence. His Honour's decision was widely applauded by eminent legal authorities for its comprehensiveness and its definitive reasoning. Yet, in what is an absolute defiance of a judicial decision-making, the Prime Minister has refused to accept the independent umpire's ruling. Rather than appeal Justice White's decision to the full federal court, the government instead introduced the COAG Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, with the object of, of, of imposing a blanket prohibition on the FOI release of any cabinet records. Now that bill we know is going nowhere fast. It's worth noting that some, but it's still worth noting some of the evidence that was presented to the Senate Finance and Public Administration Committee inquiry that considered its provisions. This bill is quite without friends. 
Apart from the submission of the Prime Minister's own department, all submissions uh, opposed or were highly critical. That included submissions and evidence given by eminent legal and constitutional authorities. Professor Anne Twomey condemned the legislation in emphatic terms, accusing the government of trying to legislate things that simply were not true. She said, It's just a mess, and it shows disrespect for the people, for the courts, everyone to go around asserting in legislation things that aren't true. It's frankly bizarre legislation. I mean, why would you assert something that's not true? Why would you say in legislation that a cat is a dog or vice versa? The Australian Human Rights uh, Commission president, em um, uh, Emeritus uh, Professor Ro um, Rosalind uh, Croucher, expressed concern that the bill will increase secrecy from 15, across 15 different acts, with the changes to the FOI Act being of particular concern. Professor Croucher rightly told the committee Australians should be able to seek information about the nature of the decisions made by their representatives. This is even more important in times of emergency, when governments are provided with extraordinary powers then it uh, can affect the lives and rights of Australians in significant way, ways. Um, Professor Croucher warned that the proposed changes would involve a permanent change to confidentiality rules over public policy. And that, and I quote, it's important that emergency situations do not become a broad justification for unnecessary increases in executive power to the detriment of democracy. Mr. Geoffrey Watson SC, a highly distinguished barrister who represented me in the AAT, bluntly warned that transparency would be crushed by this legislation. None of the uh, submissions uh, of these uh, distinguished authorities and uh, persons uh, gave favour to the bill that was introduced. Now, significantly, Mr Gaitchen's declined to appear before the committee. The three official uh, senators placed, Ms Leonie McGregor, First Assistant Secretary of Cabinet Division, uh, uh, Ms Lee Steele, First Assistant Secretary Intergovernmental Relations and Reform, and Mr John Reid, First Assistant Secretary of Government Division, gave a performance utterly unworthy of a Commonwealth Department that sits at the very centre of Australian government. Institutional decline and politicisation of the top ranks of the public service were all too evident in their evasive and unsatisfactory evidence. And where are we today? Well, with the government's bill stalled in the Senate, the uh, uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet are still refusing to issue documents under FOI in defiance of Federal Court Justice White, uh, Richard White's decision. Now, in response to a further application that I made for, for access to, to documents, P, a PMC officer in charge of National Cabinet Affairs, Acting Assistant uh, Secretary Angie McKenzie, has informed me that despite Justice White's ruling, the department remains of the view that, and I quote, National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act, and therefore National Cabinet documents are exempt from disclosure under Section 34 of the FOI Act. Just so it's all very clear, the Prime Minister is absolutely obsessed, uh, obsessed with secrecy. Justice White made it very, very clear in his, uh, in his ruling that the National Cabinet is not a committee of the Cabinet, that that cannot be taken to be the statutory meaning. And here we have a judge, a judge of the federal court, making it very clear that it doesn't fit within the statutory meaning. And yet we have an official, Miss Angie McKenzie, clearly uh, politicised, a member of the public service, clearly politicised saying, sorry, Justice White's wrong. Justice White is not correct on a statutory interpretation. Let me tell you the way in which a Prime Minister can influence the statutory interpretation, uh, statutory interpretation. The only way they can do that is when they frame up a bill to bring to this parliament. And maybe during a second reading speech they can give some uh, measure of what the meaning might, might actually be in respect of 
uh, an expression in a bill. You can't get to the point where the, where the FOI Act, which has been in place since 1982, um, uh, where, where a judgment is made that doesn't favour what the Prime Minister, Prime Minister thinks, and suddenly he just says, no, I'm, I'm going to make up my own statutory meanings, despite a justice of the federal court suggesting that, that, was, that, that it's clearly incorrect. That's what we've got happening here. That's what we've got uh, happening in, in, uh, in this place. They've introduced, in response to the AAT matter, and again, my question goes to how much money was spent trying to defend this. Utterly de defeated, but nonetheless, we're entitled to know what the cost was. No answer to that question. And it's important because now what's going to happen is the FOI that I've recently uh, made, that I've got this bogus decision uh, come back from clearly incompetent public servants. And I don't stand up here and have a go at public servants uh, without considerable uh, uh, um, uh, thought before I do so. But I think it's fair when, when a public servant uh, seeks to suggest that they can overturn a judge's view on what a word means in the statutes. That's the point at which you say something's really broken on that side. We look at all the things that have been happening with the Prime Minister, saying blind trusts are OK. We're not going to refer that to the House Committee of Privileges because it seems to be OK. I'm going to tell uh, a story that is, uh, that is different to the, to, to the words of uh, or, uh, you know, to how a French Prime Minister uh, president might have heard th those words. It comes out saying at the start of the submarine announcement, that uh, this is not about non-performance, gets a bit of pressure on him from the, uh, the French president. He says, well, OK, you weren't doing your, uh, your job well enough. Changing his tune, almost thinking as though he's, he lives in this 20-minute uh, world where he, he can say what he likes and, and, and then all of the evidence disappears. But we've got a situation here with this particular matter where we've gone through a court process. We don't know what the, what, the, the, what the updated costs are because I'm not getting answers from, uh, from uh, the Prime Minister into, into what is a reasonable question about cost. Um, we, we're going to see a situation, because I've gone back, I've now, I've now gone back to the Information Commissioner for the second time round and said, this is wrong, except this time I don't want it referred to the AIT. I want it referred to the federal court. And who knows? Who knows who might get the docket list uh, for, for my case? It might end up being Justice White remaking his own decision, and we'll see whether or not the Prime Minister ignores that. I mean, to suggest, to suggest that just because this matter was heard in the AAT, that it doesn't have a, a binding force upon the government. Now, this matter was uh, shifted to the Information Commissioner. The Information Commissioner made a determination that it ought to be handled by the AAT in the interest of, um, of uh, execution of the FOI Act, gets to the AAT. Everyone recognised the significance of it. The AAT said this is a matter that does need to go to a deputy president. We want a judicial member to sit on this and hear this particular matter. The Commonwealth Goes, goes from a position of, no, no, there's nothing to see here, to suddenly appointing a QC to look after the matter. So we have QCs, SCs, ju uh, a judicial uh, officer presiding to come to a determination, a very solid determination, that National Cabinet is not a uh, committee of Cabinet. And the Prime Minister does not accept that. The Prime Minister does not accept that. How much was wasted? How much was wasted in that? You might as well have just ignored the whole FOI process and just refused to give me anything. You've put the taxpayers to great expense to hear what the independent umpire says, and you say, "I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, uh, listen to what, he, what Justice White said." That's where you're at, and yet. You won't tell me how much that cost. That's the, that's the burden of the question that I've asked. 
I think the Australian public are entitled to know that, Senator Birmingham. You represent the Prime Minister in this chamber, so you need to scurry away and go and knock on his door and get the answer for me. There's another answer to another question that has not been ans uh, answered as well, uh, also to do with National Cabinet. And tomorrow I'll be seeking an explanation as to why that one hasn't been answered. So you might want to think about going for a bit of a walk after, uh, after your uh, duty has finished here in the chamber, Minister, so that uh, you can get these answers. The Australian public is entitled to know. We ask these questions expecting timely responses, and we're entitled to them. We don't, we don't ask these questions for ourselves, we ask them on behalf of our constituents. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any notices to take? Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers provided to all questions asked by Labor Senators today. Um, colleagues, as um, as you saw in question time, uh, we did concentrate our questions on the role of the Prime Minister over the past week uh, in, and his changing positions, it seems, on um, the use of um, vaccine mandates, uh, the roles of the states in terms of the, opening, the national reopening plan and his uh, failure of leadership in denouncing and condemning some of the encroachment of violence into national political debates that we saw through some of the so-called freedom rally rallies in the past um, few months, but in most particularly in the last uh, two weeks or so, where they have es escalated dramatically. And I think last week was a new low for this government, and it is it's, uh, almost difficult to say that. We've got a government the last eight years racked with rorts, scandals, waste, mismanagement. But I think last week, when there was an opportunity for the Prime Minister to show leadership at a time, and there are moments in time when national political debates or national debates on policy are, are being um, discussed, for leaders to stand up and speak on behalf of the country and on, in the national interest. And what we saw last week, and I know those opposite would like to dress this up as something that it's not, but we all saw it. Uh, we saw the Prime Minister give a very short address on the matters of um, violence and protest. Didn't, he said he didn't like it and he didn't want to see it and it wasn't part of our, the way we conducted our, our debates. But then he went on to give a much, much longer presentation trying to emotionally connect with those elements who were threatening violence against, um, in this case, politicians, but in other cases it could be other individuals. And he went on to speak of their frustration, how he understood how they were feeling um, as a way of empathising and sympathising with how they were conducting um, themselves by nooses, by threats to kill. Uh, this is what we saw last week, and I know those opposite would like to pretend it didn't happen, but we all saw it because we listened to the Prime Minister and the message that got sent around the country from the Prime Minister into people's TVs, into their news streams, however they access it, was, yes, I don't like this, but I get how you're feeling. And there are moments when leaders have to stand up and unite the country, and I completely reject the assertion argued by the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, that this is a Prime Minister that tries to unite the country. This is absolutely untrue. At every juncture we see this Prime Minister picking fights, whether it be state premiers, who he, ha he loves to pick a fight with, um, Premier Andrews, his personal favourite I think is Premier, Premier Palaszczuk in Queensland, who he likes to attack fairly regularly. I hope it's not because she's the only female premier left, uh, but it, you, do, you, you are left to wonder. 
But this is a man that seeks to pick fights. He seeks to divide, he seeks to tap in, he seeks to play across the field. It suits him to do this. He has worked out it is a calculated political strategy for him to enter the debate the way he did it last week. Don't for a minute think he was thinking on his feet. Absolutely not true. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was saying. And it's dangerous because while it might be good and in his political interest to do it now, what we know from some of these movements is that they are very hard to control once they are off and running. And when you have a prime minister that says, you know what, guys, I get how you're feeling. I know you're frustrated. And all these mean governments that are trying to curtail your freedom, they need to get out of your lives. I get that. That isn't standing up as a prime minister should. That isn't acting in the national interest. That is stoking division. It is cozying up to violent extremists who want to divide the country. That's exactly what this Prime Minister is doing, and we will call it out because it is wrong. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator MacDonald. Uh, I rise to take note of the questions asked by Labor senators uh, during this question time. And it is instructive, instructive to notice that, once again, uh, Labor and the opposition are so completely disconnected from the people of this nation, from the reality of what is happening, uh, particularly in regional parts of the country, uh, but also the cities. And to have this uh, incredulous uh, line of questioning about uh, what the Prime Minister's stance is uh, just seems to me to smack of, of somebody who has not been watching what's going on over the last 18 months. Uh, the Prime Minister had established a, a national cabinet to allow the premiers of the states of our federation, federated nations to come together and to provide the sort of leadership uh, and direction that this nation so sorely was crying out for at the beginning of this pandemic. And it was the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of this federal government that pulled together, that quickly came to the fore with uh, financial support through JobKeeper and JobSeeker, a range of incentives to allow people to feel confident that there would be food on the table, that they could pay the rent during this time of extraordinary uncertainty. And yet, it was the state governments that would each time walk away from the uh, national cabinet process, uh, having agreed amongst themselves what the next step would be, and then doing whatever it was that they darn well liked. And for that reason, the Prime Minister has been doing what Australians have been asking him to do, to stand up and call out the inconsistencies, the inconsistencies in the uh, requirements of the state uh, governments. I, I have a list here of the different uh, sorts of vaccine mandates across Australia. So this is not Europe. This is not a, 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 a continent divided by different governments and, and uh, organisations. This is our own nation where to cross borders is so complicated that those of us who have staff to assist spend all their time updating uh, people in our uh, electorates and states about how it is just to simply see family and move around the country. And in Queensland, my state, in just a couple of weeks, that Labor government will ensure that there is businesses that close that there is young people who won't be working, that there will be uh, Indigenous Australians who have been left behind by the extraordinary lack of support for the vaccination process in Queensland. I mean, do you, we all remember the chief health officer saying that she wouldn't have anybody vaccinated with AstraZeneca uh, and the politics that was played in that state because uh, it, it, suited, it suited the Labor states to play politics with these vaccination measures. And so now we're in a situation where Labor has once again walked away from workers, walked away from Indigenous communities and left them vulnerable and exposed. We have ambulance ramping and hospital ramping in our state that sends my blood cold. 
because when uh, COVID-19 comes into our state, as it will, as we know it has across the rest of the world, uh, we will be in a dev very difficult situation when we have hospitals that can't cope with the most basic of health requirements at a time when uh, flu illnesses are down, when uh, illnesses that are spread uh, by transmission are reduced because of the restrictions that we have in place. And Queensland is incredibly vulnerable, thanks to the game playing and the politics that Labor continues with. So thank God, I say, to have a Prime Minister who's willing to stand up and support Australians, to call out some of the crazy restrictions and measures that state governments are putting in place, and to say to Australians, I hear you. I hear you. And when premiers say we will reward you for your good behaviour, I say, how dare they? How dare they talk about rewarding a Queensland businesses for the, the hard work they have had? Where is the, the uh, acknowledgement of the terrible impacts on small business, on mental health? So I say thank goodness for the Prime Minister standing thank up you, for Senator Australians. McDonald, your time has expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. Madam uh, Deputy President, well, I'm not really sure what to make of that contribution. It, it was um, completely mystifying to me. I mean, the um, Senator Macdonald uh, indicated she didn't understand why these questions were be being posed today in question time. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let her know why, because they're important questions. They are extremely important in terms of what is happening in this country and what our Prime Minister is saying to Australians. It is important, as Senator Gallagher said in her contribution, you cannot let extremists get a foothold. You cannot allow them to think that they are being supported in any way in their extreme views. And that is what the Prime Minister attempted to do in his contribution. The, the government, to take a, um, a well-known phrase used by former Senator Doug Cameron, is in is a rabble, a complete rabble. Today, you had not one, but five government senators crossing the floor to vote against the prime minister. Now we know that Mr. Morrison got a good talking to from Senator Hanson last week, and you know his position has become a little more vague since then. But we know in the past the Prime Minister has expressed a view in support of vaccine mandates being enforced on people by businesses and governments in order to undertake certain activities, including work. Indeed, he expressly stated on radio station 2GB in August of this year that businesses have a legitimate right to refuse entry to someone who had refused to get vaccinated. Of course, fast forward a few months and the Prime Minister is being now threatened by One Nation and his own backbenchers to change his view on vaccines or have his legislative agenda held hostage in this place. Whether it be Senator Antic or Rennick or indeed Senator Hanson or Roberts, or in, in fact the angry and violent protests with gallows on the streets of Melbourne. The Prime Minister has buckled and bent to extreme elements, seeking to undermine the nation's economic recovery. Because, make no mistake, that is exactly what will occur if we do not promote the inherent importance of opening up and staying open by way of a vaccinated population in a vaccinated economy, with enforceable rules to underwrite it. And yet, when asked to condemn 
violent behaviour, the Prime Minister has chosen to express sympathy with the sentiments of those participating in anti-vaccination demonstrations. Dog whistling, pure and simple, deliberate, all designed to cosy up with the far right as part of a cynical strategy that is all about saving his own bacon and not about what is in the interests of Australians. It's a Prime Minister prepared to enact the agenda of One Nation and Senator Hanson. Because without the likes of Senator Hanson, the Prime Minister's agenda, whatever it it is would increasingly be stuck in the mud. A Prime Minister prepared to do dub grubby deals to get, the, to get their support, but not prepared to honour his own commitments to the electorate. This is the same Prime Minister who has repeatedly promised to bring forward a bill to, es to establish a national anti-corruption commission and has failed to do so. Now, here we are. On the eve of an election, no bill to tackle corruption at a federal level, despite the very desperate need for such a body on full display for all to see from the myriad of scandals littering the, go the government's rap sheet. But given an opportunity, the Prime Minister Thank has you, failed Brown. to do Your so. Time has expired. Senator Small. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And it might come as a galloping shock to those who sit opposite and come here to say that somehow the Prime Minister's agenda is being held hostage in this chamber, but I guess the contrast couldn't be more stark from a team that has no agenda whatsoever. We've heard today claims that the Prime Minister has a vague position or a, a somehow an unclear position, and again the contrast with the Leader of the Opposition who likes to have an each-way bet on every issue before this parliament couldn't be starker. But what we have is a government led by a Prime Minister committed to delivering for Australians, the same Australians that sent us here last election, to deliver for them and to keep government from intruding into their homes, into their lives and into their businesses uh, to the extent that those opposite would have us do. So the Commonwealth's position is abundantly clear, and it has been since before COVID-19 was even a thing. The Commonwealth's position is that vaccine, on the whole, should be voluntary and free, strongly encouraged and only mandatory in a high-risk setting. Mandatory vaccination of workers is appropriate and is proportionate for those workers in specified high-risk settings such as residential aged care or disability care because of the impact on the most vulnerable of Australians. And that's why, leading the charge, the federal government did take that initiative. Some states and territories, uh, particularly, it has to be remarked, those led by Labor premiers, have issued far-ranging public health orders which require COVID-19 vaccination for people working in many other workplaces and sectors, and for, indeed, in some community settings. Now, whilst I totally support the Morrison government in standing up for vaccination to reduce the risk of serious ill health or even death in the advent of catching this disease, uh, it must be noted that ultimately it is the state premiers who have issued the public health orders that require mandatory vaccines in a wide-ranging setting. The implementation of those mandates uh, as they mandate, I guess, uh, a differential treatment of vaccination persons is entirely at the discretion of those particular states and territories who have done so. The reality is that most Australians uh, have supported the vaccine rollout, and we heard howls and hyperbole from those opposite over many months in here about the vaccine rollout. But now that Australia is leading the charge, uh, with vaccine rates that are the envy of the world, with death rates that are the envy of the world, and an economy that is the envy of the world, somehow those opposite have decided to move on to another baselessly shameful scare campaign that seeks to undermine confidence in Australia's health management of this pandemic and our economic recovery as we move into a post-COVID world. So that a reality couldn't be clear, clearer. 
Australians have rolled up their arms like never before to get the COVID vaccine. The federal government itself has been very clear that those vaccines will be free, will be voluntary in most cases other than those specific high-risk settings, and it is indeed the states and territories who have taken it further with their mandates. Overwhelmingly, those mandates are most severe, most intrusive and, uh, uh, I guess, most invasive in people's lives, where they are led by a Labor government and a Labor premier. Those Labor senators sitting here opposite today have very, very little to say. But when it comes to the Prime Minister's remarks, grossly misrepresented by those same Labor senators here today, that he understood that Australians were sick of government getting up in their grill inserting itself into their families, into their homes and into their businesses. I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan's uh, great expression that the nine most terrifying words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And I think that represents our great liberal faith in those Australians knowing what is best for them, living in their homes and working in their businesses, not sitting in buildings here in Canberra. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator O'Neill. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy President. And I just love the tone of reasonableness that's being adopted by senators making a contribution on the other side, as if it's not chaos out there, as if they've done their job in a decent and orderly way, because that is absolutely not the case. We've got a Prime Minister who answers questions and said, I'm the minister that established no jab, no play, the man who talks tough, who's leading the nation, making sure we're going to get mandatory vaccine rollout. But then he changes his mind. And we have all these excuses that come trotting out every time one of the members of the opposition stand to speak. Now, I know the answers to the questions that were asked by Labor senators, and I think it reveals a complete lack of morals, failure to admit responsibility, and a complete abdication of any national leadership on a matter of great importance. The fact is that you are 20 times more likely to spread COVID if you're unvaccinated. For all the words that are spoken here today, if that's one message that gets through and helps people make a decision to protect themselves and their family, that's going to be a good thing that comes out of our debate at this point of time. At a time when the country is fighting a global pandemic, the Liberal and Nationals are at war with their own government, and Minister, Prime Minister Morrison is facing a revolt from within. He's got people from his own government who've basically indicated that they plan to join up with Pauline. They're not standing with their colleagues. They're not standing with the Prime Minister. They're not following him because they've figured out that he's not worth following. They're chasing One Nation votes, though, that depend on their agenda to try and get themselves a few more votes at the next election. The actions of Senators Rennick and Antic, despite all their protestations and equivocations, give support to anti-vaxxers. And their views have support, that their views have support, and that their views have merit. Now let me be very clear: vaccines do save lives. They reduce the risk of infection, they help prevent serious cases and death in most cases. And that is, frankly, just the overwhelming medical consensus, supported by the overwhelming majority of medical practitioners. And any attempt to portray it as a conspiracy or allow conspiracies to stand damages public confidence in the rollout and harms our efforts to control the virus and keep our community safe. It's a disgrace that those who sit in this chamber, who have the privilege of the confidence of the Australian people, would seek to politicise such a matter of life and death. The vaccine in Australia was a stroll out, not a roll out. And for the great state of New South Wales, if Mr Morrison had done his day job in July of 2020 and taken on the Pfizer uh, doses that he was offered, we would have been getting that vaccine in March in New South Wales and we would have even had a lockdown. Businesses that have collapsed would still be going. That's the kind of failure of leadership that is the hallmark of Mr Morrison. And right now, with regard to this matter of life and death, Senators Rennick and Antic are playing politics. Vaccine and sensible public health measures shouldn't be the new front 
for whatever culture wars people on the far right of politics want to start. As Senator Lambie pointed out earlier today in this chamber, there are plenty of requirements that Australians accept to enable them to work in a safe workplace. You need to be up to date with your vaccinations to be a medical practitioner. You need working with children's school to work in your local preschool, and you need a forklift licence to, uh, to, to drive a forklift. These are measures that are made to ensure that workplaces and consumers are safe and that our vaccination rates are as high as possible. Words matter. Messaging matters. The Prime Minister is aware of marketing. But the words of those opposite and their failure of their colleagues to properly call out misinformation, to properly, to properly deal with the fear and vilification that is now a matter of public record, and only emboldens anti-vaxxer extremists and conspiracy theorists. And that makes us all poorer and it makes our recovery from COVID, both physically and economically, much more subject to the vagaries of uncertainty. Violent protests in Melbourne, public violence displayed against effigies, continuing ratcheting up of political tension is aided in part by members of the coalition who, by visiting and speaking at these rallies, give political status and currency to issues you, and Senator people who do not deserve that expired. status. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to be, take note of all answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of Senator Birmingham's answers to my question relating to far right extremism. In March 2019, the Christchurch mosque attacks were carried out by an Australian far right extremist, murdering 51 innocent Muslims. Since that day, which so many of us had feared terribly after years of rising far right extremism, hatred, and racism, this threat has only gotten worse. It constitutes an unimaginable and devastating risk to the safety of communities across this country. ASIO is now reporting that up to 50% of, it, of its domestic counter-terrorism caseload relates to ideologically motivated violent extremism, which is off the back of a sharp rise in far-right extremism. This past week, we saw far-right extremists on the streets again having embedded themselves in anti-lockdown and anti-vaccination organizing. Some have issued death threats towards public figures. No neo-Nazis and fascists were in attendance at rallies, spreading their hate. Some protesters held anti-Semitic, hateful, and offensive signs. There are photographs and chat histories that are all in the public domain, which draw a line directly from some of the most extreme racist far-right organizing circles in this country, right into the heart of these rallies. Make no mistake, extremist groups are using the burgeoning anti-vaccination rallies to recruit and to grow their racist causes. Anyone who denies this has not looked at the myriad of evidence available to confirm it. And yet the minister representing the prime minister today could not plainly and simply condemn far-right extremism. The Prime Minister himself can't plainly and simply condemn far-right extremism. We got the same of what we always get, condemning all forms of extremism. This might sound like an uncontroversial statement, but all it does is deflect from the serious, unique and present threat that far-right extremism poses. And that is very dangerous. Far-right extremism reared its head in the most devastating way in recent years with the Christchurch mosque attacks in March 2019, which were committed by an Australian white supremacist. I asked the minister in question time on 9th December 2020 whether the government would respond to the Royal Commission into the Christchurch mosque attacks, which had been published the previous day. Minister Birmingham gave me a commitment when he said, that our government will examine the report thoroughly, all 44 of its recommendations thoroughly, in the final response of the New Zealand government to the report thoroughly, and will engage with the New Zealand government on how it is implementing the recommendations of the report, and consider any and all implications for the operation of our own counterterrorism policies and practices. When I asked for an update on this question, on 16th March, Minister Birmingham was unable to give me a direct answer, saying that the report was 
not a report to the Australian government, but it is valued input in terms of an additional source of information that will inform the continued investment and policy making our government makes in relation to these important issues. Today again, I asked Minister Birmingham directly whether the Prime Minister had read it and what the government had done. We got what was basically a known answer. No detail about responding to the recommendations within the report, nothing about working with New Zealand and considering the implications for Australia. The brutal reality is that this government just does not care, and it won't give any semblance of caring until it is, again, too late. Someone else or a group of people are going to get really hurt or killed, and then they will talk for a few days about extreme right-wing violence. And then they will move on again and revert to the script of all forms of violence. It's about as predictable as it is utterly depressing. It is absolutely disgraceful, and you should be ashamed. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Well, now, uh, I believe we have a petition. Dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Thank you. Are there any uh, notices of motion to be given for another day? Oh, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of five legislative instruments made under the Industry Research and Development Act 1986 as set out in the list I have provided to the clerk. I advise the chamber that the list will be circulated to senators with today's notices. Thank you, Senator Fiavanti Wells. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Uh, Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Hanson and Roberts from the 22nd to the 25th of November. 2021 on account of COVID-19 travel restrictions. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Stirl, Pratt, Dodson, Watt, McCarthy, Billick, Chisholm and Green for 22nd November to 2nd of December for personal reasons. Senator Kitching for 22nd to 23rd of November for personal reasons, and Senator Ayres for 22nd November for personal reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion re relating to leave of absence. Is leave, leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator McKim. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Wish Wilson and Steele John from the 22nd of November to the 2nd of December for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'm calling the clerk. Call the clerk to notify postponements and extension of time. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General Business Notice of Motion Number 1260, standing in the name of Senator Waters, for today, postponed to the 24th of November. General Business Notice of Motion Number 1261, standing in the name of Senator Rennick, for today, to the 29th of November. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Thank you. I shall now uh, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and uh, I'm going to deal with um, uh, number 1262, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Thank Senator you, Hanson Madam uh, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number one two. 62 relating to the Beedaloo Basin be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? 
There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunnian. I take leave to make a short statement. I uh, believe leave is granted for one minute. Senator Dunnian. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. The government will not oppose this motion, given the minister has already provided answers to the committee secretariat, and of course will continue to cooperate constructively with the Senate. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I think we're moving to the deferred vote from the last sitting. Um, so I remind senators that on Thursday, the 21st of October, at the conclusion of the general business debate, a division was deferred on Senator Rice's motion relating to income support. I understand that it suits the convenience of the Senate for that division to be held now. So the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. Uh, sorry? Uh, I beg your pardon. I called it incorrectly. I believe the ayes have it. Thank you. Um, okay, so so uh, I'm now dealing with the um, urgency motion. So I inform the Senate that at 8:30 a.m. today, 16 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the, leader, uh, that the letter from Senator Wong proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 16 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall now ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Marielle Smith. Deputy President, I rise in support of the urgency motion moved by my colleague Senator Wong, and urgent it is. Deputy President, you don't put your hand up for public life unless you believe that when you get to a place like this, when you take a seat in a chamber like this, that your voice will matter, that your words will matter, that they will have influence, that they will have meaning, that they will have impact, that you can use those words to help lead our nation, to help lead your communities, to be a leader, to influence, to engage. And Deputy President, I, I truly believe that most people who put their hand up for a seat in this chamber or in the other place are trying to use their voice for good, who believe in the impact of their words, who believe in the impact that their words can have. But the mo at, the moment, at the moment, in this place and in the other place, too many of our fellow senators aren't using their voice to lead, aren't using their influence to lead but are undermining leadership, undermining what it means to be a good leader. We're at a point of time in our history where reliable information matters more than ever, where science matters more than ever, and where, when you undermine science, you undermine good information, you undermine information which will keep people safe, which will keep them healthy, which could actually keep them alive, when you undermine that information, when you undermine that science, you put people at risk. And we must call it out. We must call it out in this chamber. We must call it out in public. We must use our voices to do that, to call out those who are seeking to undermine our response to this pandemic, to frighten, to incite fear, to spread misinformation. No one wanted this pandemic. No one was prepared for the devastation and destruction and it has caused, not just in Australia, but around our world. Around our world, the millions of lives lost. The families devastated, communities devastated, nations devastated, lives destroyed, livelihoods destroyed. 
and for too long we were completely vulnerable to the devastation the pandemic was caused. But then entered science, then entered the incredible men and women who worked tirelessly around the clock to deliver a vaccine. And how lucky are we? How lucky are we to have science? How lucky are we to be the beneficiaries of their work? And notwithstanding the government's sloppy delivery of the vaccine rollout, how lucky are we now to have more ready access to a vaccine, which might just be the thing which saves our lives, which might just be the thing that protects our neighbour, that keeps our children safe. And to be able to do that, to be able to keep the people we love safe, that's a blessing and it's a miracle of science and I am so grateful for it. I am double vaccinated. I am gratefully double vaccinated. Just like 77 per cent of my fellow South Australians aged over 16 who rolled up their sleeves as well to get vaccinated, to keep our community safe. Mr. Sorry, Deputy President, I put my hand up for public life to use my voice to lead in my community, to serve my community. But there are people in this place who are using their voice to spread toxic fear and misinformation, which puts their fellow Australians at risk. Encouraging misinformation that can turn to vaccine hesitancy. And we need to call it out. And not just those who are engaged in the explicit peddling of misinformation and disinformation, who are explicitly doing this to their fellow Australians, explicitly undermining our response to this pandemic, but those who are also dog whistling, playing in word semantics, which seek to undermine this rollout, which seek to undermine our response. The consequences of this misinformation are real and they are personal when they encourage vaccine hesitancy, when they create fear, they risk the health and well-being of not just individuals but communities. The consequences are real for the small business owners in my community who are already confused and stressed out about how to protect their staff, their customers and their clients, who think they know where their Prime Minister stands when he legitimises vaccine mandates on the one hand and then quietly, softly undermines them with the other. And they're real for those of us in this place for whom misinformation, disinformation is hitting close to home. They were real and personal for me when I found out that my vaccinated 102-year-old grandfather was having people not turn up to visit him because they thought the fact that he was vaccinated meant that they could catch COVID. He's 102 and he missed out on those visits because of that fear. It's absurd, but it's happening. It's happening because people let the misinformation happen, that they peddle it and encourage it, they stoke it. It's happening because misinformation has become a business model an electoral model, and it is putting Australians at risk. Deputy President, my state of South Australia, we're about to open up. And whilst there is much to welcome in that, and I trust that those decisions have been taken on health advice, as we trust that the decisions throughout this pandemic are taken on health advice, and when they are, we support them. But I have to say I am deeply concerned for parts of my community who are at most risk, who potentially have the most to lose when and if COVID returns to our state. Populations like our First Nations South Australians, for whom the double vaccination rate is just 46.7 per cent, dramatically lower than our whole of eligible population. And you know we have seen particularly dangerous, particularly toxic spread of misinformation amongst our First Nations populations. And that, combined with a vacuum of appropriate public health messaging, has left people at risk. I want to commend my fellow senators, Senator Dodson and McCarthy, also Linda Burney and all of those who have stepped up to call out this misinformation, have stepped up to keep these communities safe in the context of this fear-mongering. Because we have seen what happens when communities with significant First Nations populations become the site of a COVID-19 outbreak. We saw what happened in Wilcannia. Nothing short of a public health crisis. But we have these low rates in other parts of our country as well. We have them in South Australia. And it's not the fault of local populations. There were significant issues in terms of the rollout, in terms of the support provided to these communities, in terms of the public information and messaging but they need our support now, and I'm worried. I'm also worried about the kids in our community who can't yet get a vaccination. 
I'm a mother of two children under the age of five. And so when this misinformation spreads through our community, when vaccine hesitancy spreads throughout our community, it puts kids at risk too. It puts those who can't get a vaccine at risk. This is, this is dangerous stuff. This is not coming to this place, to this building, using your voice to do good. It's not coming here to lead in our communities, to support your fellow South Australians. It's not coming here to stand up and say, hey, thank God for the miracle of science. Thank God for this blessing. Thank God we're not on the front line of this war in this pandemic alone now, without any armour. Thank God for science and scientists who have given us this vaccine, who have given us an opportunity to be safer. Millions of people have died worldwide. And I know there are countless people around the world who would love to have access to a vaccine and who can't. And here we do. Here we have this armour. So let's listen to the scientists. Let's listen to science. Let's value and appreciate this miracle and call out the people here and the people around our country who are using uncertainty and fear, turning it into a business model, turning it into an electoral model, saying, here's my shot of re-election, I'll stoke this fear, I'll stoke this fire, instead of leading, instead of leading their communities, instead of doing everything they can to uphold the health advice to uphold science and scientists, to uphold the yama we now have in this war, in this pandemic. Call them out. It is grossly irresponsible. And it's not a game. It's not a game. It's not student politics. This is real, real lives, real communities, my community, our kids our First Nations populations, our vulnerable populations who deserve so much more, who deserve leaders, who deserve people worthy of the chairs that they take up in this place. It's time to call them out. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Hughes. Deputy President, and I guess 2021 we shouldn't be surprised that we're starting these final two sitting weeks this year in a bit of a challenging environment, as we've experienced for most of the past 20 months or so. So we probably all shouldn't be too overly surprised, but I do think uh, this week we may be reaching a new level of the bazaar. After question time today, I, I feel Senator Wong may actually need to sit down with her own Senate team and ascertain where they actually are on vaccines. We had Senator O'Neill criticising no jab, no play, like the best of the anti-vaxxers clearly wanting to open our children to a virus that we're more than capable of vaccinating against. But she was then followed by Senator McAllister, who was critical that the PM had suggested people in Brisbane should be able to get a coffee at 80 per cent vax rate, putting baristas at risk, smacking of demands for mandatory vaccination. And then, of course, we saw the bill this morning by Senator Hanson attempting to fundamentally halt government legislation. Seriously? What sort of ejaculation of the pacifier is this? I would hope that one thing we can all agree on is national security, the importance of keeping our nation safe. But yet here we are, faced with a revolt as we see a bill that will boost our national security, secure critical infrastructure to prevent cyber attacks, and this is the first piece of legislation that's come before us today. So I stand here in disappointment that our national security, all of our security, might be jeopardised due to this sort of behaviour. So when we began the COVID journey, National Cabinet was established to ensure that the whole country was working in the same direction when it came to living in a post-pandemic world. A national plan was developed, working with expert advice from the Doherty Institute and Commonwealth Treasury. The Morrison government has always been and continues to be committed to the national plan. And that plan is working where it is upheld. Thresholds were set. Jurisdictions could open safely, both at the 70 per cent and the 80 per cent fully vaccinated marks. Now, I appreciate we've seen some states adhere to the plan and others go a little rogue. And if I was looking cynically at the behaviour of Senator Hanson's home state premier, along with WA's, you may think they could be working in cahoots to cause political problems for the Prime Minister in the lead-up to the federal election. And this is important for everyone to remember. 
It's the state premiers, far too often along with unelected health officers, determining these restrictions. And to anyone who looks across the different states, for anyone who assumes that some of these restrictions are based in science is ludicrous. Arbitrary numbers in homes allowed, random distances people can travel, masks both inside and out, let alone by yourself in a car, drinking, sitting down versus standing up. But what we do know, despite what the COVID doomsayers predicted, when New South Wales opened it up at its high level of vaccination, cases have continued to decline. Perhaps more importantly, hospitalisations and those requiring ventilators, those numbers have also consistently dropped. This is important to remember because despite the voodoo science, the sheep drench pushes, we are seeing vaccinations at work. They are effective at ensuring the virus's minimum health impacts. They're keeping people safe. As we see those who are vaccinated, even if they are COVID positive, they're not really getting as sick, nor are they passing on as widely as their viral load is much lower. So high vaccination rates combined with sensible public health strategies, we're seeing a virus we can learn to live with, not one that's incredibly deadly for many Australians. Now, I do understand that everyone in the Australian population pretty much across the board is over it. They want government out of their life. They want things to get back to normal. I actually think we would struggle to find too many people who would want us to continue living in the same way that we have been. We all want to see kids back in the classroom, our teenagers and young people to experience all we did when we were young, for families to be able to get together, for businesses to be able to operate as they best see fit. And in fact, as of yesterday, every single state has reached over 80 per cent first dose, and in fact, all are over 70 per cent fully vaxxed. So it is time for restrictions to be rolled back. And this is something every Premier has agreed to in National Cabinet. All of them unanimously agreed to in National Cabinet. The performance art that's being conducted by some state premiers clinging to relevance, or even more concerning, those with hospital systems already overwhelmed without a COVID case at all, are now working actively against the plan they agreed to. But we do also need to remember that at no point has the Morrison government mandated vaccines. We've always said that it's up to the individual. And whilst we've never hidden our desire to see as many Australians as possible to get vaccinated, we've never demanded they be compulsory across the board. There are, of course, exceptions, those in certain aged care and health settings, but this also is not anything new. This is something that has occurred previously around the flu vaccine. We want to protect and continue to protect those vulnerable communities and keep those and those that work with them safe. And I think, as Senator Lambie actually so perfectly put it together this morning, mandatory flu vaccines have been around since COVID was nothing but a sparkle in a bat's eye. The ability to mandate is driven by states. And while some states, such as my home state as New South Wales, has set a date where those who have decided against the vaccine will open up to them, it still will be only around 4 to 5 per cent of people over 16, a very small majority of people, who will not have received a first or second dose of vaccine. So once you get there to 15th of December for us, you will be free to do as you wish. And on top of that, those that have decided to remain unvaccinated will be able to access, should they require a health system funded by all taxpayers, should they require hospitalisation or a ventilator. We need to learn to live with COVID. It should be something similar to the flu, and it's the vaccines that can allow this to occur. So at that point, 95 per cent fully vaccinated, I do think we should also see the end of QR codes and mask mandates. We need to return to a pre-COVID life. Freedom should be returned without any restrictions. But many of these restrictions are being put in place under state health orders. And I note that some of the people who supported the bill this morning were also some of the strongest advocates in this place for states' rights and keen to ensure respect of the Constitution. Yet seemingly some were happy to overrule, override and, quite frankly, overreach across the states. So it's important to remember, for those in Queensland and WA in particular, elections have consequences. 
The overwhelming support given to both premiers in those states at recent elections has emboldened them to maintain unacceptable levels of restrictions, not based on science, effective health advice, quite frankly not even common sense. But the rest of the country should not be put at risk with this unacceptable behaviour and threats because a small percentage of the population can't get a coffee. As we've all come to know far too well, states and territories have a large degree of autonomy to conduct their own affairs under the Australian Constitution, the ability to implement public orders amongst them. There has been significant overreach by premiers, and I'm not denying that at all. I think the restriction of movement throughout this country has been extended beyond belief. I think it's a little crazy, in fact, that we're all sitting here, set up in split seats, mask mandates in Canberra, the most highly vaccinated jurisdiction in the country, in fact, one of almost in the world. I do think businesses should have the right to refuse entry or service to those who decide to remain unvaccinated, not those who have legitimate medical grounds but those who oppose the vaccine as they don't support vaccines. I have zero tolerance for anti-vaxxers, and I've been dealing with them and a lot of those people for a lot longer than many others in this place. There's nothing like being the mother of a newly diagnosed son with autism to be told that I caused it. I gave it to him because I'd had him vaccinated. It's wrong, deceitful and incredibly upsetting, but these people have permeated autism groups for years written articles and diverted more money away from autism research than anyone else. Also, we can debunk time and again the work of a struck-off and disgraced physician. I've spoken up against these people since coming to this place and have received the most vile abuse, including threats to myself and my family. These people are abhorrent, their views are ridiculous, and no weight should be given to them at all. We have such a high voluntary rate of vaccination we should maintain the national plan to reopen, the easing of restrictions. We should have no mask mandates, no QR codes. We should have unrestricted quarantine-free travel across our country, and businesses should be able to operate in the way that they feel they are best able to do so. I want to see the end of COVID like so many other Australians. I want to be able to visit friends I grew up with in Adelaide and Perth. I want my son to see his godmother in Queensland and my daughter to see her godparents in Adelaide. We need to let the national plan continue to roll out. Time has expired. Senator Hughes. Senator Still John, remotely. Thank you, Acting President. Vaccines and vaccinations save lives. They are one of the most powerful tools in our public health toolkit to fight this virus and to protect our community. And as community leaders, we should be encouraging people to get vaccinated. We should be sharing information about the opportunities to do so. And we should be focused on holding the authorities to account, the governments, both state and federal, for creating those opportunities and incentives for people to get vaccinated. Now, the story of Australia's COVID times is a story dominated by the success of the community in coming together, to act in community-minded ways to limit death and harm, transposed against the failure of the Morrison government. It is now conclusively known that our government had the opportunity, the Liberals had the opportunity to order more vaccines earlier, and they didn't. The three key elements of a successful vaccine rollout, whether it be for COVID-19 or any other disease, are communication, coordination, and supply. Now, in each of these areas, the federal government, the national government, is the most important actor. They have the most levers to pull to get the work done, and yet the Liberal government failed. They failed disabled people, particularly actively deprioritizing us when the extent of their mismanagement became known, and they have failed time and time again 
to take the simple steps being modelled all around the world to get vaccines to people proactively and get them that protection. What we saw last week was a continuation of the Liberal failure in this space. Not content with failing to get the vaccines when we needed them, not content uh, with taking away the supports that people needed to follow the health advice and keep the case numbers down. The Morrison government last week failed its final test. The test of moral character. The test of how you respond when terrifying violence begins to spread in our community, when lies and deceit are spread by those in positions of power. The Prime Minister was given the opportunity to condemn the violent, hateful rhetoric, to call it out, and he failed to do it. He gave it safe harbour for the simple reason that he sees votes in it. He sees that it will Senator, be Senator official Steele John, I remind you that to his in proper political Senator freedom. Steele John, order, I remind you that the imputation of improper motives is contrary to standing orders. I'd ask you to remind, recall that in your remarks. You have the call. It was quite clear that the Morrison government's political agenda in relation to reacting to that violence in our community was motivated solely by a belief that there is votes in it for them should they double speak to these people, to these movements. It is one of the most profound displays of political cowardice in the nearly 10 years of a government which has been dominated by moments of failure when it comes to moral questions, failures of leadership. In fact, should the biography of Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, ever be written, it would be rightly titled Failing Upwards, the Scott Morrison story. Now, at this moment, what is needed is honesty from community representatives, not a callous attempt to win votes on the eve of an election, which is what we are seeing from this government in its final desperate days. Senator Watt, remotely. You have the call. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, this motion that the Senate is debating today, you would think is pretty simple. Uh, we are not asking much of senators today with this motion. All this motion seeks to do is to call on all senators, regardless of their party, regardless of their state, uh, to share accurate information about the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines based on health advice, not based on Dr. Google, Dr. Facebook, Dr. Clive Palmer, Dr. Conspiracy Theorist, but based on health advice from recognised experts in the field, many of, of whom actually are employed by this federal government. This motion calls on all senators to combat the disinformation campaigns uh, that we are seeing from far too many quarters in our society and sadly from senators who are supposed to be elected to represent the best interests of all Australians, but who seem to be more preoccupied with spreading fear and disinformation about vaccines which stand our best chance of keeping our communities safe and keeping our economies working and keeping people in jobs. This motion calls on all senators to support government action, regardless of which level of government, regardless of which party uh, that seeks to keep communities safe. 
and that government action includes vaccination mandates which are imposed on the basis of health advice. This is, these mandates, just like other actions that have been taken by governments, state, federal and local, are based on health advice. They are not being done on a whim. They are not being done out of some power grab, as is being alleged. They are being done on the basis of health advice with the express purpose of keeping our communities safe, keeping people alive, keeping our economies going and keeping people in work. Uh, and it is important to note that these mandates have been imposed by all state and territory governments. We only hear from the Prime Minister and his colleagues about mandates that are imposed in Labor states. They are completely silent about the fact that these motions, uh, these mandates, have also been imposed by their Liberal and National Party colleagues in state and territory governments. It's as if a mandate imposed by a Labor state is a terrible thing and a mandate imposed by a Liberal or National state is a wonderful thing. That goes to the dishonesty that we are seeing from this Prime Minister and unfortunately so many of his colleagues as we all should be combining to combat COVID, to combat disinformation and to keep our communities safe. And this motion also supports comments that this Prime Minister has been made before. There's not many times that you'll see opposition senators giving this Prime Minister a pat on the back for doing the right thing around COVID, but from time to time he has done the right thing, especially when he was speaking to Sydney Radio in August, commending the New South Wales government for bringing in vaccination mandates and for noting that businesses have a legitimate right to refuse patrons who are unvaccinated. In August, it was OK for the Prime Minister to back the New South Wales government and to back New South Wales businesses who exclude patrons on the basis of their vac vaccination status. But when it comes to Queensland or any Labor state, it's of course a different matter. This goes to the core of how this Prime Minister has approached this issue and every issue. He is constantly looking to pick fights with Labor states, with the residents of those states, while giving a free pass for exactly the same kind of behaviour that we see from Liberal state governments. What we need at the moment as we seek to recover from COVID-19 is a Prime Minister and a government who will actually bring the, the country together, who will not seek to divide the country on the basis of the colour of their politic of their state government. That's what we need and it's not what we're getting from this Prime Minister. Now, I'll be interested to see how this vote goes on this motion because we've heard a lot from a couple of senators particularly uh, Senators Hanson and Senator Rennick, uh, who are with, along, along with their colleagues over recent weeks, have been promising Australians who support their position on mandates that they won't support government legislation and they won't vote with the government over this fortnight. Well, here is another test for Senator Hanson and Senator Rennick to see whether they're actually, actually their word means anything. If their word means anything, they will continue to vote against the government Order, just like they promised to do. has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, uh, this motion, this motion uh, uh, from, from the party that used to be called and known as the Labor Party shows completely that the Labor Party have completely deserted protecting workers' rights. They no longer give, a, give two hoots about the rights of workers to work, the rights of labourers to work. It is no longer a Labor Party. They should get it over with change their name to the Woke Party, get it done, because they are not representing labourers, they are not representing workers, they are not even representing unions. Because the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the ACTU, just a few months ago put out a joint statement with the Business Council opposing mandatory vaccinations, opposing them. It says here that, uh, that we believe—this is a direct quote from the, the Business Council and the Australian Council of Trade Unions—that we believe that for the overwhelming majority of Australians, your work or workplace should not fundamentally alter the voluntary nature of vaccination. I, I concur with that wholeheartedly. People in this country should have the right to work and provide for their families. Not according to the Labor Party. Not according to the Labor Party. The statement goes on to say, just so I'm clear, uh, and, and this also reflects my view, they say, the employers and unions recognise that for a small number of high-risk workplaces, 
There be, may be a need for all workers in a workplace to be vaccinated to protect community health and safety. I believe that too, and that's why this morning I, I recognise that in my contribution. But to impose mandates across almost our whole economy, which is occurring in many states, and for all time, or potentially perpetuity, which is also something apparent in some states, that is a breach of a person's fundamental right to be able to work so that they can have and provide food on their table for their children. This is outrageous that state governments are doing this. This motion, though, is also totally incoherent. On the one hand, it says that businesses should have the right to refuse entry uh, to people who are unvaccinated. And on the other, it says, oh, we should mandate that anyway. Well, businesses don't have that right to choose then. They don't have a right to choose if it's mandated for them by governments. So the Labor Party here are trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're holding out the hope that somehow businesses would have a choice and they respect choice. But then at the same time in this motion, they are taking away that choice by supporting mandates as well. Now, I noticed that uh, Senator Watt there was saying that uh, mandated vaccine mandates should apply where the health advice says. So where is this health advice, by the way? We never seem to get to see it. Uh, it seems to be hidden uh, from all of us mere mortals. But, uh, but Senator Watt, what Senator Watt does not explain is how do we deal with a situation where health ex experts will disagree? And some of them do disagree. Uh, Dr Nick Coatsworth, who was, until uh, not that long ago, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer uh, of the Commonwealth Government, a highly respected expert in this field, uh, he said just the other day, actually on, on the 18th of November, only late last week, he said, and I'm quoting, that one of the best decisions ever made by a jurisdiction was Adam Barr's determination to avoid that he's the Canberra First Minister. Uh, at a, an, um, and, sorry, Andrew Barr's determination to avoid differential treatment of unvaccinated Canberrans. No vaccine passports. Just convincing the community and facilitating vaccination. That's the way it's done. That's, that's pretty clear health advice. And the ACT is an example where there's been no vaccination passports, and I believe they have the highest vaccination rate in the country. They've done that without any mandating, without any for, forced uh, people to force to lose their jobs, at least in a widespread way. Again, keeping in mind that, yes, in high-risk health environments, that might be required. But they haven't required people to show their medical papers to go to a cafe. They haven't required uh, a retail worker, someone working at a supermarket, uh, to, to get a vaccination just to keep their job. And they've achieved the result we want, we all want, which is high vaccination rates. So where is the evidence that this works? I mean, this is a fundamental restriction on people's human rights. Surely we can agree with that. Surely someone does have a right to work. We recognise it in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, something that we hear a lot from the Labor and Greens Party about these international treaties we should comply with. Well, that's in there. It's in the heart of the document uh, that people have a right to work. So we're breaching that right. We are restricting that right. And to do so, if you're going to do so, You'd want to have pretty good evidence that this stuff works, but we have almost zero evidence that it works. It's certainly the vaccine passports policies are certainly not working overseas, and any other speakers in this debate will just challenge, challenge, challenge you. Provide an example where vaccine passports have worked. Just one, just one country. Just name one where they have worked. But look, even regard, I, I want to be clear that even. Even if the health advice, which is not, but even if the health advice were all in one direction for vaccine passports, we cannot, we cannot give up our responsibility to make decisions on these fundamental issues just to people who are expert in one narrow field, because these issues go beyond much more than just the coronavirus or health issues alone. They go to fundamental human rights, and therefore we, it is incumbent on us not to outsource our decision making, our responsibility to weigh up evidence and advice for the best interests of the Australian people, to protect their rights, to make sure we remain a free country. And I want to quote here from, from C.S. Lewis, who said this many years ago—I think it was in, yes, in 1958, many years ago, but it's quite prescient—where he said that the new oligarchy must more and more base its claim to plan us on its claim to knowledge. If we are to be mothered, mother knows best. This means they must increasingly rely on the advice of scientists till in the end the politicians proper become merely the scientists' puppets. 
But government involves questions about the good for man and justice, and what things are worth having at what price. And on these, a scientific training give, uh, gives a man's opinion no added value. Let the doctor tell me I shall die unless I do so and so, but whether life is worth having on those terms is no more a question for him than any other man. That is a, that is a, that is a succinct summary of what we used to consider freedom uh, in this country and right around Western civilisation. That it was up to the, each individual was sovereign to decide what was important in their lives. That it was not for a centralised government to dictate uh, what they should do on, with their life, with their lifestyle, with their, with their diet, and certainly not uh, with medical procedures. But that is what we're doing here. That is what we're doing here. And the Australian people have worked this out. The Australian people have worked it out. That's why you see hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, and they're not all unvaccinated people. There are, there are plenty of people like myself who are vaccinated that will fight and protect the rights of other Australians to make a different decision. There are thousands of people who have never seen protests like this in this country, and they've been almost overwhelmingly peaceful protests, probably the most peaceful protests we've ever seen in this country. And now we have people wanting to silence fellow Australians. Uh, we have the Labor member for Keppel near where I'm, where I live, uh, wanting to refer our local mayor uh, to, the, to the Triple C in Queensland because he had the temerity to vote against the Queensland government's draconian vaccine mandate laws. This behaviour is irre reprehensible. Uh, to try and silence an elected official through threats, through threats of referral uh, uh, to what are otherwise should be corruption-making bodies, corruption investigating bodies uh, is a low point uh, for the member for Keppel there in central Queensland. And that's quite an achievement for her based on her uh, previous conduct. There were two, over 2,000 people in Yapoon on the weekend campaigning against these mandates. I know many of them. I, I, can, I can vouch for the fact that they're not, they're not far-right extremists. Uh, they're not radical extremists. They're not fringe elements, as the Queensland Deputy Premier tagged them last week. They are upstanding men and women in our community, many of them business owners, uh, many of them involved in voluntary organisations, who are just trying to defend the right of people to earn a living and not be forced to undertake a medical procedure. They do not deserve, they do not deserve their own member of parliament in Queensland seeking to bully and silence their mayor uh, from standing up for them. I applaud the work of the Capricorn uh, Coast, sorry, the Livingston Shire Council on the Capricorn Coast last week. They stood up as one and voted unanimously against these vaccine passports. And it's about time that the Queensland Labor government actually listened to the people of Queensland. It's about time they discussed these matters before running off dictates in Brisbane that tell us how we should live up there in central Queensland. Uh, because I tell you what, uh, people up there do not want their freedoms taken away. They will not back down on this fight. They will continue to support all of our fellow central Queenslanders to make their own decisions, to work to provide for their family and ensure that we do not lose the free country we were all born in. Thank you. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Wong's motion clarifies the voting choices on offer to the electorate at the next election. Senator Wong has made it clear that under an Albanese banned government, there will be no place for democracy. There will be no place for freedom of speech. There will be no place for independent thought. There will be no democracy under a government that the Labor Party leads. There will only be mindless conformity. The very nature of the Senate is to bring together representatives with different opinions based on different life experiences, education and origin. Such a debate will necessarily leverage opposing facts and opposing interpretations of facts. And through this process, is more likely to arrive at the truth. Data and truth lead to sound, sustainable policy decisions. With this motion, Senator Wong is demonstrating why a Labor Greens government so seldom makes good policy decisions, as we saw in the last Labor Greens government. Echo chambers do not make for good government. One nation will defend our democracy and our right to free speech. We will continue to advocate debate on the issues of the day, including COVID injections. And we will continue to call out unelected bureaucrats with massive financial conflicts of interest. 
Australia is not a corporate dictatorship, no matter how hard Senator Wong and this parliament try to make it one. On the weekend, half a million Australians demonstrated what they think of Senator Wong's motion. Despite media censorship and suppression, half a million Australians came out to defend freedom of speech and freedom of choice. In a beautiful expression of unity across political, religious, professional and cultural backgrounds, everyday Australians around the country demonstrated a love for one flag, one community and one nation. I've attended marches and rallies at Brisbane and the Gold Coast and will be doing so again this coming Saturday in support of the people and in support of freedom. I've felt people's anger, their determination, their resentment, their sadness, their grief, and I've felt people's disdain for MPs and senators who ignore the people, who try to control the people. With this motion, Senator Wong is saying to the millions who demonstrated and to people who cheered them on from home, shut up and comply. What a clear picture of life under a Labor Greens government Labor has painted today. One nation will never shut up and comply. And we will support people who have the freedom to speak up and the courage and integrity to speak up. We compliment and appreciate the Livingston Council in central Queensland, the Capricorn Coast. What a wonderful example of courage and integrity and listening to and supporting and working for and serving the people in their latest uh, declaration motion that was passed unanimously last week. We applaud you. Thank you very much, Mayor, and all councillors. In One Nation, we listen, we stand up, and we speak up. We are representatives of the people. We work for the people. We serve the people. We will always support freedom and basic human rights. We have one flag. We are one community. We are one people. And we are one nation. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Billick, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As parliamentarians, the people of Australia, the voters, have put their trust in us. We hold positions of huge responsibility. We're community leaders with a voice, a platform and an audience. And as leaders, what we say in public carries a great deal of weight. In the COVID pandemic, compliance with public health restrictions is vital to making those restrictions work. Acceptance of the safety and efficacy of vaccines is vital to making the vaccine rollout work. But sadly, there are some in this place and in the House of Reps who have chosen to undermine the public health effort instead, to fearmonger and spread misinformation. And Macking President, parliamentarians have a hugely important role to play in reinforcing public health messages. The most powerful antidote we could have against the conspiracy theories and disinformation being peddled by some members and senators is the holder of Australia's highest office to reject their crazy ideas and suggestions. And Mr Kelly promotes unproven COVID treatments like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. It's not good enough for Mr Morrison to simply say, he's not my doctor, or that Mr Kelly's pronouncements don't align with his views. When Senator Rennick goes about spreading vaccine conspiracy theories, it's not good enough for the Health Minister, Mr Hunt, to simply make a pathetic plea for him to stick with the facts. The dangerous ideas being promoted by these parliamentarians should be met with swift and clear condemnation by the Prime Minister, not some sort of timid disagreement. For some Australians, the spread of dangerous ideas which undermine our public health measures could literally be a matter of life or death. It must be condemned in the strongest possible terms, and the Prime Minister must send a clear message to Liberal members and senators engaging in this dangerous behaviour that it will not be tolerated in his party. And as if the disinformation isn't dangerous enough, we saw some senators in this place vote for a bill this morning 
which have undermined public health measures. The message Senator Hanson, Senator Roberts and five, five coalition senators are sending to Australians is that they reject the tools that are needed to keep the public safe. They're telling vulnerable Australians, such as aged care residents and hospital patients, that it's OK for them to bear the risk of being exposed to unvaccinated workers. While health experts and professionals are working hard to lift vaccination rates so Australians can get back to enjoying their freedoms, we've got government senators undermining that effort without any consequence. If Mr Morrison or Mr Joyce won't discipline their rogue senators, at the very least, at the very least, they should publicly rebuke them. But it's a little surprise that Mr Pop Morrison appears to lack the courage to confront his backbenchers when he himself is not fully committed to the public health measures necessary to get us safely through the pandemic. Regardless of whether you agreed with them or not, every Australian Prime Minister up until now has had clear convictions and a clear vision for the nation. But I've never seen a national leader so lacking in conviction or vision as Mr Morrison. And the COVID pandemic has shown us all his true colours. This is a Prime Minister who has talked up the measures that have kept Australia safe from COVID, but keeps giving a nod and a wink to the radical fringe that rails against these measures. He made a statement condemning expressions of violence by protesters, then said he sympathised with their frustrations. That's double speak. It's rubbish. He needs to be strong. He took credit for the actions of states and territories in stopping the spread of COVID, but he fought them every step of the way and then pressured them, especially the Labor states, to lift restrictions. And his government even joined a High Court challenge by mining magnate Clive Palmer against Western Australia's border restrictions before public pressure forced them to withdraw. The Prime Minister talks up the importance of getting vaccinated, but refuses to reprimand those in his own party who undermine vaccination messages. This is a Prime Minister who is quite happy to appeal to mainstream Australia, all the while quietly courting the preferences you, of Senator one Billy, nation, time has one nation and the Senator Davey. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Look, I agree with the calls for us all to share accurate information about the efficacy of COVID vaccines. I would also say that it is commensurate on all of us to share accurate information about jurisdictional reach and to share accurate information about what we can do unilaterally as a federal government and what we can't, who is responsible for what. And let's also consider and be accurate about what people are currently protesting against, because yes, facts matter. For those who are currently protesting against restrictions, and that is what they're protesting against, they're not protesting against vaccine mandates because there are no vaccine mandates. They are protesting against restrictions based on vaccination status and differential treatment of those who are or who are not fully vaccinated. Those restrictions have been put in place by the state and territory governments. These are state and territory decisions under state and territory laws. They are following their public health orders. It is not the Commonwealth Government's place to be able to usurp those. So, The bill that we saw this morning that many people have referred to in this afternoon's debate was designed to try and usurp state rights. Now, that's a very slippery slope to start going down. Where do we stop? But that bill this morning, a bill that was supposedly to stop government overreach, was government overreach writ large. Our government's position has and always will be that COVID-19 vaccination should be voluntary, except in highly exceptional circumstances such as people who work in health and aged care. Senator Lambie said it very well this morning, and for anyone who didn't listen, I encourage you to go and listen to her Hansard, because she explained that vaccination is a choice, 
And in certain industries, the choice is you get a vaccination or find another calling. Now, that is not new. Certain employment arrangements have had vaccination requirements for decades. In New South Wales, you haven't been able to be a nurse without being vaccinated against whooping cough. In many aged care facilities, it's been mandatory to get a flu shot, not just once, but annually. The issue we are currently seeing is not really about those accepted norms for vaccine requirements in exceptional circumstances, but it is being driven by fear. And when I looked deeper into Senator Hanson's bill this morning, it caused me fear. Because that bill also it didn't just prohibit governments from mandating vaccines for their own workers. It prevented the Commonwealth, state or territory governments from entering into an agreement, providing funding, or granting a licence to a permanent or entity, be it government or private, or a charity or an NGO, an entity that is reasonably likely to discriminate on the basis of COVID vaccination. And that reasonably likely test is, have they put in restrictions in the past? Are you serious? That bill would have seen organisations such as St John's Ambulance, who are a fantastic organisation that provide excellent first aid support and community programs. They would have been restricted, prevented from receiving funding or contracting to a state government. Our charities would have been impacted. You know, sorry, Red Cross, next time there's a black summer bushfire, you can't have any money because you might require your first aid instructors who teach things like resuscitation to actually be vaccinated against something like the COVID-19 uh, virus. Salvation Army and St Vincent de Paul, who work with the homeless and vulnerable, would have been prohibited from receiving grants or funding if they ask their volunteers, who work with the most vulnerable people in our society, to vaccinate to protect them. And private hospitals. Well, sorry, St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, part of the St Vincent Health Australia, but who provide full-service public teaching hospital? Not anymore under Senator Hanson's bill. So yes, facts matter. And the fact of the matter is, that our government believes in voluntary vaccination, but the states are, are applying restrictions, you, but also— Thank you. Senator Grogan. I rise to speak in support of this urgency motion because I simply cannot fathom what members of the Morrison-Joyce government are seemingly greenlit to parade around the country undermining public health advice in the middle of a deadly pandemic. Last Sunday, just two days before South Australians in a nervous fashion are due to throw open our doors to the nation, we had a member of this chamber addressing the Adelaide anti-vax rally. What parallel universe are we in when someone elected to represent the people of South Australia and all the inherent responsibilities that that entails that have been borne out through this debate today? is addressing a rally conceived to undermine a public health message and a public health response to a deadly disease that has killed five million people worldwide. Should Alec Senator Antic and other coalition members spreading this misinformation about the virus be reined in? Of course they should. But will they be? I can't see it. I can't see the Prime Minister or the Deputy Prime Minister doing anything about this. They're allowing senators from this chamber to spread misinformation, to support anti-science, anti-vax rallies like the one we saw in Adelaide on the weekend. It suits the government to have a bob each way, partly supporting people who believe in science, partly supporting people who don't. The conspiracy theorists and the right-wing nutjobs and the social media medics are out there pushing this line, and it's being supported by members of this chamber. It suits the Prime Minister to have those on the far right of his party out there talking to the fringe, while keeping his own hands clean so he can gather their preferences whenever the next election is held. We see this sort of doublespeak quite a lot with the Prime Minister and his government, and in normal circumstances, 
It's annoying. It's pathetic. It's always disappointing. But when we're dealing with a deadly pandemic, one that threatens the lives of vulnerable people and those immunodeficient, immune it is reckless beyond belief. And it lacks the leadership that we should demand in this country. On the very same day, we had coalition MPs and senators addressing anti-vax rallies around this country, we learnt that a young Victorian child under 10 was killed by this disease. To protect our community, we all have to do our part. The nation, including my home state of South Australia, is screaming out for leadership. And what do they get? Well, from Senator Antic, they get a tacit nod to misinformation and to anti-science, reactionary, right-wing politics. As I said earlier, it suits the Prime Minister's interests to have a bob each way on a serious issue of public health. From the get-go, the government's response to the pandemic has been marked by mixed messages, indecision and blatant misinformation. Instead of unequivocally calling out the disgusting threats to the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews at anti-vax rallies in Melbourne in recent times, the Prime Minister has said he understands their concerns. Instead of urging those who are holding out on getting vaccinated to not be influenced by the hateful campaigns from the anti-vaxxers, he says they understand, he understands their concerns. Well, their concerns have no basis in scientific fact. And their concerns are being driven through our communities and are discouraging people from getting vaccinated, which then places their community at risk. Time and time again, this government has failed to call out the misinformation and extreme elements from within our community, because doing so might lose them a few of Pauline Hanson or Clive Palmer's preferences. Australians are not stupid. They are awake to the doublespeak, to the dog whistling and to the government that cares little for anything but its own sorry political survival. We must ensure that we provide accurate health advice and fight against disinformation campaigns and protect our communities. This is a deadly disease. Herd immunity is a useful tool in fighting these diseases. It helps us protect those who cannot be vaccinated for medical reasons and helps us keep our communities safe. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is that the matter of urgency moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. So we'll now proceed to the consideration of documents. And the documents for today are listed on page four of the order of business. And there is considerable numbers of them, so we might just work through um, progressively. So do we have anybody wishing to speak to documents one to six? Sorry, oh, sorry, Senator Walsh. That's okay. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I have forgotten the precise words, but I would like to <laughs> take note of documents uh, three and five on page four uh, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Um, De going, Acting okay. Deputy President, I do have a number more. Do you want me to keep yeah, going like page by page? Going, I think that's fine. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Deputy President, I would like to take note of documents uh, on page six, documents 33, 34, 39, 45, and 47, mm -hmm. uh, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave granted. Uh, on page seven, Acting Deputy President, yeah. uh, I'd like to take note of documents 68 and 86, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave granted. Uh, on page eight, I'd like to take note of documents. Uh, 101, 102, uh, and 109, uh, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave's granted. Leave's granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, I 
look, I actually wasn't. I started paying attention to what, which one Senator Walsh had mentioned, but then I got distracted. <laughs> so, on page five, I seek to take note of documents numbers 12, 21, and 27. You seek leave to continue my remarks. On page six, documents 33 and 53. And seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. And on page eight, document 110. And seek leave to continue my remarks. And leave is granted. Thank you. I'm just making sure that there was nobody on screen or elsewhere that needed to seek a call. No, so on that note, we'll move on. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning ASIC's internal review of its handling of the Stirling Group uh, and the government response to the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants. Thank you. No one wishing to speak? Senator, Senator Rice? Y yes. Um, look, I, actually, I, I did want to speak to that, but can I just check? I think I said I sought leave to uh, took note of document 27, but can I just check? We'll double check. That. <laughs> yes, you did. Good. Oh. Okay. Um, and but I, yes, now I do want to speak to the tabling of the response to the OPD of, for the information on sports frauds, which surprise, surprise. The minister has decided that the information still shouldn't be forthcoming, just like the information for documents relating to car park rorts still not forthcoming. This is information that is in the public interest. But we know why the government is not revealing this information. It's because they are hiding. They are hiding information. They are telling lies to the Australian public. They are trying to pretend that everything is fine, that everything is being done appropriately, that money is being spent with due consideration, with due process, when it is not. And we know from the refusal to table documents relating to sports rorts, from the refusal to table documents relating to car park rorts, that this just, it's not just an isolated incident. We have got rorting left right and centre. We have got sports rorts. We have got car park rorts. We have got the Building Better Regions Fund. Basically, government money, taxpayers' money, people's taxes, their hard-earned money being channelled, being siphoned into projects purely that serve the government's interests, being siphoned into projects that are just being funded because the government thinks it's going to help them win an election. We saw it with sports rorts, we saw it with the car park rorts, whereas people thought that there was a proper process, as there should have been. There wasn't. With sports rorts, we had a process that went on, clubs applied for grants, they thought that they were, it was going to be a fair process, that their grant applications were going to be considered fairly, and indeed they, they were. There was a process that went through ranking those projects, which one should be funded. But no, we then know that within the then sports minister, Senator Mackenzie's office, Senator Mackenzie decided she didn't like that list of projects that were going to be funded because they weren't going to be in the government's interests. So instead, we had most of those project projects not being funded, and the projects that were funded were the ones that they thought they could use to curry favour with the electorate to win votes. They were either in marginal seats or were they in seats where they wanted to reward their, their best mates? That's what happened with sports rights. And we had hard-working people who put hundreds of hours into their applications, who thought that they were going to be getting money for upgrades to their sporting projects that were left out in the cold. We had projects that scored right at the top of the list when they'll be considered according to, their, to, to how um, their eligibility and meeting the criteria that didn't get funded. And it wasn't an accident that they didn't get funded. It was because they weren't the favoured projects. They weren't the ones that the government felt that they could use to be trying to win an election. That was sports rorts. But yet the spreadsheets, all of the information that would reveal that, that was that the ANAO told us about, the Auditor-General told us about that this was what was going on, but when 
We ask for those documents. No, we don't get them. The public is not able to see what's going on. They are hiding information from the public. They are lying to the Australian public. And then we saw at exactly the same time the same things going on with the car parks, car park rorts. Here we had a program that, even though the advice of the department initially was that you know, it should be a project that people could put in applications for, no, it ended up being a program where only the favoured coalition MPs got to say which car parks could be funded. And in fact, it was, it was doubly outrageous because, first of all, here is a, a scheme worth billions of dollars that's meant to be tackling urban congestion. All the evidence shows that if you're trying to tackle urban congestion, you do not build more infrastructure for cars. Because all that happens if you build more infrastructure for cars is that you encourage more people to drive. We, we've, we had our inquiry just last a fortnight ago into car park rorts, and we heard from the transport and the planning experts who said it is universally accepted around the world that the way to be tackling to congestion is to be giving people alternatives to be travelling by their car, to give people decent public transport, to give people really good, safe walking and cycling facility. That's how you get people out of their cars and that's how you tackle congestion, not by building more infrastructure for cars. But no, that advice, that information, that evidence was completely ignored. So there's the first element of the deception on the Australian people. The second element is, OK, all right, we're building car parks because you know, they're popular and people seem to think that building car parks is a good idea. Who gets to decide where those car parks get to be? It, again, it's the, the coalition MPs whose marginal seats are at risk. Nobody else gets, to ask, gets asked where these car parks should be built. It's just the, the, the coalition MPs in their marginal seats. So we have ridiculous things. Again, you know, crazy to be building car parks to be trying to be solving congestion. Even more crazy to be building car parks in Brighton and in Camberwell and in other inner suburban areas where the last thing you want to be doing is to be encourage more people to be driving to the station. It is just total foolishness and goes against everything it, that is um, the basis of good urban planning. But that didn't matter because we had a government that decided here was a way that they could try and win a few votes. Here was a way that they could support the, the electoral outcomes, they could support the electoral campaigns of House of Representatives MPs whose seats were under a bit of threat. And yet, again, the Auditor General told us that this was what was going on. This was the reality of that total mismanagement of our taxpayers' money. But when we asked for the documents, they're not forthcoming. There's a public interest immunity claim put in on no justification at all. Suddenly, documents become cabinet documents because they were sort of just passed within you know, sniffing distance of the cabinet. And we here in the Senate, we try and get this information through order of production of documents, and this government just has the audacity to just say, no, I'm not giving it to you, um, Senate. It is just totally outrageous. It is just an absolutely typical of a government that is scared of transparency. It's scared of accountability because they are doing the most underhand so-called governance. They are just governing in the interests of their mates. That's what's going on. We need a federal anti-corruption commission to get to the bottom of this. We were told at our car parks inquiry two weeks ago that if we had had a federal anti-corruption commission, there was no doubt that this sort of behaviour was corrupt and that heads would roll if that had been the case. We know that's the reason why this government is not the slightest bit interested in bringing in a federal anti-corruption commission, that they've put it off again because they don't want to have the possibility of having something that's going to be holding them to account, to be actually making sure that we have processes that will run with, that are transparent and accountable. Instead, they are very happy with the way the situation is at the moment, that the Senate tries to get its information and we don't get the information. Our, op our orders for production of documents just get denied. Well, there is going to be a time when it's going to come that, that 
there are, there's going to be some responsibility. And sadly, we know that there isn't going to be any change from this government. That time of when we are going to, the, when it's actually going to, be, this government's going to be held to account is at the next election. Because there's only one thing for it, with a government that is so averse to transparency, so averse to accountability, so averse to putting in place the proper measures of decent, accountable government that is not correct. There's only one thing for it, and that is to kick them out. So I am looking forward so much to the election, to the next election, to see the back of this corrupt government, to see the back of them, and to be getting government that actually will be governing for the interests of the Australian public. Being no further speakers on this, the question is that the Senate takes note. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Being no committee memberships, we move to messages. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill of 2021 and two related bills for concurrence. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read the first time. The question is that be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill 2021, Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Regulatory Levies Bill 2021 and Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. Minister. Uh, I move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that uh, debate be adjourned. Those that have been say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Facilitation Bill of 2021 and the Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Consequential Amendments Bill of 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that had opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Facilitation Bill 2021, Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. Minister. Uh, I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. This leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thank you. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response No. 2, Bill of 2021. The Health Insurance Amendment, Enhancing the Bonded Medical Program and Other Measures Bill of 2021. And the Social Security Legislation Amendment, Remote Engagement Program Bill of 2021. Minister. Uh, I move these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response No. 2 Bill 2021, Health Insurance Amendment, Enhancing the Bonded Medical Program and Other Measures Bill 2021, and Social Security Legislation Amendment, Remote Engagement Program Bill 2021. Minister. Uh, thank you. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response No. 2 Bill 2021 and an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to the Social Security Legislation Amendment Remote Engagement Program Bill 2021 and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. So leave granted. Leave is granted, Minister. Uh, I move the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate 
that the House has agreed to the major sporting events, uh, protection and other legislation amendment bill of 2021 without amendments and of changes in the membership of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to six laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Clark. Business of the Senate Order of the Day number one, relating to a reference to the Environment and Communications References Committee. Senator Wish Wilson, remotely, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine, Senator Wish Wilson. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm in continuation, having spoken to this uh, roughly a month ago, and in that time that I was imploring the Senate to uh, support this reference to the Environment Communication Committee to look at the government's premeditated long-term lobbying to stop the Great Barrier Reef from being declared in danger by UNESCO. We've had the details uh, from the COP26 negotiations in Glasgow. And what we found out last week, Acting Deputy President, was through leaked documents, uh, the government attempted to make amendments uh, to recommendations to the delegation that all World Heritage sites be protected from 1.5 degree of warming, that all nations pledge to keep warming to 1.5 degrees to protect UNESCO World Heritage listed sites. Now, the leaked documents show that our government tried to remove that clause relating to 1.5 degrees. Now, why on earth would the Australian government, that is the custodian of this great natural wonder of the world, want to remove something as simple and fundamental to the future protection of the reef as limiting global warming to 1.5 degree above, two point, uh, above 2005 levels? This is what we signed up to uh, at the Paris Agreements. This is what was on display at Glasgow. Now, we know that our government managed to weaken the language around coal and uh, removing coal and phasing out coal. But what I want the committee to explore, Acting Deputy President, is not just uh, Minister Lay's recent jet setting off to lobby the World Heritage Committee uh, back in May this year, where she flew from country to country, uh, no doubt offering uh, deals, d dirty deals, to get the support of that, those committee members to support leaving UNESCO off the World Heritage in Danger list. But I'd like to examine the long-term premeditated push by this government that started back in 2016 to make sure that the Great Barrier Reef was never listed in danger from climate change uh, by UNESCO. Now, I chaired a, a select committee into the $444 million that was given to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, a small private foundation that was raising money from philanthropy to invest in projects restoring reef health, raising ad advocacy and awareness on the state of the Barrier Reef. Now, that was a very controversial grant $444 million, money that was going to go to other agencies, was suddenly being channelled through this small private foundation. And after taking evidence and significant evidence over many months in many locations, we were really none the wiser what the key motivation was by this government back in 2017-18 to give the money to this agency. It turns out that after I wrote as chair of that committee I wrote to the National Audit Commission that they look into this audit. It turns out that we found that the email that kicked off this entire process was around uh, wanting to avoid a World Heritage in Danger listing for the Great Barrier Reef. So 
$444 million to try and head off a World Heritage in danger listing or a process that could lead to that in danger listing. And here we are going into 2022, where since then the reef has suffered another two mass coral bleachings. People might not be aware, Acting Deputy President, but the Great Barrier Reef didn't see any mass coral bleachings from marine heat waves till 1998. There'd been a mass coral bleaching in Barbados uh, in the 1960s that was disputed by scientists at the time. But we had never seen global marine heat waves impact the Great Barrier Reef till 1998. And what we found was that a number of climate scientists who were warning about a future of mass coral bleachings and marine heat waves were shocked when in 2016 we had the biggest mass coral bleaching on record. 30% of the coral cover was lost on the Great Barrier Reef from that 2016 bleachings. And climate scientists told our committee, the Senate Environment Reference Communication Committee, in a separate inquiry into warming oceans. Scientists told that committee that they did not believe it was possible on the best climate models that we could get back-to-back -back mass coral bleachings till 2050. And that's exactly what we got in 2017. A back-to-back -back bleaching in 16 and 17. And then, as if we weren't shocked enough, we got another mass coral bleaching in 2019. That's four mass coral bleachings from marine heat waves in nearly 10 years. Plus we had storm damage from cyclones. We had pollution on the reef. We have invasive uh, crown of thorns starfish. So many cumulative pressures on the Great Barrier Reef. No one is in any doubt, except this government, that the future of the reef is in danger. The committee needs to examine why this government is so hell-bent on avoiding a World Heritage in danger listing. Now, I have my own theories, Acting Deputy President. If the Great Barrier Reef was to be declared in danger from climate change, which was the advice, uh, the scientific committee's advice to UNESCO that our government so ferociously lobbied to undermine, if the Great Barrier Reef was declared in danger from climate change, it would make it a lot harder for this government to continue to build new coal mines, because it would be required to have a plan for reducing Australia's emissions. As custodian of the reef, it would be required to take effective and drastic and radical climate action. It wouldn't be able to get away with being in the pocket of fossil fuel industries and approving giant massive gas projects like the Beetaloo Basin, a fracking project in the Northern Territory that has four times the carbon footprint of the Adani coal mine that increase our national emissions by 20 per cent, the equivalent of 68 years of our current carbon footprint in one project. Now, the Greens will be testing that, uh, the Chamber's support on whether we agree with that project going ahead later this year, but this is exactly the issue at heart here. Will this country, will Australia, as custodian of the Great Barrier Reef, this greatest natural wonder of the world, Will we take the climate action necessary and show the leadership necessary to secure the future of the reef for our kids? No matter what we do, even at 1.2 degree of global warming, we've already lost half the coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef. Unless we reduce our emissions by 75 per cent by 2030, our current business as usual emission scenario will put this nation and this world on three to four degrees of warming. If all the world doesn't act radically, that is the end of the Great Barrier Reef. That is the end of the world's great coral reefs as we know them. And that's another reason I think this government is so hell-bent on making sure the Great Barrier Reef is not declared in danger. Because the Great Barrier Reef is actually in better shape than many of the other world's UNESCO coral reefs. And of course, the government comes out and says, well, why aren't the other reefs being declared in danger? I have no doubt they will be if the Great Barrier Reef is declared in danger. But what stronger signal could we send? What louder siren call could we make than to declare the world's reefs in danger from climate change? That's what's going to be required to get action. 500 million people at least depend on the world's coral reefs for their livelihoods. Are we going to sit by while we cook 
the oceans while we go out and explore from all oil and gas in the ocean. Our government just opened up 80,000 square kilometres of Australia's oceans to new oil and gas exploration this year. 80,000 square kilometres at a time where the International Energy Agency says no more fossil fuel exploration from 2021. That's coming from a conservative International Energy Agency. This is the year we end all new fossil fuel exploration. This is directly linked to the fate of the Great Barrier Reef, and it needs to be exposed. So this inquiry reference before the chamber today is a very simple, short inquiry into the Great Barrier Reef and the World Heritage in Danger listing process. It is absolutely crucial that we pass this today, because on November 26, in Paris, the Australian government will be there lobbying the world again to take the Great Barrier Reef off any proposal for a, a World Heritage in Danger listing. No one denies the Great Barrier Reef is in danger except this government. Why push climate denial at such an important time in history? At a time when we're told by the United Nations that this is a code red for humanity. When a conservative politician like Boris Johnson says the world is at one minute to midnight if we don't act, what do we do? We try and convince the world that the world's largest coral reef system, 2,000 kilometres, can be seen from space, is not in danger from climate change. And UNESCO, the World Heritage Committee, should not list it in danger. Well, that's exactly what we should be doing, Acting Deputy President, if we actually want action on climate. No more climate denial. We need to take action. And action won't come while we're denying that what we are seeing unfold before our very own eyes is not happening. It is very real. It can't be swept under the rug because this government is in bed with fossil fuel interests because it takes donations from fossil fuel interests and it is doing whatever it can, whatever it can to silence the Greens and others out there that are lobbying for effective climate action. I urge the Senate to consider this reference and vote in support of it. There's never been a more important time than now to act. I'm happy to keep talking, if you want, Acting no, Deputy we President. We have heard quite enough. Thank you, Senator. Which will I'm sure your you time have. has expired. Senator McAllister, you have the call. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor supports this referral to inquire into the health of the Great Barrier Reef. The government, led by Mr Morrison, has a woeful record on reef protection. And the Morrison government needs to heed the warning from the World Heritage Committee considerations and dramatically improve its efforts to protect the reef. The international community is obviously concerned about the reef, and so are Australians. The reef supports 64,000 jobs. It produces billions of dollars in revenue in a non-COVID year. And it is one of the natural wonders of the world. It is an invaluable part of our world's natural heritage, and Labor wants it to remain that way. Australians know, I think they understand now, that the Morrison government's incompetence has brought the, brink, the, the reef to the brink. It is almost, it's on the threshold of being placed on the in danger list. Now, the government has had a temporary reprieve, so let's hope that that reprieve provides the impetus that they need to dramatically lift their game. But of course, like all things with this incompetent, tired, shambolic government, it's actually unclear what the government's attitude towards the reef is. Just weeks ago, the Minister for the Environment, Susan Lay, lauded the Queensland government's reef regulations to the World Heritage Committee decision makers. They were central to the temporary reprieve Australia received on the in-danger listing for the reef. But now, back home, Senator Macdonald, who Mr Joyce has recently had installed as special envoy for Northern Australia, has reportedly been saying she doesn't support the reef laws, those laws which are absolutely critical to protecting the reef and jobs in Northern Australia. So it's a pretty familiar story, isn't it? something we see time and time again. The Morrison government out there in the international community saying one thing 
at home saying the complete opposite. Liberals pulling in one direction, nationals pulling in the other. Who would know what they actually think about this? Who would know what they intend to do? Who could trust a single thing offered by this Prime Minister in relation to almost any public policy question that you can imagine? Because it is never about the actual public interest. It's never about the question that's in hand. It is always some slick political game, some nasty trade-off between internal warring parties. We are not well served by this process. And if there is any issue where the public interest, the national interest, the international interest, the interests of generations to come should be fore and centre of decision making, it's decision making about the reef. Australians haven't forgotten the last catastrophic decision, $443 million handed over to an ill-equipped private foundation in a backdoor deal with no tender. And the Morrison government has dragged and dragged its heels on the now overdue update to the Reef 2050 plan. We need a fair, transparent, objective assessment of reef health, consistent with the appropriate standards. Australians would be devastated by an endangered listing. Labor supports the referral. Having no further speakers, Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, the government makes no apologies for standing up for the national interest and defending our tourism industry, traditional owners, reef communities and 64,000 Australian jobs up and down the reef. We will continue to work with UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee to protect the long-term future of the reef and with the Queensland Government in ensuring that the strategies under the Reef 2050 plan are delivering the best possible outcomes for the reef. The World Heritage Committee's endorsement of Australia's position will give reef managers, marine scientists and land managers the ability to demonstrate the success of the outstanding work that is taking place across the reef. The procedures and decisions of the World Heritage Committee are all publicly available. So the question is that the reference to the Environment and Communication References Committee on the Health of the Great Barrier Reef be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No's have, have it. Division aye. required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. I'll just confirm that the whips are ready to go. Question is that the reference to the Environment and Communications References Committee be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell her for the eyes and Senator McGrath to tell her for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 23, noes 23, votes being equal. The question is resolved in the negative and we will return to government business. Clark. Government business order for day number one, security legislation amendment, critical infrastructure bill 2021, resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Thorpe. I'll just give senators a few moments to resume their seats. Senator Van, I believe you'll be in continuation, but please take your time. S Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. These assistance, assistance powers are necessary due to the current threats that we face and the expectations from the community that when Australia's national interests are under threat, the government will use its technical expertise to ensure essential services remain functioning. It is the government's ultimate responsibility to protect the availability of Australia's critical infrastructure, and it's crucial that the government has last resort powers to respond to the incidents or to mitigate the impact of attacks. While the government recognises that the industry should be the ones to respond to the vast majority of attacks, and cybersecurity incidents, there will be times when their skills and powers will not be enough. As a last resort, yeah, thank you. As a last resort, government assistance will enable the government to step in and protect critical infrastructure when industry is unable. These last resort powers may only be exercised when a cybersecurity incident has occurred, is occurring, or is imminent. The incident has, is having or is likely to have a relevant impact on a critical infrastructure asset. There is material risk that the incident has or is likely to seriously prejudice stability of Australia, its people or the defence of Australia or national security, or when no existing reg regulatory mechanism can be used to address the cyber attack. The government assistance powers are subject to ministerial authorisation powers in, and include the ability for the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs to give directions to a specified entity for the purposes of gathering information to determine if a further power should be exercised. The Secretary will also be able to provide directions to a specified entity requiring the entity do one or more things in response to the incident or make a request to the authorised agency to provide specified assistance 
and cooperation to respond. While these powers are significant, they are proportionate to the threat landscape that we face and are clearly defined and confined with a range of safe safeguards in place to ensure that they are used appropriately and only in the most serious circumstances. These safeguards include the need for powers to be exercised only when no existing regulatory mechanism can be used to address the cyber attack, mandatory consultation with the relevant entity except where consultation will frustrate the effectiveness of directions or requests, the intervention power uh, to only be authorised once the Minister for Home Affairs has sought agreement from the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence, mandatory notification to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security as soon as practicable of the authorisation, circumstances, actions, status and parties involved in each measure, Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, oversight of intelligence agencies' functions, the Commonwealth Ombudsman can investigate complaints made about actions of government agencies in the exercise of the government assistant measures, and annual reporting to Parliament on the use of these powers to ensure transparency and accountability to Parliament and the Australian public. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has backed the passage of these urgent reforms. The complex and persistent nature of these threats that our critical infrastructure faces means that we cannot sit and wait for a serious incident to occur before we act. The Morrison government is committed to protecting our national interests and ensuring that threats to our national security are mitigated so that our communities remain safe and our society continues to function. This bill is an important step in protecting our critical infrastructure from cyber security threats, making it essential that this bill be passed. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Van. I call Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill. Um, and of course, this is a bill that went to PJCIS, and I was pleased to have the opportunity to consider um, the bill as it was originally presented in that forum. <clears throat> I've been very grateful to be a member of that committee. Um, for much of the time in my parliament, first as a member and now as the deputy chair. And I did want to make a few general remarks about its operation and purpose before moving to the specifics of this bill. When this committee was first established uh, during the Hawke government, it was not without controversy. And indeed, it was actively opposed by many from the Liberal National Coalition who were then in opposition. I think it's fair to say that the value and importance of the PJCIS is now recognised across the aisle, and that's a good thing, because the inquiries that the committee undertakes allow for a deep and detailed policy consideration of the kind that's not always possible in other parts of the parliamentary system. There's an idea, I think, sometimes that the committee's work is done in secret, but that's actually a misunderstanding of how we work. In fact, much of what happens happens in public. And the deliberations and negotiations that we go through collectively as a committee when we're drafting our committee reports really do create the space for potential problems with laws to be identified and to be ironed out. And that open and honest dialogue lies at the heart of the work that's undertaken by the members of that committee and it is a source of enduring value. It's one of the reasons why Labor has sought to protect the operation of that committee and to continue to ask what is required to ensure it's able to do the work that the parliamentary requires, the parliament requires it to do. The workload of the committee has been especially high in recent years. And I would note that the work that we do as committee members is really only possible because of the assistance and expertise of the secretariat that assists us. And it is imperative that the parliament continue to properly resource that secretariat so that it is able to help produce detailed, thoroughly researched reports which can support the parliament in debates like this. We also need to ensure that the powers and operation of the PJCIS reflect the responsibilities that it has. 
This is an increasingly complex and significant national security policy area. I have a long-standing view that it is time to enhance the powers of the PJCIS. There are many more national security laws now than there were at the beginning of the century. And as the powers and capabilities of the intelligence community grows, it is appropriate that the oversight of those agencies grows also. Um, many of you will know that I have introduced in this place a private senator's bill, and that bill builds on the work of Senators Faulkner and Wong before me. The bill seeks to better align the governing legislation of PJCIS to its work uh, by implementing the recommendations of the 2017 Independent Intelligence Review. Nonetheless, the committee, as presently constituted and with its existing powers, as I've said, plays a really important role. And the culture is as important as the structure, and the report that informs the debate today is a product of a productive culture. Because, of course, the bill that was originally introduced looks quite different to the bill that is ultimately before us. And I wanted to talk through um, how we arrived at that position. The bill deals with an extremely important policy area. The threat of cyber-enabled attack and manipulation of our critical infrastructure is serious. It is considerable in scope and impact, and unfortunately it is increasing at an unprecedented rate. We do face increasing threats to essential services, to businesses and all levels of government. And in the past two years, cyber attacks have struck federal parliamentary networks, the health and food sectors, media and universities. And that's not just true here. It's a trend internationally. And it presents real challenges for policymakers, for governments, for operational agencies, because the solution cannot lie in government action alone. The, lo the solution can't lie in the creation of new criminal offences alone. The solution must lie in creating frameworks for cooperation between business owners and asset managers and government to ensure that we are protecting those assets that really underwrite uh, so many economic activities and social activities in the Australian context. Unfortunately, the first attempt of this bill really didn't get it right. So the original bill sought to introduce a, a very, very wide range of new measures, and, and that's fine. In fact, we do need to think carefully about how government and business will work together. But the approach taken by the government meant that the bill that first landed really did not get this right. As PJIS found, the threats to critical infrastructure are complex, they are serious, and they do demand a swift and comprehensive response. However, the consequence of moving in a way that was insufficiently consultative with industry meant that the first attempt meant that uh, it was unlikely to achieve the anticipated goal. And so it was on that basis that the committee unusually recommended that the bill in fact be split in two. And the committee said that uh, the government should prioritise the most urgent aspects of the bill in, in Bill 1, and that is to expand the sectors deemed systems of national significance, the additional reporting requirements for cyber incidents and new government assistance measures. And then the committee recommended that other things, more complex things, be deferred. Uh, and the main purpose of recommending deferral was to allow additional time for consultation. Because the overwhelming experience in uh, receiving the submissions, and we, we received about 100 submissions, was that industry felt that there had been insufficient consultation on the matter at hand. And there are a range of concerns. So, in particular, the delegation of significant decisions into delegated legislation rather than the primary legislation meant neither the parliament 
or the affected entities could really know the full impact, impost and cost of the legislation. This was incredibly significant for nearly all submitters. I'll point to one in particular. In a previous life, I had the very good fortune to work closely with um, many businesses in the Australian water sector. And I know that that sector is deeply concerned about, I guess, an all-hazards approach to managing threats to their infrastructure. Their submission was that the way that the legislation was drafted meant that they could not understand the threats uh, they could not understand the costs that would be likely to be imposed upon their businesses. And they were also concerned that the way that the government had approached um, defining the risk and threat architecture meant that it risked departing from the internationally accepted standards which are universally used throughout the water sector. It was kind of an interesting example because, of course, the businesses we are working, talking about are used to managing risk. Maybe not this risk, but certainly uh, risks presented by natural hazards. That's, your key, uh, th th that's a key factor if you're running a, a water infrastructure company or a water utility. And so their point in their submissions, and they were just one of many to the committee, was that they would prefer to have the mechanisms by which risk was assessed and organised um, better aligned with the international standards that they were already using. Now, these weren't the only concerns. There, there, there were a number of other concerns presented by industry. They felt that the notification timeframe for advising a relative authority of critical or other cyber security incidents were just too short and they were inconsistent with the existing guidelines. They were concerned that they might be directed to do things that would compromise their ICT systems. And of course, we know how valuable an ICT system is for a business. And it, this was particularly so for uh, the technology companies, those with global operations, just concerned or looking to be reassured that this core part of their business infrastructure wouldn't be negatively in, inter, in, affected by an inter, intervention from government. But the main issue was, as I said, regulatory complexity and the uncertainty associated with the cost of this legislation. And so it was on that basis that the committee recommended that the bill be split, and I commend my um, colleagues on that committee for taking that approach. Um, and so the bill that's before us really only deals with the most pressing aspects that were um, presented to us as, as essential by the agencies. It includes an expanded definition of critical infrastructure assets to include assets across 11 sectors. It now includes electricity, gas, water, ports, communications, financial services and markets, data storage and processing, the defence industry, higher education and research, energy, food and grocery, healthcare and medical, space technology, transport and water and sewerage. And that's appropriate. <coughs> it includes government assistance to relevant entities who, in response to significant cyber attacks. It requires a, mandat a mandatory notification of a cyber security incident um, within 84 hours. And it also provides an opportunity for oversight by PJCIS. The definition um, of a significant incident uh, has been tightened and improved, and it includes consultation requirements um, if there is uh, a ministerial authorisation um, to make sure that relative entities are informed in writing and are offered the opportunity to make a submission uh, within 24 hours after receiving an authorisation. And I'm pleased that the government did accept the committee's recommendation in this regard. Um, and I understand government will be proceeding to engage industry further on the additional components of the package that were not able to be presented in this legislation on this occasion. I just wanted to conclude by speaking briefly about democratic institutions and elections. In the list I just read out, they are not included uh, in this bill. I'm comfortable with that. But we need to understand that our democratic institutions should in fact be considered critical infrastructure. 
and we need to pay closer attention to the extent to which they are adequately protected from external threats. We know, because we have seen it overseas, that there are many, many instances of interference in democratic processes and in democratic infrastructure. It's not the same, in my view, as business infrastructure. These things are different. But we do need to have a much clearer indication from this government about how they intend to protect uh, democratic institutions and election infrastructure, and so far that really has not been forthcoming. I do note that the security agencies are aware of this. They speak about it when they are offered the opportunity to do so in public hearings. But what's needed is a strong leadership approach from government. We need to understand how an attempt to interfere in an Australian election would be handled, which agency would be responsible for taking the lead, which minister would be responsible for coordinating the approach, and if, the, if this occurred during a caretaker period, what would be the interaction with the opposition? Who would take responsibility for communicating about this in the public domain and to voters and to electors? These are all important questions, and at the moment they remain unanswered. The problem is that by not answering them, we create the opportunity for them to be answered in a hurry. And that is not a recipe for good policy making. These are things that are able to be anticipated, and in anticipating them, we should craft a response, preferably one that is shared on a bipartisan basis and actually reflects a shared commitment to protecting and nurturing our democratic arrangements. I am out of time, and so I will leave my remarks there. But Labor does support, um, does support this legislation, and again I thank my colleagues on PJCIS for the incredibly constructive way they approach this inquiry. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Abetz. Some little while ago I called for a national summit on cyber security to bring together the best and brightest from the private sector, public sector and academia to work together to provide the most focused possible protection for all of us against cyber attacks. The reason I made that call was because in the most recent Australian Cyber Security Centre's annual cyber threat report, we received an overview of the cyber threats affecting Australia, and it impacts all of us. In the 2020-21 financial year, the ACSC received over 67,500 cybercrime reports, an average of one every eight minutes, representing an increase of nearly 13 per cent from the previous financial year. Cybercrime reports submitted recorded total self-reported financial losses of more than $33 billion. Ransom demands by cyber criminals range from thousands to millions of dollars. Almost 500 ransomware-related cybercrime reports were received via the Report Cyber website, an increase of nearly 15 per cent compared to the previous financial year. Cyber criminals are moving away from the low-level ransomware operations towards extracting hefty ransoms from large or high-profile organisations. And to increase the likelihood of ransoms being paid, cyber criminals are encrypting networks and also exfiltrating data, then threatening to publish stolen information on the internet. This is just a bit of an insight as to the cyber threat that confronts us as a nation. In short, we have a problem, and these attacks are by organised crime and state players who seek to do us harm, serious harm. And so in this ugly and threatening environment, there is an absolute imperative for the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill of 2020. This government is committing 
committed to protecting our critical infrastructure to secure the essential services all of us rely on, everything from electricity and water to health care and groceries. The increasingly interconnected nature of critical infrastructure exposes vulnerabilities that could result in significant consequences to our security, economy and sovereignty. So the amendments to the legislation will ensure the government is well placed to assist entities responsible for providing critical infrastructure assets to respond to serious cyber attacks as the first step in strengthening of Australia's critical infrastructure security. The reforms outlined in the amended bill will strengthen Australia's ability to respond to serious cyber attacks on critical infrastructure in three ways. Firstly, by expanding the definition of critical infrastructure to include energy, communications, financial services, defence industry, higher education and research, data storage or processing, food and grocery, healthcare and medical, space technology, transport and water and sewerage sectors. Secondly, by introducing a cyber incident reporting regime for critical infrastructure assets. And thirdly, making government assistance available to industry as a last resort and subject to appropriate limitations. Government will be able to provide assistance immediately prior, during or following a significant cyber security incident to ensure the continued provision of essential services. Recent cyber attacks and security threats to Australian critical infrastructure make these reforms critically important to deliver and respond to the recommendations from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security to bring forward these elements as a priority. And for the record, with Senator McAllister and others that have spoken on this uh, bill, I serve on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and uh, commend my colleagues on the way that we have been able to deal with these matters in a bipartisan way putting forward suggestions to the government which thankfully have been adopted because our first concern and proper concern is the security of our fellow Australians and in relation to this uh, legislation ensuring that our essential or critical infrastructure is uh, protected as much as it possibly can be. So importantly, the legislation will enable the government to provide emergency assistance or directions immediately before, during or after a significant cyber security incident to mitigate and restore essential services. The community can be assured that any government powers will be subject to strong legislated safeguards and oversight mechanisms under very specific circumstances. And it's one of those things when debating and considering legislation of this kind that instinctively I don't like this government involvement, but what I dislike even more are the threats of the cyber attacks and seeing them being played out elsewhere. So attacks on our critical infrastructure require a joint response involving government, business and individuals, reflecting the inter interrelated nature of the threat. The government is already working in partnership with critical infrastructure entities to co-design sector-specific requirements to manage and respond to the risks. The Australian government will continue to work with those entities that are responsible to ensure that the second phase of reforms is implemented in a manner that secures appropriate outcomes without imposing unnecessary or disproportionate uh, regulatory burdens. And that is uh, where further discussions are now taking place and uh, the view of the committee was that those matters had not been uh, fully discussed and um, socialised with a sector, and I look forward to the outcome of that. Now, why are these reforms necessary? 
Well, while Australia has not suffered a catastrophic attack on critical infrastructure, we are not immune. And as a government, we are seeking to be proactive as opposed to responding to an incident. International cyber incidents, such as the ransomware attack on a US company, Colonial Pipeline, affected the distribution of fuel to customers on the east coast of the United States, which demonstrates the potential for attacks to cause devastating harm. Australia is facing increasing cyber security threats to essential services, businesses and all levels of government. In the past two years, we have seen cyber attacks on, on federal parliamentary networks, logistics, the medical sector and universities, just to mention a few. Internationally, we have seen disruptive cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, including water services and airports. Australia will not be and is not immune for those attempted attacks. Throughout 2019 and during 2020, Australia's critical infrastructure sectors were regularly targeted by malicious cyber actors seeking to exploit both victims and the crisis of COVID for profit, with a total disregard for the community and the essential services upon which they rely. For example, during the period, multiple regional hospitals were the victims of a cyber attack, and as a result, some health services to large regional communities, including surgeries, were disrupted. This has happened here. A major national food wholesaler was the victim of a cyber attack, which affected their systems and temporarily disrupted their ability to provide food to our fellow Australians at a time of unprecedented pressure on the food and grocery sector. A water provider had its control system encrypted by ransomware, which had the system not been restored quickly enough from backups could have disrupted the supply of potable water to a regional population hub, as well as having the potential to impact the economy, given the reliance of primary industry on this water supply. On 19 June 2020, the Prime Minister advised that the Australian government was aware that Australia's critical infrastructure was being targeted by a sophisticated state-based actor. Madam Acting Deputy President, the situation is unfortunately clear that there are elements within the wider world community, be it both criminal actors and state-based actors, that would seek to compromise the delivery of essential services to the Australian people. And that is why it is so important that this bill, seeking to protect the critical infrastructure of our nation. Um, and so this government has been proactive in this space, and whilst more work needs to be done on other elements of the initial bill, that which is being put to the parliament in this uh, legislation and which the Senate is being asked to pass is, on any assessment, vital, it's important, it's considered, and the support of the Australian Labor Party in that regard is uh, to be uh, commended. The other aspect of the bill, which is the incident reporting regime, uh, that needs uh, to be considered as well, because reporting cyber security incidents to the Australian Cyber Security Centre through the portal will help inform the government and uh, us as a nation, as a people, as to how to respond uh, to these elements. But, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, the approach taken by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has been, uh, to date, always a reasoned and considered approach where we seek to put uh, political differences aside as much as possible with a sharp focus on the security of our nation and ensuring the very best outcome. And so when we are confronted with 
criminal elements and state actors, and if they're state actors, I would suggest they are dealing in a criminal manner as well, seeking to impact our very way of life and the provision of essential services to our fellow Australians. It is right and proper for the government to seek to legislate in this space to provide security and support to ensure that our fellow Australians are protected as much as they possibly can. The provision of uh, ongoing oversight by the committee I think is important as well, and uh, the government has agreed to that, and that provides a bipartisan flavour to the oversight, because with these uh, powers that are given to government and government authorities, they are from time to time overused, if not abused, because there is a particular focus on one particular issue, and then you've got to balance those up with the other considerations which we in a liberal democratic society treasure and seek to protect. And so getting that balance right, I think, is vitally important, and that is why having the oversight uh, along with the committee is something which uh, I am pleased the government is uh, uh, willing to do. But uh, I commend the bill to the Senate. This is about protecting our fellow Australians in the best possible manner against those that seek to do us harm. And uh, I trust that this legislation, Madam Acting Deputy President, will be able to pass uh, before we break. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Betts. And I call Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020. While well, the pervasive threat of cyber-enabled attack and manipulation of critical infrastructure assets is a serious, considerable in scope and impact, and is increasingly at an unprecedented rate. Australia is facing an increasingly increasing cyber security threat to essential services, businesses and all levels of government. In the past few years, cyber attacks have struck federal parliamentary networks, the health and food sectors, media, universities and transport operators. And of course, you recall, may recall from only three months ago where the transport giant Toll Group had based on its strain operations um, that it had a series of attacks on its operations which had a very detrimental effect on its performance of its business. Internationally, cyber attacks have disrupted critical sectors including the United States, water and fuel supplies. It's important that Australia's critical infrastructure is protected from cyber attack. But the government first attempt at legislating such protection was a chaotic, uncoordinated and could not be supported, even by the government members of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and to their credit, those senators. The original bill expanded the definition of critical infrastructure coverage from four sectors electricity, gas, water and ports, to the following 11 systems of national significance communications, financial services and markets, data storage or processing, defence industry, higher education and research, energy, food and grocery, healthcare and medical, space technology, transport, water and sewerage. Introduced, they introduced uh, additional reporting requirements for the original bill for cyber incidents affecting critical infrastructure assets. The original bill introduced new government assistance measures to relevant entities for critical infrastructure sector assets in response to significant attacks, including cyber attacks. Introduced with additional positive security obligations for critical infrastructure assets, including a risk management program to be delivered through sector-specific requirements. As the PJCIS report noted, threats to critical infrastructure are often complex and serious, 
demanding a swift and comprehensive response. The PJCIS also found that the government attempt to introduce both the new government assistance measures and the new positive security obligations, sector-specific requirements in one bill, given the complexity of the latter, may end up achieving neither. With limited opportunity to pass legislation this year, the PJCIS recommended that the government prioritise the most urgent aspects of the bill in Bill 1. The expansion of the sectors deemed systems of national significance, the additional reporting requirements for cyber incidents, and the new government assistance measures. The committee recommended that the positive security obligations and sector-specific requirements be deferred to Bill 2, following additional consultation with industry. The committee also recommended that Bill 2, when introduced, be referred to the PJCIS again for another inquiry. That's certainly appropriate. The PJCIS inquiry received around 100 submissions and held multiple public hearings featuring dozens of expert and industry appearances. Most, if not all, companies and industry bodies, trade unions and critical infrastructure asset owners, and operators expressing some form of reservation with the bill. Its consultative development, the unknown or unquantified regulatory impact, or the contem contemporaneous rules development that has occurred in parallel with the committee's review. Key concerns heard by the committee included the significant detail left to be resolved by sector-specific rules in delegated legislation instead of in the primary legislation meant neither the parliament nor the affected entities could know full impact, impost and the cost of the legislation. Notification timeframes for advising the relevant authority of any critical or other cyber security incident within 12 and 72 hours respectively were too short and inconsistent with existing guidelines. Many companies were concerned that they would be directed to do actions that would, intentionally or otherwise, cause compromise in their ICT systems, particularly sophisticated technology companies and those with global operations where concerned that the ASD could not understand and would therefore cause harm to their systems. Across all sectors, the committee heard about growing regulatory complexity and duplication causing confusing and compliance costs, particularly in relationship to sector-specific recommendations. Unions raised that potential secu positive security obligations could include expanded personal security checks. Many stakeholders felt the consultation process by the department was poorly promoted, the process too rapid, and, and that input and concerns and feedback was not acknowledged or addressed. Considering the significance and complexity of the consistent issues raised by the bill, a lack of tangible suggestions to address these government and the department, and the depth of disagreement between stakeholders and the department, the committee felt any attempt to resolve these concerns with a single bill would unduly delay its time-critical elements. Instead, the bill amended by the government and discussed here only introduced the most pressing elements of an enhanced cybersecurity framework. These are an expanded definition of critical infrastructure assets to include assets across 11, the 11 sectors I've just mentioned, government assistance to relevant entities for critical infrastructure sector assets in response to significant cyber attacks, mandatory notification requirements of a cybersecurity incident by an entity to a relevant Commonwealth body to allow for the, uh, for the written report to be made within 84 hours instead of 48 hours of an oral report being made, and to empower a relevant Commonwealth body to exempt an entity from the requirement to provide a written report. PJCIS oversight arrangements, whereby the Secretary is required to give a written report for the, to the PJCIS as soon as practicable after a government assistance measure is directed or requested, detailing the circumstances, actions, status and parties involved relevant to any cybersecurity incident. 
The PJCIS review of the operation, effectiveness and implications of the security of critical infrastructure legislative framework in the Act to begin not less than three years from when the bill receives royal assent. Reporting obligations, including that draft rules relating to the mandatory reporting obligations, be provided directly to any entities which would reasonably be impacted by the draft rules. And the minister must formally respond to any submissions made by responsible entities. Now, a definition of significant impact as a cybersecurity incident will have a significant impact if the incident has materially disrupted the availability of essential goods or services provided using the asset or any of the circumstances specified in the rules ex exist in relationship to the incident. Now, the consultation requirements in relation to a ministerial authorisation under new section 35AD, if consultation is required to inform relevant entities in writing and invite them to en those entities to make a submission within 24 hours after receiving the draft authorisation. An example of where a person is not entitled to cause access, modification or impairment of computer data or a computer program, being that if, if a person, including employees or agents of a responsible entity, exceeds their authority, then this will amount to such unauthorised access, modification or impairment for the purpose of the Act. Now, the government has accepted the committee's conclusions that significant engagement, consultation and work is required to achieve workable, positive and enhanced cyber security obligations and sector-specific rules, and will defer those aspects to a forthcoming Bill 2, expected in 2022. The committee also made two recommendations relating to democratic institutions and elections. Now, the government reviewed the risks to democratic institutions, particularly from foreign-originated cyber threats, with a view to developing the most appropriate mechanism to protect them at federal, state and local levels. Now, the government reviewed the processes and protocols for classification briefing for the opposition during caretaker periods in response to serious cyber incidents and considered the best practice principles for any public announcement about those incidents. The government has not yet responded to these recommendations. While they are important recommendations, they are not directly relevant to Bill 1. In a dynamic and changing cyber threat environment, it is crucial that Australia's technical authority, the Australian Signals Directorate, is empowered to assist entities in responding to significant cyber security incidents to secure critical infrastructure assets. These are last resort powers, and affected entities will undoubtedly retain their reservations. In supporting the legislation, Labor is relying on the intention stated in the bill and as given by the department and agency heads that these powers will only be used as a last resort. With this in mind, it is very important to emphasise that the PJCIS will be notified and briefed each time the government enacts this power and will conduct a full review of the legislation when additional critical infrastructure reforms are introduced by the government. In evidence provided to the committee, witnesses overwhelmingly indicated their willingness to cooperate with ASD. Government assistance powers would only be needed in the event that an affected entity is unwilling or unable to respond appropriately. Thus, these measures should only be needed rarely, if at ever. And in the instance that there is disagreement between an entity and an ASD in the best course of action, this bill incorporates the committee's recommendation to include safeguards that required the minister to consider multiple impacts and current responses. The government has conceded more, than more work needs to be done in communicating, consulting and responding to concerns regarding its proposed positive security obligations for critical infrastructure sectors. These are important initiatives and they need to be done properly. As I mentioned uh, before regarding the tolls incident, you know, the critical effect on businesses is, is um, um, regarding uh, any bill in this area uh, needs to be fully considered. One of the things that was raised very clearly by um, some of the other industry bodies, um, by the Australian Investment Council, said that the new laws were a threat to Australia's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic as they were first drafted, as they had the potential to impede the ability of Australian businesses 
access to vitally important foreign funding. The Business Council of Australia said the new laws would jeopardise Australia's economic, as I first proposed, economic prosperity and discourage foreign investment. It said that the new powers would affect users in directions outside of Australia, jurisdictions outside Australia, and it's not clear how they will interact with the requirements that are relevant in the US and European laws, such as privacy statutes. These are critical questions that were raised by the business community, but also by the trade union movement, um, the potentially forcing food and distribution workers, centre workers, apprentice electricians and nurses, the workers who have carried, up, car carried us through the pandemic, to comply with the lengthy security checks is a massive drain on the economy and assault on the right to privacy that every Australian should be able to enjoy, um, the Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions said, uh, Ms McManus. She went on further to say that the elements of this bill, which could place additional requirements on ordinary working people, will do nothing to strengthen the national security and will only create the problems of the working people, the agencies asked to enforce it and the Australian economy. They should be removed from the bill. And of course, we now see the bill broken up into two, um, Bill 1 and Bill 2, which is critically important to get a speedy uh, action on those matters which have um, uh, uh, broader support in the Senate. In a submission to the inquiry, Qantas said that the financial implications of implementing the reforms may create a significant financial burden for some businesses, including its own. And again, those uh, impacts need to be considered in any proposition of the bill. But just in my last 20 minutes, I just want to just raise one thing that is always important to national security and this government failed to do. And that is that we have thousands of overseas uh, seafarers coming in without appropriate security checks. It's about time the government stepped in to do something there as well. Thank you, Senator Shilder. I call Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to address the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill of 2020, uh, noting that the government has brought in some amendments. Um, I'm, like some of my colleagues, also a member of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. I uh, have been for a number of years, and uh, this is probably one of the first times where I have seen uh, the agencies get to the point where they haven't done sufficient consultation uh, with industry. But it's an example, I think, of where this committee is very effective in that on a bipartisan basis uh, we're able to work with agencies, industries, get an understanding of where things sat and hence the recommendation to split the bill which many of my colleagues have talked about. Uh, they have also talked about some of the particular measures in the bill. So what I plan to do with the time I have available here is to give people who may be listening to this debate, debate a little more background on some of the emerging trends overseas and also here in Australia and to particularly look at some of the evidence that was provided to the committee uh, by Ms Noble, who heads up ASD, uh, because I think that really speaks to the heart of why these step-in powers are required, and we do need to get this right uh, with industry. The first one I'd like to go to uh, actually took place in Ukraine in 2015. And the reason I talk about this particular cyber attack is it is the first time experts believe there has been a large-scale grid-level attack that has been successful uh, on a, a modern nation. So the control centres of three Ukrainian electricity distribution companies were remotely accessed uh, and they opened the breakers at some 30 distribution substations in Kiev and a western region, causing more than 200,000 consumers to lose power. Now, in this case, the hackers gained entry uh, through sophisticated spear phishing campaign and used a black energy malware to cause havoc in Ukraine. Uh, governments and cybersecurity companies have attributed the hacks to Russian groups uh, with suspected, albeit not proven, and unclear links to the Russian government. Uh, now, this has occurred on the back of the 2014 uh, incursion, if you recall, not only the annexation of Crimea, but the incursion uh, by Russian-supported forces in the eastern part of Ukraine. And uh, many people believe that um, this 
area of Ukraine has become a bit of a playground for uh, Russia and other actors to test essentially their capabilities in the cyberspace. Uh, in 2017, there was a, a subsequent hack uh, that broke into thousands of Ukrainian networks by sabotaging a fairly widely used piece of software, and that attack disabled around 10 per cent of computers in Ukraine and inflicted financial costs to about 0.5 of a per cent of Ukraine's GDP. So if you think about what 0.5 per cent of our GDP would mean here in Australia, that's a significant, uh, significant amount of money. So a number of uh, companies and foreign governments, in fact, have looked to help Ukraine, uh, freeing up aid and other investment to try and boost uh, their ability for cyber security. Latvia has also uh, experienced uh, crises there. And the most recent ones probably are the two in the states that have made uh, the media. One is the solar winds cyber attack, uh, and that's one of the most sophisticated and large-scale cyber operations that's ever been identified. Uh, the US government stated the operation was an intelligence gathering effort, and uh, they've attributed it to an actor that is most likely Russian in origin. Uh, the president of Microsoft, uh, said it was the largest, most sophisticated attack the world has ever seen, and it affected federal agencies, courts, the private sector, state and local governments across uh, the US. The more recent one uh, in May this year uh, was the attack and shutdown of one of the US's major pipelines uh, that supplied fuel infrastructure. Uh, and so they stole data from the company, uh, as well as demanding a large ransom uh, to get things going again. So that's on the global scene. You can see that actors are using cyber means to impact uh, critical infrastructure, either for criminal intent in terms of money or for uh, espionage in terms of stealing uh, money or from a, a grey zone tactic technique in terms of undermining the community's confidence and potentially diminishing a nation's capacity to control uh, its own defence when you lack things like electricity or communications. More recently, uh, starting to involve Australia, uh, in July of this year, Australia, the European Union, the United Kingdom, the United States, for the first time attributed publicly uh, that a attack that affected some 30,000 businesses around the world involving ransomware and IP theft, uh, they attributed that to the Ministry of State Security of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the threshold for attribution is quite high, uh, but what that indicates is that when the strategic update of 2021 uh, talks about the fact that grey zone activities are increasing, uh, we are seeing very tangible examples of that uh, here in Australia. And the consequences of disruptions in our digital systems uh, are quite extreme, not only from those obvious blockages or thefts, but we've seen a couple of failures uh, just in the aviation industry, uh, not necessarily attributable to malware or cyber attack, but it gives an indication of how that could be used to significantly disrupt the normal operations of a country. And uh, just one here in Australia, uh, when the ticketing system for Virgin globally went down, we saw massive delays uh, of travel around Australia uh, due to that ticketing and freight and, and luggage loading system going down. And so it doesn't take too much to, as you compare what happened through COVID, the, the impact when passenger flights weren't flying, on trade, on services such as mail, banking, etc., uh, for the movement of notes and other things around the country, uh, those can have significant impacts by attacks on critical infrastructure where they fail. So at the heart of the contention in this bill uh, were concerns by industry around the step-in powers that were proposed by the original bill. And I think it's really instructive to go to the evidence provided by Ms Noble, uh, the head of ASD, because a lot of people have indicated that industry cooperates. And that's acknowledged, and in fact, that is the vast majority of 
players in Australia, whether they be state governments or the private sector. Uh, so to quote here some evidence from ASD during the inquiry, Ms Noble said, we do have some wonderful examples of incredible cooperation. You might recall that in 2019 there was a significant impact of ransomware against the Victorian health system. That's a good example. We have a close relationship with the Victorian government and they also had a private incident response provider. So this was a terrific example of state government, federal government and private sector working together. Good looks like this. They contacted us so we were able to work with them. They provided us with technical information for their networks like logs and images of disks. That happened on day one. Within 24 hours, we sent incident responders on the ground to work side by side with the Victorian government and the private entity impact, their private service provider and staff from the Australian Cyber Security Centre. We were able to fully map the network quickly and identify the nature of the criminality. And so that's an example ASD provided of how things can, often do and should work for the benefit of the Australian people. But Ms Noble went on to say, and I quote, bad looks like this, and this is a real example, but I'm not going to give names because that's really important. We found out something happened because there were media reports. Then we tried to reach out to the company to clarify if the media reports were true, and they didn't want to talk to us. We kept pushing. Sometimes we have to use our own very senior level contacts, sometimes through people who might know members of boards or chairs of boards, to try and establish trust and build a willingness to cooperate. At times we spent nearly a week negotiating with lawyers about us being able to even just obtain basic information that I described in the first scenario, asking, can we please just have some data from your network that we might be able to help by telling you quickly who it is, what they're doing and what they might do next. In this case I'm referring to, and I'm still quoting here from Ms Noble, five days later we were still getting very sluggish engagement and we were trying to get them to provide data to us and deploy some of our tools so that we could work out what was happening on their networks. That goes on for 13 days. This incident had a national impact on our country and on day 14 we were only able to provide them with generic protection advice and their network was still down. Three months later, they got reinfected and it all started again." End quote. So it's important to understand that when we talk about step-in powers, we're talking about scenarios like that where, with good cooperation, you see that there is a seamless working together side by side with people helping each other out and you get quick resolutions of these incidents which can be damaging to Australia's ability to run a effective, free, first world nation and the services that Australians depend on. But where, for whatever reason, a commercial provider chooses not to engage with ASD and the flow and effects are going for days, if not weeks, and impacting on Australia's and Australia's capabilities, then it's appropriate that ASD is given the legal authority to step in to work still with, not against, but with that provider because of the obligations for them to, to report and to cooperate. It's important to understand that the threat environment is deteriorating. There's been a 60 per cent increase in ransomware attacks against Australian entities between last year and this year. We see both state-based actors and criminals acting against Australian entities. They're motivated by a range of imperatives from espionage to generating influence to interference to preparing to or actually disrupting, degrading or denying services. And some, as I've said, purely have the motivation of stealing money. There's also a broader economic cost. Some of the evidence, again, from ASD was that OSCYBER have estimated that the significant cyber attack against Australia could cost around $30 billion and 160,000 or so jobs. And so that's ASD and industry's assessment of what a cyber attack, a significant cyber attack here in Australia that is sustained could be. And that's why these measures are important. 
It's interesting that just over one-third of all incidents that have been reported to ASD, the Cyber Security Centre, over the past 12 months were related to critical infrastructure. And the assessment is, because that reporting is currently voluntary, that that's only a fraction of what has probably occurred. Uh, hence the requirements, not only for the step-in powers, but also uh, for the reporting you know, within the 12 hours if it's a critical and significant uh, event. So in the advisory report on this Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill of 2020, uh, the committee has recommended that the emergency powers be swiftly legislated in a standalone bill with a second separate bill to be introduced after further consultation. And this two-step approach which the government has agreed to and we're now dealing with today will enable the quick passage of laws to counter the looming threats against Australia's critical infrastructure while giving businesses and government the additional time to do the co-design work on the most effective regulatory framework to ensure the long-term security of our critical infrastructure. Uh, as other colleagues have mentioned, uh, our committee, the PJCIS, made 14 recommendations in relation to the bill. We received compelling evidence that the complexity and frequency of cyber attacks on critical infrastructure is increasing globally. Australia is not immune. There's clear recognition from government and industry that we need to do more. And this first bill, Bill 1, uh, is to expand the critical infrastructure sectors that are covered by the Act to introduce government assistance measures to be used as a last resort in crisis scenarios, as well as mandating reporting obligations. And I encourage senators to support the bill. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator Fiera Venti Wells. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Over quite some years, I have repeatedly spoken about the national interest and our national sovereignty in reducing our dependency on the communist regime in Beijing. As part of this, I have continued to stress how vital it is that we overhaul our critical infrastructure and foreign investment framework. This includes expanding the parameters of national interest to ensure we protect our national sovereignty. We need to look at practical ways to protect that sovereignty, starting with the Port of Darwin. Post-pandemic, we need to debate some difficult issues, including a clear direction on how we will ensure that we do not place ourselves in the same circumstances. To date, critical infrastructure ownership has been regrettably restricted to ports and utilities assets like gas, water and electricity. Notwithstanding, many of our critical assets, like the Port of Darwin, are in the hands of entities with close ties to Beijing. I have been calling for critical infrastructure legislation to be strengthened to expand the coverage of this legislation to more sectors, including banking, finance, food, grocery, agriculture, health and medical, transport, data, communications and IT and airports. Indeed, the Bill's Digest for the Security of Critical Infrastructure Bill 2017 noted that several stakeholders had suggested that the legislation should apply to additional sectors, including those that I have been advocating for. Regrettably, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, which inquired into the bill in March 2018, was satisfied that additional sectors did not need to be included. However, it recommended that the government review and develop measures to ensure that Australia has a continuous supply of fuel to meet its national security priorities and, as part of that process, should consider whether critical fuel assets should in future be made subject to the measures of the bill. I am pleased that finally the PJCIS has come to the realisation that it made a mistake, including about critical fuel assets, and that the Morrison government has finally worked out that protecting Australia's critical infrastructure to secure the essential services that all Australians rely on, everything from electricity and water to healthcare and groceries, is long overdue. It seems to have finally dawned on the Morrison government, despite the many warnings, that the increasingly interconnected nature of critical infrastructure exposes vulnerabilities that have, I believe, already resulted in significant consequences to our security, economy and sovereignty. The PJCIS reported on the SCI bill in September 2021. The government has followed the advice of the committee and split the bill. Bill number one addresses three components. 
Firstly, the reforms outlined in the amended bill will strengthen Australia's ability to respond to serious cyber attacks on critical infrastructure by expanding the definition of critical infrastructure to include energy, communications, financial services, defence industry, higher education and research, data storage or processing, food and grocery, healthcare and medical, space technology, transport and water and sewerage sectors. Secondly, the bill introduces a cyber incident reporting regime for critical infrastructure assets. And thirdly, it makes government assistance available to industry as a last resort and subject to appropriate limitations. Government will be able to provide assistance immediately prior, during and following a significant cyber security incident to ensure the continued provision of essential services. Recent cyber attacks and security threats to Australian critical infrastructure make these reforms critically important to deliver. The objects of the SCI Act are to improve transparency and to facilitate cooperation and coordination between the various levels of government in Australia. The aim of this is to allow information to be collected so that risks that may exist within current structures can be readily understood and managed. Whilst these changes are overdue, as I have also advocated, we should look at expanding restrictions that could be imposed to prevent acquisition, lease, etc., by entities, whether Australian owned or controlled, or with foreign directors or directors with dual nationalities, taking over Australian businesses or companies, including look looking at reciprocity of ownership. There seems to be no legal or constitutional reason to prevent the SCI Act from being expanded to cover the subject of ownership as well as its current subject areas. I note the comments of the committee regarding the overall review of the Act and how it will now be undertaken more effectively after the passage of Bill 1. Can I also reiterate another concern that was raised by the committee in its report regarding the unknown regulatory burden of positive security obligations on industry? In submissions to the committee, an overwhelming concern from industry representatives was the unknown nature of the majority of the regulatory impact or burden to be imposed by the proposed new provisions. While the bill outlines and defines the types of obligations and some of the elements of those obligations that industries will have to comply with, most of the detail of what businesses will have to do and by what means is not prescribed in the bill. This detail is proposed to be designed and outlined in rules to be presented in delegated legislation. Without certainty regarding definitions and regulatory requirements, affected industries cannot plan for the potential impact and cost of the framework's requirements. As chair of the Senate Standing Committee on the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, this bill highlights yet again the propensity of the executive to relegate important obligations to delegated legislation. I welcome the committee's comments at paragraph 2.61 of its report. While this process of designating rules outside of the legislation is identified as providing for flexibility and consultation, most industry submitters expressed a preference for this detail to be included in the primary legislation or that detail to be negotiated and provided in instruments to be considered alongside an amending bill before the framework be considered and passed through parliament. Indeed, at paragraph 3.6, the committee, the committee actually goes on to assert that the significant detail left to be resolved by sector rules in delegated legislation instead of in the primary legislation does not allow the committee, the parliament or the affected entities sufficient confidence of the full impact of the legislation. I now turn to other concerns. The, the committee examines the threat to be countered, noting that the threat of cyber security and vulnerability and malicious cyber activity has become increasingly evident in recent years. <clears throat> when outlining these threats and, increasing challenge, uh, and the increasing challenge of preparing, hardening and countering assets, Mr Mike Pizzullo, AO, Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs, stated, Basic cyber security protections will always help, but malicious actors such as cyber criminals, state-sponsored actors and state actors themselves will defeat the best defences that firms, families and individuals can buy. We have to do what we can, of course, to defend our own networks and devices against known vulnerabilities. The bill presupposes that any attack would come from external forces, but what if the threat comes from within the entity? What concerns me 
are the number of companies and subsidiary companies of overseas state-owned entities that operate across a broad spectrum of our economy, but more pertinently the number that have majority or part ownership of key critical assets. As the committee points out in its report, the application of asset definition only to assets that are located within Australia further confuses the potential application to digital elements of critical infrastructure that have parts of their functional infrastructure or data located offshore. As I have reiterated in speeches in this place, um, which uh, explore the legal contours of particularly uh, Chinese-controlled investment in Australia. In a paper uh, that I have previously cited by Professors Roman Tomasic and senior lecturer Ping Zhong, uh, that paper stated that in 2003 China established the State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission, which, Commission, which oversees state shares in major SOEs. That paper states that in 2016 there were 66 major Chinese SOEs with a presence across, in Australia across most industry sectors. Of these, 39 were centrally controlled with 130 subsidiaries. The other 29 were provisionally controlled with 84 subsidiaries. Now We know that for Chinese companies, corporate governance is limited. Rather, they are subject to cor corporate social responsibility norms underpinned by Article 19 of Chinese of China's company law, which requires um, that uh, the Communist Party of China have its operatives um, embedded in their organisations to carry out their activities. They are, the CCP is front and centre of SOEs, irrespective of whether they operate inside or outside China. Now, furthermore, and probably more, most significantly, is the issue of Australian business, businesses carried on by or land acquired from government, be that Commonwealth, state, territory or local government, not being subject to foreign acquisition procedures under the FATA Act, except if proposed to sell to a foreign government investor and if the subject of the sale was public infrastructure. Now, a foreign government investor includes foreign governments, state-owned corporations and corporations in which a foreign government or separate government entity alone or together with one or more associates hold a substantial interest. Now, this exemption afforded to acquisition of land or business from governments is very troubling given the nature of the pronouncements by Premier Dan Andrews in Victoria and his Belt and Road Initiative plans, um, as well as the extent of the reach of agreements between China and Premier McGowan's WA government. This is the critical point that must be considered. The Commonwealth can regulate activities of governments only if there is a constitutional head of power that allows it to do so. And in broadening any national security test, consideration of the removal of the exemption relating to governments will be a critical test of the government's political fortitude in effecting real change. Hence, unless we remove that exemption so that all acquisitions by foreign entities are subject to scrutiny and the national interest test, we will not address the elephant in the room, namely investment by the CCP and its entities in Australia, especially in strategic assets. There has not, as far as I know, been any update to this listing. There is no public listing of PRC companies or PRC invest invested projects in Australia. Now, the most accurate um, source of this is the PRC itself, um, but of course um, uh, the PRC investment and corporate presence in Australia, to some extent, uh, is held within Treasury. Now, these figures are not publicly uh, available and are often simply approvals rather than records of actual investments. Um, China, of course, has, as I've said, the obvious best figures, but they are not publicly available. Um, China has um, established a Chamber of Commerce in Australia to oversee the, uh, oversee the activities of its state-owned entities, both national and provincial. And this body is highly influential, given it represents the owners of many billions of dollars. And it branches right across, as I have said, across the broad spectrum of energy, aviation, foreign relations, financial, um, industry sectors, legal, um, you name it, they're there. 
the massive financial power and thus influence of this body on Australian companies and governments has not yet fully been appreciated. It is time that the public is made aware of the corporate reach of these PRC SOE companies, and this includes details of what government agencies know of their holdings and activities. A public database of Australian assets owned by Chinese entities or other state-owned uh, other um, state-owned uh, entities or, com uh, or countries with state-owned entities who own assets would be an informative national resource for economic and security purposes, but to my knowledge such a database does not exist. Accordingly, I found the recent ABC program on the Pandora Papers on 4 October to be very inform a very informative program. Indeed, it reaffirmed my concerns raised in the Senate with respect to foreign investment matters. I do not normally agree with Senator Wish Wilson, but I do agree there should be a public beneficial owners register. Indeed, I am on the record urging the government to establish a register so that Australians can and indeed they should know about foreign ownership of assets in Australia. All Australians are entitled to know who, to know who owns what in their country, especially who owns those critical assets uh, which are vitally important if um, attacks, and in particular attacks from within, happen. So therefore, Amendments to the uh, SCI Act are the first step in strengthening Australia's critical infrastructure security, but there is, I fear, a lot more work still to be done. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Fiorabenti Wells. Sen Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill 2021. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to do so, having chaired the inquiry into the legislation. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security tabled its report out of session, so I'll speak to our recommendations as well as to this bill. Uh, at the outset, I thank my fellow members of the PJCIS, in particular the former Deputy Chair, Mr Byrne, and the Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Keneally, for the constructive and bipartisan way they worked with me and Liberal colleagues on the committee for our report and its recommendations. Every 32 minutes, a critical infrastructure asset suffers a cyber attack, both by state and non-state actors. COVID-19 has seen a shift to even more of our lives online, deepening our reliance on digital systems to navigate life and business like never before. Throughout the pandemic, the total reported cyber attacks in Australia increased by 13%. Many Australians are familiar with the criminal ransomware gangs and their for-profit motives in launching cyber attacks to extort economic advantage for themselves personally. These are serious and ever-present threats to the cybersecurity of our businesses, large and small, as well as individual Australians. Recent high-profile attacks against JBS Foods, the Nine Network and the Colonial Pipeline powerfully illustrate the broader cost to our economy of these tactics. However, the trend which focused the mind of PJCIS members the most on the urgent challenge facing us is the involvement of nation states who use the cyber realm as a new frontier to threaten our security, our sovereignty and our freedom. Our cyber challenges are increasing in complexity as a result of the evolving security environment in the Indo-Pacific region. Grey zone tactics, which lie between peace and war, where foreign states use cyber intrusion and digital espionage, among other tools, to threaten our interests, are increasingly being relied upon, particularly by authoritarian states. Independent experts who appeared before the PJCIS told us that it was likely that foreign state actors are already pre-positioned on sensitive networks and that that presence could be activated against our interests as a prelude to a regional crisis. ASIO Director-General Mike Burgess recently confirmed this fear as part of his annual report to the parliament, reaffirming the very real and serious risk we face as a nation and the urgent need to respond decisively. Given how interconnected our digital systems are, it is not very difficult to imagine the society-wide consequences if our, for example, financial system was shut down or if our food supply chains were suddenly disrupted. 
This would be debilitating not only for individual Australian citizens, but for our country and particularly for our ability to project power into the region. With the evolving cyber threat, it is clear that the digital world is the new battlefield, and Australia, along with our critical infrastructure service providers, needs to be armed to respond. The recent public attribution by Australia and many of our allies of the Microsoft Exchange attack to the Chinese government and its agents is a concrete and recent example of, its danger, of this danger. It also highlights how there's not always a clear distinction between state and non-state actors when it comes to cyber threats, with the Australian Signals Directorate Rachel Noble telling the PJCIS that the Chinese government effectively propped open the doors of businesses around the world to enable cyber theft and extortion to take place by criminal actors. It is worth noting in passing that there is a very high technical and political threshold for attributing cyber attacks. So the decision to do so in this instance by so many countries, including the European Union, NATO, all of the Five Eyes members and Japan is a significant one. There have of course been other high profile attempted and successful cyber intrusions, which have not been publicly attributed, uh, including against this parliament, against our political parties and to the Australian National University. There is a clear recognition from both government and industry that we need to do more to protect our nation against these sophisticated cyber threats. Our security agencies urgently need emergency powers to defend us from these threats. Of equal importance, however, is the need for critical infrastructure providers themselves to harden their own defences against this attack and to protect the essential services that we all rely upon. They have an obligation to do so not just to protect their employees, their shareholders and their customers, but in the national interest. The PJCIS has considered this bill over the past year and over four public hearings and with 88 submissions, also supplemented by classified briefings from security agencies on the threat environment. The challenge that the committee faced in this inquiry was to find an appropriate balance between, on the one hand, what has been clearly demonstrated as an urgent need for the emergency intervention powers and the legitimate concerns from industry that additional regulation could impose a financial burden and particularly to do so at a time that is sensitive for our economy as we recover from the pandemic. In 14 recommendations, the committee has advised the government to adopt a two-step approach towards strengthening Australia's critical infrastructure against cyber attacks in particular. Uh, this two-step approach would give our security agencies the emergency tools they need to counter the urgent cyber threats in one bill, while giving industry additional time to finalise the co-design process of additional security obligations in a collaborative way uh, with the government. The committee has recommended that the government legislate in this first bill those last resort intervention powers for the Australian Signals Directorate, the expansion of a, the number of sectors captured by this legislation from four to 11, and the enhanced cyber incident reporting obligations. The proposed government amendments to uh, the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020 bill do just that. The committee proposed immediate passage for these three key provisions and the associated enabling clauses because they were the most urgent and essential and because the other clauses of the bill, while still important, attracted the most concern during the inquiry process. I do acknowledge that while the broadest concern aired in the inquiry related to the positive security obligations recommended to proceed in a second bill after further consultation, that there was opposition to the emergency assistance powers and in particular from the tech sector. These are extraordinary powers. And while the committee did understand the desire on the part of the tech sector for their use to be judicially reviewable, given the clearly stated intention of the government for them only to be used in crisis scenarios, we did not think it was workable or desirable for these issues to be litigated in the courts in the event of a major national emergency. Instead, the PJCIS has recommended that it is notified of any use of these powers and that we be briefed on the circumstances of their use. This will allow the committee, on behalf of the parliament, to ensure they genuinely are only used as a last resort, as the government has outlined. 
The government is carefully considering the rest of the committee's recommendations, and I want to thank the government, and in particular the Minister for Home Affairs, Karen Andrews, for its engagement with the committee and for the implementations of our recommendations so far, which is reflected in this amended bill that we are debating today. I'd also like to thank the Director General of the Australian Signals Directorate, Rachel Noble, and the head of the Australian Cyber Security Centre, Abigail Bradshaw, for their candid engagement with the committee and the vitally important work that they do in combating these serious threats to our country. And it's my hope that, equipped with these powers and ultimately the passage of the second bill, that uh, these key agencies are able to work with industry to effectively combat these threats. The emergency reforms outlined in the amended bill will strengthen Australia's ability to respond to serious cyber attacks on critical infrastructure by expanding the definition of critical infrastructure to now include energy, communications, financial services, the defence industry, higher education and research, data storage or processing, food and grocery, healthcare and medical, space technology, transport, water and sewerage sectors by also introducing those cyber incident reporting regime for critical infrastructure assets. And that's particularly important to make sure that we have a complete and full picture of the threat environment that we face, because in evidence put to the committee, uh, it is clear that there is under-reporting of those cyber incidents, and there may be many more incidents occurring and, indeed, potentially payments being made by firms for in, in response to ransomware that is never reported and we are never aware of, and we do need to have a full picture. And finally, making government assistance available to industry as a last resort and subject to those appropriate limitations. Um, this is uh, the need outlined uh, very articulately by the Secretary of Home Affairs, Mike Pozzullo, in his evidence before the committee in July this year, where he said he would prefer to have that power on the statute books tonight. We haven't quite delivered as a parliament uh, by getting them on the statute's book uh, in July, but I hope we very soon will have them on the statute books after royal assent, uh, because it is absolutely important our agencies have the power as they need to respond to that crisis scenario, though we hope it will never eventuate. Recent cyber attacks and security threats to Australian critical infrastructure make these reforms critically important to deliver. It's true that most companies do willingly cooperate with the Australian Signals Directorate when they suffer an attack, and the government assistance mechanisms are an important tool of last resort to assist companies that are unwilling and unable to respond to a serious cyber incident. Unfortunately, during our inquiry, the committee did hear an example of at least one systemically important business that failed to cooperate with authorities in a timely way, leading to a nationwide disruption of its services. This business was then reinfected in a second attack. In the event of a crisis, our security agencies must have last resort powers to avoid a situation like this and to keep critical infrastructure up and running if providers are unwilling or unable to do so themselves. These are world-leading powers, which are vital for the task at hand, but they will be subject to strong safeguards and appropriate oversights. There may uh, be other businesses, as I said before, who have never reported that they are under attack. And while the volume of cybercrime reporting has increased, the Cybersecurity Centre stated in its latest annual threat report that reported cybersecurity incidents may not reflect all the cyber threats and trends in Australia's cybersecurity environment. Mandatory cyber incident reporting for critical infrastructure assets will give the government a clear picture of the cyber threat environment. This will ensure that our cyber security policies and the significant powers that we entrust our security agencies accurately reflect and are proportionate to the threats and trends in Australian cyber security environment. Uh, of course, cyber security is not just the government's job. Industry has a vital role to play too, and the passage of the subsequent bill after further consultation and co-design is essential to ensure a comprehensive response to the long-term security of our critical infrastructure. The second phase of these reforms will be implemented, according to the PJCIS recommendations, by further amending uh, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act and capturing those remaining elements of the SOCI bill, in particular the risk management program, the systems of national significance and the enhanced cyber security obligations. I encourage industry and the Department of Home Affairs to continue to work productively together through the co-design process to refine the proposed regulations to that's make sure that we strike the right balance so that we can deliver those additional protections we all agree are necessary. It is my hope that by the time any revised second bill is referred to the PJCIS, that the major concerns industry raised through the first inquiry will have been resolved so that we can quickly deal with it and it can be expeditiously legislated. 
While Australia has not yet suffered a catastrophic attack on critical infrastructure, uh, as other speakers have said in this debate, we are sadly not immune. And the increasingly interconnected nature of critical infrastructure exposes vulnerabilities that could result in significant consequences to our security, our economy and our sovereignty. This demands both a swift response, which we are dealing with today, and a comprehensive response, which I hope we deal with in short order. I'm confident that the two-step approach adopted by the government to urgently expedite emergency powers for our security agencies to protect Australia's critical infrastructure does just that, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's my pleasure to rise and make a contribution on the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020. And I want to start my contribution by saying very clearly that the national security threat has quite dramatically changed in this country, as the Director General of ASIO has made very clear in evidence in the last estimates. Foreign interference and espionage uh, will soon overtake terrorism as the biggest national security threat to Australia. And we have, of course, a very proud history of combating the threats to Australia's national security, the physical threats. So, for instance, um, since September 2014, Australia's law enforcement agencies have disrupted 21 major terrorist attack plots. 138 people have been charged as a result of 66 counter-terrorism related operations around Australia and 50 terrorist offenders are currently behind bars for committing a Commonwealth terrorism offence. I'm very pleased to say that the Australian government has passed 22 tranches of national security legislation. Uh, but as we've just heard from the excellent contribution from Senator Patterson, who is the chair of the PGICIS, uh, the increasingly larger threat to Australia's national security is in the threat posed by cyber attack, digital disruption and other non-physical ways in which Australia's freedoms, its democracy and its national security can be so compromised. And this is why this particular bill is so important. And the PJCIS has done an incredible amount of very fine work to identify the urgent need to pass this bill and to implement these emergency powers, as well as to conduct further consultation with industry in relation to the second tranche of amendments to our law which are required. I just want to briefly reflect on my first speech in this place. And I certainly raised my concerns about the protection of critical infrastructure back in October 2019 when I spoke about the need to keep our nation strong and the need to protect Australia's security and strategic interests and how we had taken enormous strides to combat terrorism and foreign interference and support our intelligence agencies and build our defence capability. But I also made the very strong point that when things weren't working, we had to call them out. And at that time, Australia's critical infrastructure assets weren't appropriately protected, our airports, our power stations, our data networks, our communications infrastructure and our ports, including the Port of Darwin. I made the very strong point that they should not be falling into foreign hands when there was a national security threat. And since this time, led by the Treasurer, there's been some very important reforms to our foreign acquisition laws so that critical infrastructure is better protected and so that the sale of critical infrastructure to foreign interests uh, can be stopped on national security ground and also the disposition of critical infrastructure assets can also be forced on national security grounds. And I, on that note, as an aside, welcome the Minister for Defence's decision to launch a Department of Defence investigation into the leasehold, the long-term leasehold of the part, Port of Darwin, which of course um, is subject to a long-term uh, leasehold by a Chinese-owned company. So I do welcome 
the work that the Minister for Defence is doing in that regard. So as we've heard in this debate, Australia has seen increasing cyber threats and attacks on critical infrastructure. Uh, water services, airports, hospitals, even our own parliamentary network. Throughout 2019 and 20, Australia's critical infrastructure sectors were regularly targeted by malicious cyber actors seeking to exploit and harm victims for profit. And a couple of those examples are a multiple multiple regional hospitals were the victims of a cyber attack and as a result some health services to large regional communities including surgeries were disrupted. A major national food wholesaler was the victim of a cyber attack which affected their systems and temporarily disrupted their ability to provide food to Australians at a time of unprecedented pressure on the food and grocery sector. A water provider had its control system encrypted by ransomware, which had the system not been restored quickly enough from backups, that could have disrupted the supply of potable water to a regional population hub, as well as having the potential to impact the economy given the reliance of primary industry on this water supply. And as I mentioned, uh, in June of last year, the Prime Minister advised the Australian, that the Australian government was aware that Australia's critical infrastructure was being targeted by a sophisticated state-based actor. In the 2020-2021 financial year alone, the Australian Cyber Security Centre received over 67,500 5, 67, cyber crime reports an average of one every eight minutes, representing an increase of nearly 13 per cent over the previous year. Cybercrime reports recorded total self-reported financial losses of more than $33 billion. In particular, as we have heard in this debate, Australia has seen a worrying escalation of ransomware attacks on individuals and businesses exacerbated by the fact that cyber criminals are now moving away from low-level ransomware operations towards attacks which extract heavy ransoms from large or high-profile organisations. These cyber criminals can cause and are causing enormous damage in the way they are encrypting networks, extracting data and then often threatening to publish stolen material online. These attacks go to the heart of Australia's democracy, the heart of Australia's freedom, and they represent a grave threat, uh, not just to our economy, but to our national security as well. The Morrison government is committed to protecting Australia's critical infrastructure, to secure the essential services all Australians rely on, everything from electricity and water to healthcare and groceries. And as we've seen, the intelligence agencies, which do so much fine work to keep Australians safe, have raised the red flag on the urgent need to act quickly, to take further action to protect our critical infrastructure. Amendments to the Security Legislation Amendment, Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020, will ensure the government is well placed to assist entities responsible for critical infrastructure assets to respond to serious cyber attacks as the first step in strengthening of Australia's critical infrastructure security. The reforms outlined in this amended bill will strengthen Australia's ability to respond to serious cyber attacks on critical infrastructure in a number of different ways. The bill expands the definition of critical infrastructure to include energy, communications, financial services, defence industry, higher education and research, data storage or processing, food and grocery, healthcare and medical, space technology, transport and water and sewage sectors. It introduces a cyber incident reporting regime for critical infrastructure assets, 
When critical infrastructure assets are under attack, we need to know about it, and we need to know about it urgently, so that we together, government, the intelligence agencies and industry can work together to combat these attacks. The bill also makes government assistance available to industry as a last resort and subject to appropriate limitations, so the government will be able to provide assistance immediately prior, during or following a significant cyber security incident to ensure the continued provision of essential services. Recent cyber attacks and security threats to Australian critical infrastructure make these reforms critically important to deliver. Uh, and of course, they reflect the response to the recommendations from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, which has brought forward these elements as a priority. The reforms will bring our response to cyber attacks more in line with the government's responses to threats in the physical world. And as I have mentioned at the beginning of my contribution, we can be mightily proud of the way in which we have combated terrorism, but this is the new frontier where no physical presence is necessary on our soil to represent a serious threat to our national security, to our economy. Importantly, the legislation will enable the government to provide emergency assistance or directions immediately before, during or after a significant cyber security incident to mitigate and restore essential services. Of course, as we know, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, nearly every essential service is run by sophisticated digital networks, by sophisticated communication systems. And that, of course, makes the delivery of those services so much more efficient and um, ensures that we have state-of-the-art services in this country. But with those digital networks, with all of the critical infrastructure underpinned by very sophisticated digital networks, this does also present new vulnerabilities in the way in which we are required to protect this infrastructure. So this is a very important bill. This is a very important bill for Australia's democracy, for our economy, for our national security. I commend the work of the PJSIS in, in uh, bringing forward its recommendations to ensure that our government works and acts quickly to address the further reforms which are required. And I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Security Legislation Amendment Critical Infrastructure Bill 2020. Look, the increasing interconnected nature of critical infrastructure exposes vulnerabilities in our nation and for our national security that could result in significant consequences, not just for security but for our economy and our sovereignty. Attacks on our critical infrastructure require and need a joint response involving government, business and individuals, reflecting the interrelated nature of the threat. Our government is already working in partnership with critical infrastructure entities to co-design sector-specific requirements to manage and respond to security risks across critical infrastructure sectors. The government will continue to work with these entities that are responsible for critical infrastructure to ensure that, as we go forward, a second phase of reforms is implemented in a manner that secures appropriate outcomes without imposing unnecessary or disproportionate regulatory burdens. But this bill, the reforms outlined in this bill, will strengthen our existing ability to respond to serious cyber attacks on critical infrastructure by expanding the definition of critical infrastructure, including a cybersecurity incident reporting regime for critical infrastructure assets, and by making government assistance available to industry as a last resort and subject to appropriate limitations. These reforms are necessary 
because while we haven't suffered a catastrophic attack on critical in infrastructure to date, we are not immune, and we have seen attacks overseas that we don't want to see repeated in our own markets. International cyber incidents, such as the ransomware attack on US company Colonial Pipeline, which affected the distribution of fuel to customers on the east coast of the United States, demonstrate the potential for these attacks to cause devastating harm. We are facing increasing cybersecurity threats to our essential services and businesses at all levels of government. In the past two years, we have seen cyber attacks on federal parliamentary networks, logistics, the medical sector and universities, just to mention a few. And while thankfully they didn't have significant uh, consequences, they certainly had consequences that we need to address and we need to make sure that we are protect protected in the future. The Australian Cyber Security Centre's annual cyber threat report contains an overview of the cyber threats affecting Australia and how the ACSC is responding to and the vital, provides vital advice on how all Australians and Australian organisations can protect themselves against those threats. In the 20 to 21 financial year, the ACSC received over 67,500 cybercrime reports an average of one every eight minutes, representing an increase of nearly 13 per cent from the previous financial year. Cyber crime reports submitted via Report Cyber through cyber.gov.au recorded total self-reported financial losses of more than 33 billion Australian dollars. Ransom demands by cyber criminals range from thousands to millions of dollars. Almost 500 ransomware-related cybercrime reports were received via the Report Cyber website, which is an increase of nearly 15 per cent compared to the previous financial year. And cybercriminals are moving away from low-level ransomware operations. They are moving towards extracting hefty ransoms from large or high-profile organisations through increasingly sophisticated technological mechanisms. To increase the likelihood of ransoms being paid, these cyber criminals are encrypting networks and exfiltrating data, then threatening to publish stolen information on the internet. These shifts in targeting and tactics have intensified the ransomware threat to Australian organisations across all sectors, including critical infrastructure, which is why these reforms are so important. These reforms will be implemented through strengthening the Australian government's capacity to identify and manage the national security risks of espionage, sabotage and coercion, resulting from foreign involvement in Australia's critical infrastructure. The government amendments to the bill to amend the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018 uh, have been made to expand the security of critical infrastructure to cover 11 critical infrastructure sectors. This includes energy, communications, financial services, defence industry, higher education and research, data storage or processing, food and grocery, healthcare, medical, space technology, transport and water and sewerage sectors all sectors that are vitally important to our day-to-day -day lives and to the lifestyle we have grown accustomed to in our nation. The amendments will also apply the reporting obligations of critical infrastructure ownership and operational information to the Register of Critical Infrastructure Assets to the added critical infrastructure sectors. It will allow the government to mandate cyber incident reporting for critical infrastructure sectors to the Australian Signals Directorate, Australian Cyber Security Centre. And it will also introduce government assistance measures providing powers for the government to respond to security incidents that seriously prejudice Australia's prosperity, national security and defence. 
and importantly, it will enable the Parliamentary Joint Committee for Intelligence and Security, the PGCIS, to conduct a review of the operation, effect interests and implications of the bill not less than three years when the bill receives royal assent. And that point is so vitally important because that adds to the scrutiny capacity of this parliament over the bill and to make sure that it is operating effectively and efficiently and as intended. It will allow the PGCIS to have an overview and a watching sight of how the bill is being implemented and to provide uh, a review and any relevant recommendations when the review is conducted in three years' time. As a member of the Parliamentary Committee for the Scrutiny of uh, Bills and Delegated Legislation, I find, I find parliamentary scrutiny over such issues is very important and adds to the robustness of our legislation going forward. The government assistance powers that are proposed as part of this bill have been proposed as a result of the consultations, which revealed a strong community expectation that in emergency circumstances and as a matter of last resort, the government will use its technical expertise to protect Australia's national interests and restore the functioning of essential services. Collaborative re resolution will always remain the most effective me method of resolving an incident, and that is why it is the government's first preference to work with industries and with our critical infrastructure providers uh, to maintain our national security. However, it is the government's ultimate responsibility to protect the availability of Australians, Australia's critical infrastructure and in such emergency circumstances, it is crucial that the government has last resort powers to respond to the incident or mitigate its impact. The government recognises that industry should and will usually be the first responder to the vast majority of cybersecurity incidents with the support of government when necessary. However, under the provisions in this bill, the government does maintain the ultimate responsibility, as would be expected by the Australian public, and this is in Australia's national interest. So, as a last resort, government, government assistance will enable the government to protect critical infrastructure, in the critical infrastructure sector assets in the event of an in, imminent attack during an attack or following a significant cyber attack. These last resort powers may only be exercised where a cyber security incident has occurred or is occurring or is imminent, where an incident has had or is having or is likely to have a relevant impact on a critical infrastructure asset, or where there is a material risk that the incident has seriously prejudiced or will seriously prejudice or is likely to seriously prejudice the social or economic stability of Australia or its people, the defence of Australia or national security. There is no existing regulatory re where sorry, they can also be brought in where there is no existing regulatory mechanism that can be used to address the cyber attack. The intervention power may only be authorised once the Minister for Home Affairs has sought agreement from the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence. It is not a free-for-all. There are protections built in to ensure that it is truly used as a mechanism of last resort. This bill has been consulted. I want to reiterate it is very important to understand the level of consultation that has occurred. From August to September, the Australian government consulted publicly on this bill and uh, the protecting critical infrastructure and systems of national significance through the consultation paper. There were over 2,000 participants from over 500 entities that took part in town hall meetings, sector-specific workshops and bilateral meetings to support the development of the reforms, including the sector-specific thresholds. The Department of Home Affairs received 194 submissions uh, to 
the consultation paper. And in November 2020, government consulted publicly on an exposure draft of the bill. Home Affairs also spoke to over 1,000 individuals during that public consultation of the exposure draft, which opened on 9th of November and closed on the 27th of November. There were also 122 further submissions received during the exposure draft consultation period. There were also the PGCIS hearings, and as we acknowledged at the time, many sectors have had multiple challenges to deal with during the pandemic. Uh, in saying that, the consultation on this bill has been thorough. Amendments have been made as a response to that consultation, uh, and the bill as it now stands is robust, fit for purpose, and uh, I commend that this bill to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, this bill responds to the recommendations of the Parliamentary Joint Committee of Intelligence and Securities, advisory report on this bill, uh, and the statutory review of the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018. The government acknowledges and thanks the committee for its work, both in relation to this bill and other government national security priorities. Cyber security threats targeting Australia's national and economic interests are increasing in frequency, scale and sophistication. 25 per cent of cyber security incidents that the Australian Signals Directorate responded to last year were found to be targeting the nation's critical infrastructure, including energy, water, telecommunications providers and our essential health networks. As the Director-General of Security noted in his recent annual report, there is potential for Australia's adversaries to pre-position malicious code in critical infrastructure, particularly in areas such as telecommunications and energy. Such cyber-related activities could be used to damage critical networks in the future. Australia's threat environment is complex, challenging and changing. This brings into focus the importance of these amendments and why the government has accepted the committee's recommendation to expedite the introduction of these important measures. The PJSIS has made 14 recommendations in the advisory report, notably including that the bill be split into two, with a first bill to incorporate the measures to respond to cyber incidents and cyber incident reporting, as well as associated definitions and powers, and a second bill to be introduced following industry consultation to include the, rema the remaining preventative measures. The PJSIS indicated that, that the measures in the bill should be legislated in the shortest possible time, given the moral imperative of the government and our security agencies to harden our essential services and ensure the continued safety of the Australian community. The measures in the bill will expand the scope of the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act to include assets in an additional 11 industry sectors as critical infrastructure assets, provide a mechanism to require cyber incident reporting, enable government responses to serious cyber security incidents and retain associated definitions and powers. The bill also includes a provision that the PJSIS may conduct a review of the operations, effectiveness and implications of the reform security of critical infrastructure legislative framework in the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act not less than three years from when this bill receives royal assent in accordance with recommendation 14 of the advisory report. The government will respond to the remaining PJSIS recommendations relating to the second bill as soon as possible. Engagement with industry will not stop with the passage of this bill. The government will continue to work collaboratively with industry to support the implementation of their obligations with the ultimate goal of reducing the likelihood and severity of catastrophic impacts to Australia's critical infrastructure. Malicious cyber activity represents a threat to Australia's way of life. It can undermine our sovereignty, democratic institutions, economy and national security, and it is the responsibility of all Australians to protect themselves against it. Accelerated digitisation during the pandemic has made Australia more vulnerable to cyber security threats and emboldened malicious actors. These measures will be a step towards ensuring cyber resilience for all Australians. I commend the bill to the Senate. Oh, and uh, I also wish to table a correction to the revised explanatory memorandum relating to this bill. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed. Those that have opinion say aye. aye. Those that are against say no. no. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Require a division? Yes. Did I do that? Division required.
Mr. Mickey, sir, you're happy to start? Yeah. Stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Yes.
The result of the division is ayes 7, noes 32. The question is resolved in the negative. The question is that the bills now be read a second time. Those that have opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to critical infrastructure and for other purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister, third reading. I move this bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those that have opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. Call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to critical infrastructure and for other purposes. Government business, order of the day number two. Counter-terrorism legislation amendment, high risk terrorist offenders bill 2021. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the counter-terrorism legislation, high risk terrorist offenders bill 2020. This bill responds to recommendations made by the former Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, Dr James Renwick, SC, in 2017, and proposes to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 to introduce an extended supervision order scheme. This would complement the current suite of powers available to the Australian Federal Police to counter the threat of terrorism. Currently, when authorities believe that a convicted terrorist offender would continue to pose a risk to the community at the expiry of the offender's custodial sentence, the Commonwealth may apply to the Supreme Court of a state or territory for an order to continue that offender's detention for up to three years at a time. In order to make a continuing detention order, the court must be satisfied that no less restrictive measure would mitigate the risk to the community of the offender's release. In line with the recommendations by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, this bill proposes an alternative to continuing detention orders, that is, an extended supervision order. This would be a less restrictive option than a continuing detention order. Under an extended supervision order, a convicted terrorist would be released into the community at the end of their sentence, but would be required to comply with prohibitions restrictions or obligations that are, in the court's view, reasonably necessary and appropriate and adapted to, protected, to protecting the community. These powers do introduce a less restrictive option than what is currently in existence, but that is not to diminish the significance of the new powers. In introducing extended supervision orders, such an order could re significantly restrict the liberty of an individual who has completed their sentence. And so this bill was very carefully considered by the opposition. The bill also seeks to address what the government has described as the current lack of interoperability interoper between continuing detention orders and control orders in the criminal code due to the different courts from which these orders may be sought. Currently, only federal courts can make control orders and only state or territory Supreme Courts can make continuing detention orders. That means a Supreme Court cannot make a control order or any other type of post-sentencing order if, in the view of the court, less restrictive measures would be effective in preventing the unacceptable risk. If this bill becomes law, a state or territory Supreme Court would be able to make an extended supervision order as an alternative to a continuing detention order. This bill was referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security for review. The committee rece received valuable and considered submissions from experts on law and human rights, as well as from government departments and agencies. <coughs> Amongst the issues discussed in submissions and hearings, the human rights considerations of extending restrictions to a person's civil liberties after they have served their sentence, the methodology for assessing risk of future offending, the standard of proof required for an extended supervision order, 
and the safeguards and oversight accompanying the powers proposed by the bill. The committee made 11 unanimous and bipartisan recommendations. These included requiring that the issuing authority must consider whether a person is already subject to other post-sentence supervision orders and the cumulative impact of multiple post-sentence orders, including the risk of oppression. An independent review to be provided to the parliament of methodologies used to determine a person's risk of violence, violent extremism and the effectiveness of mandating participation in de-radicalization programs. And provisions for the Commonwealth to bear reasonable costs associated with the offender's legal representation. The committee also recommended stipulations that conditions imposed under an extended supervision order cannot, in effect, amount to detention, and that these new powers be subject to a statutory review by the committee after the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor conducts his review. These are important and necessary recommendations that further demonstrate how seriously the Parliamentary Joint Committee for Intelligence and Security takes its role in calibrating the important issues of national security, human rights, and procedural fairness, all in a bipartisan way in the national interest. I am pleased then, both as a member of the Intelligence and Security Committee, as well as a member of this chamber, to note that the government has advised they will be accepting the majority of the committee's recommendations. As such, Labor will support this bill, strengthened and improved as it is by the amendments made. Labor takes the issues of national security very seriously. Australia's national terrorism threat level was raised to probable in, the 24 in 2014 and has remained there since. Probable means there is a credible threat reporting that people, there is a credible threat that people with the capability and intent to conduct terrorist attacks in Australia. In the time since 2014, the threat level has remained constant, but the threat itself has transformed, including the now increased threat of ideologically motivated violent extremism, fueled largely by a rise in right-wing extremism, and sadly, as evidenced by the mass casualty terrorist attack committed by an Australian right-wing terrorist in Christchurch. ASIO, the AFP and state law enforcement agencies have all warned that extremists are exploiting the fear and insecurity created by the COVID-19 pandemic, vilifying culturally and linguistically diverse communities, spreading disinformation as a means of recruitment to sow fear and incite violence. The Attorney General's Department and the Department of Home Affairs told the committee that of the 86 individuals convicted of Commonwealth terrorism offences, 13 are due to be released over the next few years. With this in mind, it is important that our security and law enforcement agencies have a range of options to monitor the threat posed by terrorism and particularly by convicted terrorists who continue to demonstrate an intent to harm Australians. These amendments are important, the amendments recommended by the committee, which is why it's surprising that it took the government three years to introduce this legislation, as it had been recommended by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor back in 2017. And it is also surprising that the Minister for Home Affairs, Ms. Karen Andrews, told the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in September that this, the need for this legislation was greater than ever, when the Morrison-Joyce government only handed its response to the committee's recommendations in late October. And it is surprising to learn that the former Attorney General, Christian Porter, had told the Australian newspaper in 2018 that, quote, the government intends to introduce legislation to create an extended supervision order scheme as soon as possible. Perhaps we should not be surprised that as soon as possible for the Morrison-Joyce government is actually in three years' time. Perhaps just another example 
of a headline without and an announcement without the detail and of acting too little, too late. However, the bill is now at the Parliament. It has now gone through a Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security Review. It has been ca considered carefully by the committee and is a member of that committee. I acknowledge and thank all committee members uh, for their diligence in conducting the review of this legislation. I acknowledge that the chair, uh, Senator James Patterson, uh, did considerable work on this legislation, particularly given that uh, he only took on the leadership of that committee earlier this year, and indeed a fair amount of the work done on the committee was prior to his uh, taking on responsibility as chair. However, uh, we have arrived at a bipartisan report done in the national interest and focusing on what is important for Australia's national security. And having worked collaboratively and with diligence to review and improve this bill, Labor supports the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. We will not be supporting this bill because it is highly flawed. And I say to the government, come back to this place when you want to do the right thing and then we can negotiate. This parliament has passed well over 70 counter-terrorism laws in the last two decades, and often they have simply never been used. This bill proposes to establish a new type of post-sentence order in the criminal code to manage the future risk presented by a person who has finished their imprisonment for a terrorism or security offence. This extended super supervision order would enable someone to be released into the community subject to conditions on their activities and movements after they have completed their sentence. However, the Criminal Code already contains provisions that permit a Supreme Court to make what's called a continuing detention order in relation to the same category of offender. These continuing detention orders require a person convicted of a serious terrorism offence to remain in detention for up to three years after they have completed their sentence. I note that the Human Rights Commission has called for the introduction of an extended supervision order regime because it provides a less restrictive way of managing the risk to the community of serious crime. The Human Rights Commission argues that where a risk is proven to exist and a court considers that the community can be protected through conditions imposed on a person after they are released, this should be referred instead, preferred instead of continued detention because it's a more proportionate response. It is also consistent with the general principle of the criminal law that an offender should be released from custody once they have done their sentence. However, the continuing detention order regime that we have now will not be repealed. It will continue to exist alongside provisions in this bill. Also, what's worse is that this bill is not at all what the third independent national security legislation monitor suggested as a better way forward. And as I mentioned earlier, this parliament has passed over 70 counter-terrorism laws in the last 20 years. Many of these laws create really broad, extensive and often overlapping powers. This means that it is becoming more and more probable that the human rights of people are being impacted due to the snowballing nature of all these laws. I urge my fellow senators to not consider this law on its own, 
but in the broader ecosystem in which it lives. If this bill is passed, the new extended supervision order regime would add to this country's already extensive and often unjustified counter-terrorism powers. These powers, once given to police and spy agencies, do not come back. This bill cannot be seen in isolation. It must be seen in the context of the many, many powers that this parliament has already given the police and intelligence agencies of this country. At the very least, the extended supervision order regime should replace the continuing detention order regime. These two extensive powers should not sit side by side. I foreshadow a second reading amendment to reflect this, and I ask the support of my fellow senators. There is no need for these two regimes to exist at the same time. If this bill is passed as it is and control orders are not repealed, offenders in New South Wales could be subject to up to four overlapping post-sentence order regimes. I say to the government, this bill is not it. Come back to this place, put forward something that at the very least abolishes the continuing detention order regime. Act on the advice from the independent National Security Legislation Monitor recommended and then we can negotiate. I say to the government, go do your job, come back to this place when you've got something that is worthy of the Senate to consider. The Australian Greens cannot agree to this bill in its current form. Thank you. Senator Thorpe, did you want to move your amendment? Yes, please. I'd like to move my amendment. Thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Chair. The national terrorism threat level was raised to probable in September 2014, and since then there have been nine attacks and 21 major counterterrorism disruption operations in relation to potential attack planning in Australia. <clears throat> Since 2001, 92 people have been convicted of terrorism-related offences in Australia, including seven who are juveniles when charged. More than 50 are currently serving custodial sentences, and a number of others remain before the courts for terrorism-related offences. One must only look back to the horror of the Lint Cafe attack or the Burke Street attack in my home state of Victoria to know that these threats are real and present within our society. This is something that the Morrison government takes very, very seriously and is resolutely committed to pulling every lever of government to protect Australians and prevent the threat of terrorism from occurring on our shores. It is vital to remember that the security of Australians underpins the recovery of Australia from COVID-19. If our citizens are not safe, they cannot prosper. While COVID-19 <clears throat> has put a halt to many of the norms of our daily lives, the threats against Australians and our communities continue to propagate. For those intent on violence, more time at home online meant more time in an echo chamber of the internet on the pathway to radicalisation. As noted by the Director-General of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, Mr Mike Burgess, and I quote, COVID has reinforced extremist beliefs and narratives about societal collapse and a race war. As a consequence, we are seeing extremists seeking to acquire weapons of self-defence as well as stockpiling ammunition and provisions. An ideologically motivated terrorist attack in Australia remains plausible, most likely by a lone actor or a small cell rather than a recognised group and using a knife or a vehicle rather than sophisticated weapons. As we learned from the horrific 2019 London Bridge attack and the 2020 Streatham attack in the UK, convicted terrorists can pose a very real and ongoing threat to public safety when they're released back into the community after serving their full jail sentence. 
<coughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, in the case of the February 2020 attack in London, Sudesh Aman injured two people before he was shot dead by police officers who had him under close surveillance. The attacker had been released from prison just 10 days before he carried out the attack. Had this individual not been under close surveillance, it is most likely that many more would have been injured or killed. Terrorist attacks perpetrated by individuals who had previously been incarcerated on terrorism charges reinforces the complexity of the challenges that prisons around the world manifest in relation to terrorist offenders. Despite the efforts of correctional officers to de-radicalise prisoners, recidivism still occurs. At a fundamental level, recidivism constitutes the continuation of or a return to a previous pattern of criminal behaviour. While our correctional officers put a great deal of effort, of effort into reducing the rate of recidivism, unfortunately many individuals walk out of prison more radicalised than before they went in. This is why we must have the right rules in place to ensure if and when recidivism occurs, our fine law enforcement agencies are prepared and can prevent it before our citizens are harmed. Peter Severin, the former Commissioner for New South Wales Prisons, spoke earlier this year to the fact that some of Australia's most notorious terrorists have not disavowed their extremist beliefs in prison and that they remain dangerous as their re-entry into, into the community looms. Six offenders convicted following Operation Pendennis in 2005 which dismantled a terrorist, a terrorist network operating between Sydney and Melbourne, remain in custody in New South Wales and will become eligible for release between now and 2026. If and when these individuals are released, we must ensure that the right framework is in place so that our law enforcement agencies are able to adequately ensure that while back in the community, they pose no threat to the greater public, and if they do pose a threat, that they can quickly act upon it. In 2016, the Australian Government introduced the high-risk terrorist offender regime into the Commonwealth Criminal Code. This provides for the continuing detention of high-risk terrorist offenders who pose an unacceptable risk of committing serious terrorism offences at the end of their custodial sentence. This was a significant step towards keeping our communities safe from those that wish to threaten the lives of innocent Australians. The Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment High-Risk Terror Terrorist Offenders Bill of 2020 government amendments builds upon the work the Coalition Government has done so far to make our communities safer. The bill before us will ensure that the risk posed to the community from high-risk terrorist offenders are mitigated following their release from a custodial sentence. It will do this by creating an extended super supervision order, an ESO scheme, for high-risk terrorist offenders who are released into the community. This will ensure that they are subject to supervision and monitoring conditions which are proportionate to the level of risk they pose to community safety. The new scheme would ensure public safety is the number one priority for our courts when making decisions about the release of high-risk offenders. Under an extended supervision order, the court may impose any conditions that it is satisfied are reasonably necessary and reasonably appropriate for the purpose of protecting the community from unacceptable risk of the offender committing a serious terrorism offence. The extended supervision order scheme will complement the existing con continuing detention order scheme in the Criminal Code Act 1995 and will broaden the range of tools available to protect the community from terrorist offenders. Currently, there are only two options for managing such offenders. The first is a continuing detention order under which a court may order that the person remain detained where they pose an unacceptable risk to the community and where that risk cannot be addressed through less restrictive means. The second option is a control order which allows conditions to be placed on a person in the community. These orders are not tailored for the post-sentence context as they only allow for a defined set of conditions and are issued by different courts to continuing detention orders. In creating extended supervision orders, 
the bill will broaden a range of measures available to address the risk of terrorism to the Australian community. The government has put in place robust legal frameworks to provide agencies with appropriate powers, including control orders, preventative detention orders and emergency stop, search and seize powers. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has recently reported following its consideration of these powers and recommended that they be continued. The Australian community, Madam Acting Deputy, Deputy President, rightly expects that their government will do everything within its power to prevent individuals who have a proven track record of causing, of causing harm or who have had intentions to cause harm from further threatening the community when they get out of jail. This improved scheme delivers on our commitment to keep Australians safe. The bill also amends other legislation to support the effective implementation of the Extended Supervision Order Scheme. To ensure the compliance of an offender on an Extended Supervision Order, the bill amends the Crimes Act of 1914 to extend the existing regime of monitoring warrants for control orders, to also include supervision orders and interim supervision orders. These amendments will allow law enforcement to monitor the compliance of an offender either with their consent or with a warrant to search their premises or person. Amendments to the Surveillance Devices Act of 2004 and the Telecom Telecommunications Inception, Interception and Access Act of 1979 will allow law enforcement to obtain warrants for electronic surveillance to monitor compliance with supervision orders and inform the, monitor, the minister's decision as to whether to apply for a post-sentence order. The bill also amends the International Production Order regime, which was introduced through the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production Orders Bill of 2020, allowing for improved cross-border access to communications data for law enforcement agencies. These amendments will ensure that agencies are able to obtain international production orders for the purpose of monitoring compliance with extended supervision orders. The bill amends the National Security Information Criminal and Civil Proceedings Act of 2004 to extend existing provisions which apply to control order proceedings to allow the court to consider sensitive information in extended supervision order proceedings without that information being disclosed to the offender or their legal representative. This will ensure that the process of applying for an extended supervision order does not reveal sensitive sources, which is, which is of the utmost importance in a custodial environment. To ensure that the offender receives a fair hearing, the bill extends the existing special advocate regime, which is currently in place for control order proceedings. The bill expressly prohibits the court from considering court-only evidence in determining whether to make a continuing detention order, as is currently the case. The government amendments also address recommendations by the PJCIS in relation to the bill. The government accepted 10 of the 11 PJCIS recommendations in full, in part or in principle. In the context of the recent New Zealand terror incident, the operational need for the ESO scheme to manage high-risk terrorist offenders, it is essential that this bill is passed. The bill ensures that our law enforcement agencies have the powers they need to respond to the evolving threat of terrorism and reflects the government's continued commitment to keeping the Australian community safe and secure. This bill demonstrates the Morrison government's commitment to providing holistic protection against the threat of terrorist activity. This will ensure that our communities remain safe and address any gaps in the current legislative framework that may allow for malicious individuals to cause harm. And I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Molan. Uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, thank you. I rise to, like other senators in this place, to speak uh, to the bill Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. Uh, listening to other senators who have addressed this bill, uh, it always restores my faith when I hear reports from the Parliamentary Joint Committee Intelligence and Security, uh, as explained to us by Senator Keneally, 
uh, that bipartisan support comes out of the process within that, uh, that committee. Uh, I spent some time on that committee in my first iteration of, uh, within the Senate, uh, and it's an excellent committee. And the way that it comes to bipartisan supports, uh, bipartisan support for various bills, is an excellent process. And I was very happy to hear that Labor does support the bill. I listened to Senator Thorpe, and I thank Senator Thorpe for her contribution. Uh, I, I guess there has to be an objection from the Greens in relation to this, but I would say that an argument can be made, uh, can be made very, very solidly, that we do need both the continuing detention order and uh, the uh, extended supervision orders. They are two quite different functions, and they give an extraordinary amount of flexibility to courts or to other officials as to how they might handle terrorists who have been incarcerated but who still hold extremist views. Uh, I think these powers are justified. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's very, very important that we look at these powers as a whole, as Senator Thor Thorpe explained, uh, but that when you do look at them in context, uh, I think it is possible to see that both the CDO and the ESO are of values and are needed. Senator Van spoke to us uh, and reminded us that terrorism is a significant problem. Uh, nine attacks and 21 disruptions, that's still a significant problem. Since 2001, 92 convicted terrorists, of which 50 are still incarcerated. Uh, and he, replied, he, he reminded us, of course, that the Director General of ASIO had spoken very strongly and openly about the impact of COVID on uh, the terrorist situation in this country, that ideologically motivated terrorist groups were there, were becoming more active, uh, particularly during the COVID period. And he also gave us uh, examples of released offenders conducting terrorist activities. So I think that this is something which is very, very relevant to every aspect of our life. Uh, the government is well and truly committed to ensuring the safety and security of all Australians. Uh, as we've seen and as we were reminded by Senator Van, in the recent terrorist attacks in New Zealand, as well as the 2019 London Bridge attack and the 2020 Streatham attack in the UK, convicted terrorist offenders can continue to pose a risk to the community at the end of their sentence. This bill enhances the safety and security of every Australian by creating what's been explained to us this evening, extended supervision orders, ESOs, to ensure that high-risk terrorist offenders can be appropriately managed in the community at the end of their custodial sentence. Part one of Schedule one of the bill creates an extended supervision order scheme for high-risk terrorist offenders in Division 105A of the Criminal Code. A state or territory Supreme Court would be able to make an ESO in relation to a convicted high-risk terrorist if satisfied on the balance of probabilities that the offender poses an unacceptable risk of committing a serious terrorism offence if released into the community at the end of their sentence. Under an ESO, Extended Supervision Order, the court may impose any conditions that it is satisfied are reasonably necessary and reasonably appropriate and adapted, uh, adapted for the purpose of protecting the community from unacceptable risk. ESOs would provide a less restrictive option, and this is the key for the Greens, the ESOs would provide a less restrictive option if the court is not satisfied that a continuing detention order uh, is necessary. So I think it's important to realise the, the, the uh, balances uh, that exist in this bill. The Supreme Court will be able to impose an ESO for up to three years at a time. If the court is satisfied, as I mentioned before, on the balance of probabilities, on the basis of admissible evidence, 
that the offender, the offender poses an unacceptable risk of committing a serious terrorism offence. And of course, one of the real benefits of this bill is that the court can impose any condition that it likes uh, on an offender that it considers proportionate to the risk that the offender poses. So that was part one of Schedule 1. Part two of Schedule 1 amends the Crime Act, Crimes Act 1914, uh, which relates to surveillance devices and is referred to as the SD Act, Surveillance Devices Act, and Telecommunications Interception and Access Act of 1979, to extend the existing surveillance and monitoring powers which are available for control orders to apply to ESOs, including search warrants and warrants for various types of electronic surveillance. Law enforcement agencies will also be able to seek electronic surveillance warrants under the SD Act the Surveillance Devices Act and in, uh, to inform the AFP Minister's decision whether to apply for an ESO or a CDO. Part two of Schedule One also amends the National Security Information Criminal and Civil Proceedings Act of 2004 to extend the court-only evidence provisions and the special advocate scheme that applies in control orders proceeding to ESO proceedings. Part two of Schedule One also amends the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 to exempt decisions made by the AFP Minister under, under Division 105A of the Criminal Code from judicial review under that Act and to the Australian Security and Intelligence Organisations Act 1979 to confirm that a condition imposed by an ESO or an action relating to electronic monitoring is not a prescribed administrative action for the purpose of the definition of an adverse security assessment under the Act. The bill also provides agencies, therefore, with the necessary tools to not just apply ESOs, but to monitor compliance with those orders and to protect sensitive national security information within ESO proceedings. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has considered the bill and made 11 recommendations. The government is accepting 10 of, these, uh, of those recommendations in full, in part or in principle. There is a part three to the bill which makes minor consequential amendments to the Crimes uh, Act to reflect the creation of ESOs. Uh, Acting Deputy President, Schedule 2 of the bill contains amendments to provisions introduced by the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production uh, Orders, Bill 2020, referred to as the IPO Bill, in, uh, International Production Orders. The IPO Bill was passed by both houses on the 24th of June this year and received royal assent on the 23rd of July. As the IPO bill was in Parliament at the same time as the ESO bill, it was necessary to draft contingent amendments in this way. The IPO bill was introduced for a framework to facilitate Australia entering into cross-border access to data agreements with foreign countries for an effective and efficient pathway for Australian law enforcement agencies to obtain communications data and vice versa and the proposed Australia-United States Cloud Agreement is an example of this. This, will, this bill will amend the IPO framework to enable law enforcement agencies to obtain an international production order for the purpose of monitoring compliance with an ESO. The use and disclosure framework will also be amended to facilitate the use of information collected under an international production order to be used when making an application for a CDO or an ESO. Uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, this is a good bill. This is a bill which has function and which is relevant, which in, even in the context of everything else that th this government has produced to counter terrorism over many, many years, uh, is an adjunct to those things, and I commend this bill to the, to the uh, Senate. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor supports this bill, and 
As others before me have pointed out, it responds to a recommendation that was made by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor quite some time ago, in 2017. And that recommendation was to establish a federal extended supervision order regime. The bill went before the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. And before turning to the content of the bill, I just wanted to make some brief comments about Labor's broad approach to national security and how that affects the work in that committee. Whether we're in government or in opposition, we consistently work to ensure that our security agencies have the powers and resources that they need to keep our community safe and that our laws are adapted to meet changing security threats. And that approach is consistent. We take the advice of national security agencies seriously. We understand the context of our decisions, most specifically that in acting to protect our nation, we act to protect a nation that is founded on the rule of law and respecting individual liberty. And our approach to national security needs to reflect and respond to these core values. And to the extent that individual rights are burdened, and they are burdened from time to time, such burden must represent the least intrusive manner to achieve the security objective and be proportionate to the actual threat. We scrutinise evidence carefully and we never politicise national security. Labor is committed to working through the evidence of agencies, stakeholders and experts in a deliberative manner. And our bipartisan approach means exactly this. We expect the PJCIS to, be, to robustly interrogate the issues that are placed before it without seeking to obtain narrow electoral advantage. And we seek to embed in our national security architecture robust oversight. Strong and effective oversight does not undermine our national security, in fact it enhances it. Public trust and confidence in our security and intelligence agencies is best ensured through strong and rigorous oversight and scrutiny. As with all bills, that's the approach that we took to this one. As I indicated, this bill has taken its time in arriving. The insulin made a recommendation for a scheme such as contained in this bill in 2017. It took the current government three years after that to even introduce legislation into the parliament. In October 2018, the former Attorney General, Christian, Mr Porter, told the Australian newspaper this, and I quote, the government intends to introduce legislation to create an ESO scheme as soon as possible. And yet legislation was not introduced until nearly two years later in September 2020. Now, in the last sitting week of 2021, this bill has been listed for debate. Now, if this bill becomes law, it would be possible for federal authorities to seek an extended supervision order as an alternative to a continuing detention order. Under a supervision order, an offender would be released into the community at the end of his or her sentence, but would be required to comply with prohibitions, restrictions or obligations that are, in the court's view, reasonably necessary and appropriate and adapted to protecting the community. One of the key reasons for the bill is to address what the government describes as the current lack of interoperability between continuing detention orders and control orders in the criminal code due to the different courts from which these orders may be sought. And it is an, a genuine problem, and the committee took evidence about this. Currently, only federal courts can make control orders, but only state and territory supreme courts can make continuing detention orders. This means that a state supreme court cannot make a control order, a less intrusive response to a threat, or any other type of post-sentencing order if, in the view of the court, less restrictive measures would be effective in preventing the unacceptable risk. And this is because these, the making of these orders is not available to that court. If this bill becomes law, a state supreme court would be able to make an extended supervision order as a less intrusive alternative to a continuing detention order. But only, and this is key, if this represents a proportional response to the risk that is posed, one, a response that is adequate to protect the community. When the Intelligence and Security Committee looked at this bill, we made a range of unanimous and bipartisan recommendations to improve the bill, including the inclusion of additional factors that an issuing authority must consider prior to, prior to issuing an extended supervision order. 
such as whether the person is already the subject of another post-sentence supervision order under state or territory legislation. We recommended that a court may make an order requiring the Commonwealth to bear all or part of the reasonable costs and expenses of the offender's legal representation for an extended supervision order proceeding. These are important powers that have the capacity to intrude on a person's liberty. It is appropriate that they are represented when these matters are being considered. The committee re recommended that the issuing authority be required to assess the necess necessity and proportionality of the combined effect of all of the proposed conditions of an extended supervision order, not just each individual condition in isolation. Ensuring that conditions imposed under an extended supervision order cannot amount to effective detention by providing that a supervision order cannot require an individual to remain at a specified premises for more than 12 hours in any 24-hour period. And the committee also recommended that authorities cannot impose new conditions under an interim supervision order unless the subject of the order consents. And finally, ensuring that authorities can exercise discretion when it comes to minor or unintentional breaches of a supervision order, i.e. they would have the discretion not to prosecute if it was clear that this was not um, a, a, a something intentional done by, by the subject of the order. The committee also recommended that the government commission an independent review of the range of risk assessment tools that are available to evaluate whether a person poses a risk of committing terrorist acts, and also that there be a statutory review of the new powers within 12 months after the independent national security legislation monitor completes his review, noting that the monitor is due to review that or to commence that review as soon as practical after the 7th of December this year. Now, this is a good example of the committee exercising its authority and its role to review legislation and to ensure that it is balanced and proportionate. As I said earlier, the power to establish a post-sentence arrangement is a most significant power. And the committee's amendments largely seek to establish additional checks and balances to ensure that this power is not abused. The government has largely accepted each of these recommendations, though with some justification it has argued that legislative amendments are unnecessary to achieve two of the committee's recommendations. The, committee has, uh, the government I'm sorry, has, however, rejected part, seven, uh, part, part of recommendation seven, which is that proposed clause 105A of the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Defenders Bill 2020 be amended to require that interim supervision orders may not be subject to application to include new conditions prior to confirming an extended supervision order and may be amended with the consent of both parties. The government has rejected the first part of this recommendation on the basis that it would like to retain the ability to have new conditions imposed under an interim supervision order, provided that those new conditions are agreed to by the independent issuing authority. Recommendation 7 was a considered bipartisan and unanimous recommendation of the committee. In our view, the government has not offered a compelling reason to reject part of that recommendation. And for that reason, I wish to place on record that in the event that Labor is successful at the next election, it is a recommendation that we would revisit in government. As the Shadow Attorney-General noted in his remarks in the other place, not all of the concerns that were raised by submitters to the, government's, to the committee's inquiry are addressed by the government's amendments, and nor were all of those concerns addressed by the Intelligence and Security Committee's recommendations. For example, the Law Council was not persuaded that amendments to the bill put forward by the Attorney-General's Department and the Department of Home Affairs in August, which would allow a control order or extended supervision order to apply to a person in immigration detention, were necessary. And in common with a number of submitters, Labor members of the Intelligence and Security Committee also expressed concern that where the bill departs from recommendations made by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor, those departures really have not been adequately justified by the department. I note that if the bill becomes law, the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor will be required to undertake a review of the measures contained in the bill as soon as practicable after 7 December 2021. And just as importantly, the Intelligence and Security Committee will be able to commence its own inquiry within 12 months of the Insulin's report being completed. Those reviews will provide the Monitor, the Parliament 
and civil society groups an opportunity to evaluate the practical application of the measures contained in this bill and to consider whether further improvements are necessary or desirable. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to address the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Defenders Bill of 2020, and I do so uh, also as a long standing member of the PJCIS. I do this um, and highlight for those who are listening to this debate the two examples um, in New Zealand recently and in the UK. In both of these examples, what we've seen is people who have been convicted of terrorist offences, who have been released because they reached the end of their sentence, and yet the authorities knew and were concerned that the radical ideology which had caused them to offend in the first place had not been renounced. And for that reason, they imposed various conditions under their law in New Zealand and the UK that enabled police to, to monitor and follow and watch what people were doing. I note that in both of those incidents, the fact that those conditions were in place did not stop the offenders, in the case of the New Zealand incident, walking into a supermarket, going to a shelf with knives, grabbing a knife, and stabbing a number of people before the police were able to intervene. Similar things in the UK. The reality we face today is that terrorist offenders, there's a range of why they do it, there's a range of uh, circumstances for each person, but as we see through groups like ISIS or ISIL, depending how you want to define them, and their affiliates around the world, is that many of these people are quite sane. They're balanced in their worldview. They're not necessarily from low-income families who've been deprived or uneducated. We have people trained in Australia as doctors and physicians who have gone to join such organisations. And if people hold these ideologies deeply, they don't give them up on the basis of a penal sentence. And we have seen much evidence from around the world that many de-radicalisation programs are marginally effective at best, and in many cases appear to have no real impact. And as we look at some offenders, such as Ben Breaker and others in uh, prisons in Australia who've been ringleaders in the past, the potential remains very high for them to not only continue to hold, but to continue to lead and inspire others to commit and for them to commit atrocities into the future. And so whilst I take the points raised by others in this debate and during the inquiry, that measures such as extended supervision orders are an infringement on civil liberties, I would contest so are terrorist acts against our citizens. And we have a duty as a government to protect the people of Australia. So the origins to this bill in part go back to the review from the Insulum, the review into the Division 105 of the Criminal Code. And I go back to his statement that he issued when he launched this inquiry. And, uh, at the time when the bill, the original bill in 2016, the High-Risk Terrorist Offenders Act was uh, legislated, the then Attorney General, um, Senator Brandis, said there is no existing Australian regime for managing terrorist offenders who may continue to pose an unacceptable risk to the community following the expiry of their sentence. Law enforcement agencies can seek to rely on control orders to manage the risk of terrorist offenders upon their release from prison. However, there may be some circumstances where even with controls placed on them, the risk an offender presents to the community is simply too great for them to be released from prison. This is a significant public safety issue. And so the insulin was looking to see whether there were other options that could be effective um, so that this 
fairly extreme in a plural liberal democracy where we believe in the, the rule of law and that once somebody's finished their sentence, they, they should be free. And so he recommended an alternative approach which has resulted in this bill. So there's two parts of the bill. Part one, Schedule one, creates an extended supervision order, the ESO scheme for high-risk terrorist offenders in Division 105, the criminal, 105 Alpha of the Criminal Code. A state or territory Supreme Court would be able to make an ESO in relation to a convicted high-risk terrorist offender if satisfied on the balance of probabilities that the offender poses an unacceptable risk of committing a serious terrorism offence if released into the community at the end of their sentence. And I go back again to the, an example in New Zealand and the UK where that is not a hypothetical, that is lived experience in comparable nations in very recent days. Under an ESO, the court may impose any conditions that it is satisfied are reasonably necessary and reasonably appropriate and adapted for the purpose of protecting the community from the unacceptable risk of the offender committing a serious terrorism offence. ESOs would provide a less restrictive option if the court is not satisfied that a continuing detention order or a CDO is necessary. And so that's the direct outcome of the Insulin's review. Part two uh, amends the Crimes Act, Surveillance Devices Act, uh, the Telecommunic Telecommunications Interception and Access Act, the TI Act, to extend the existing surveillance and monitoring powers which are available for control orders to apply to ESOs, including search warrants, warrants of variance types of electronic surveillance. Uh, so law enforcement agencies will be able to seek uh, electronic surveillance warrants under the SD Act and the TIA Act to inform the AFP Minister's decision as to whether to apply for an ESO or a CDO. So the committee ended up making a number of recommendations, having heard evidence from a range of people. And uh, the key one is uh, recommendation one, that proposed clause 105 alpha of the counterterrorism legislation be amended to provide that an issuing authority must have regard to whether the person is subject to a post-sentence supervision order under state or territory legislation, and if so, the conditions of that order, and the cumulative impact on the person of multiple post-sentence orders under the Commonwealth and state or territory laws, including the risk of oppression when applying for a post-sentence order. And this goes directly to the concerns that were raised uh, by Senator Thorpe, uh, by the Greens, and the government accepted that recommendation <clears throat> and it has agreed to amend the bill in line with the recommendation. And uh, the government notes in its response that the extended supervision order uh, scheme, the ESO scheme, will operate independently of post-sentence PSO schemes at state and territory level, where an offender is eligible under a state or territory scheme and the ESO scheme, the Commonwealth would work in close collaboration with the relevant jurisdictional partners to consider appropriate options on a case-by-case -case basis. It is not the intention that an offender would be subject to concurrent Commonwealth and state or territory orders. And that's an important clarification to make given some of the concerns that have been raised here tonight. Recommendation two, though, is one that I'm very pleased to see. Um, having been on the committee for a number of years, this is an issue I have raised on several occasions. Uh, the Violent Extremism and Risk Assessment Version 2, VERA 2R uh, framework, is the tool that is used to try and determine whether somebody poses an ongoing risk. And this goes to the heart of the issue around the nature of the people who are wedded to an ideology that informs their actions. The basis for this tool comes from people trying to analyse other criminals and a violent offenders, such as sex offenders, to determine whether or not the, the condition that has caused them to be susceptible to offending against children or other people in violent sexual acts is remaining. It's, it's a, trying to assess whether there is a, an illness or a propensity there from a psychological or mental health perspective uh, in somebody. Whereas evidence has shown time and again that many terrorist offenders, and in fact I would argue the majority of terrorist offenders, are quite sane, are quite competent. They just believe and intend to act upon their beliefs of the ideology that they follow. And so the tool that is used, I would argue, 
is not sufficient. I have long argued that one of the key points should be appropriate experts who can look at the ideology and look at what the ideology promotes, the actions of people who adhere to it, so that they can make an assessment that if the person still adheres to that ideology and they have in the past demonstrated they are prepared to act upon those uh, principles or instructions or encouragements from that ideology, that then they will be prepared to either apply an ESO or in many cases, again in the light of the New Zealand and UK example, I would argue a continuing detention order on somebody who has demonstrated that level of propensity for violence, so the, the means and the motivation, if you like, to cause harm to Australia's population. So I'm pleased to see that uh, Vera 2 will be reviewed and looking at other tools, but I would argue that it's a, it's a more comprehensive framework that's required with alternate sources of evidence for the judiciary to consider uh, in terms of whether somebody still poses a risk to the Australian community. I'm pleased to see that uh, the Department of Home Affairs will commission an independent review, uh, given that the government accepted that recommendation, and I certainly trust that uh, the PJCIS will have the opportunity to examine that review and to um, engage with the independent reviewer when they are complete to understand what they have found and where their recommendations go to, because it's a key element in deciding whether somebody should be subject to anything post their sentence at all, but if so, whether an ESO is adequate or whether a CDO is what is required. And if we are going to operate in a rules-based, evidence-based, fair and transparent society, the ways we gather that information for our judicial officers has to be repeatable and fair to all concerned, but above all, effective. And so I welcome and I look forward to the outcome of that review. There are a number of other amendments, the majority of which uh, the government has accepted in full uh, or accepted in part. And Senator McAllister has gone to recommendation seven, uh, so I won't recover uh, that part. But the key I think that comes out of this is that uh, the government has been diligent to work uh, in a bipartisan manner to make sure that the Australian population are safe, to understand the risks, whether it be through foreign interference and espionage, whether it be through terrorism, and put in place measures that give our law enforcement agencies the powers they need to discover, to protect, to apprehend, give our judicial system the powers they need to suitably punish or confine, to protect society. But one of the strengths of this committee and in an environment where so many of the Australian public are somewhat cynical of the institution of the parliament, I think this is a shining example where this parliament, this Senate, this committee, which is a joint committee with the House, works constructively to put in place checks and balances so that we achieve a workable balance that enables our authorities to be effective but still maintains the essential essence of Australia as an open, free, plural society. I commend this bill to the House. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Counterterrorism Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill, and I welcome the opportunity to do so as Chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, who finalised a report into the proposed bill in September. I'm pleased to be following my fellow committee members, our new Deputy Chair, Senator McAllister, and one of our longest serving members, Senator Fawcett, uh, who have made typically thoughtful uh, contributions to this debate as they do to the committee. And at the outset, I wanted to thank all members of the committee, and in particular our former Deputy Chair, uh, Mr Byrne, and the Shadow Attorney General, uh, Mr Dreyfus, uh, who I worked with particularly closely in a bipartisan manner to finalise this report 
and to reach our unanimous recommendations, uh, along with my other Liberal members of the committee. In 2014, Australia's national terrorism threat level was raised to where it unfortunately remains today, and that is probable. That indicates that there is credible intelligence to suggest that groups and individuals have the capability and the intent to conduct a terrorist attack here in Australia. Unfortunately, we cannot fully eliminate the threat of terrorism here in our own country, nor has anyone else around the world been able to do so. Recent attacks allegedly carried out in the name of violent ideologies in the United Kingdom and New Zealand serve to remind us of this fact. What we can do is provide our intelligence, security, law enforcement uh, agencies with the best tools, both operational and legislative, to manage the risk and reduce the threat posed to Australians. And this bill uh, goes to one of those key legislative tools. We know that there are convicted terrorist offenders in prison right now whose sentences are soon to expire. And regrettably, many of those people represent an ongoing threat to the community because they are unrepentant in their ideology and they have been unwilling in many cases to undergo any reform opportunities provided to them in prison, including de-radicalisation programs and other opportunities. There are currently two options available for managing such offenders. Uh, the first is a continuing detention order, which Senator Fawcett spoke about at some length. And that allows a court to order that a person may remain detained where they pose an unacceptable risk to the community and where that risk cannot be addressed through less restrictive means. The second option is a control order, which allows conditions to be placed on a person after they are released back into the community. While these tools have proven at times to be effective, there has remained a glaring hole in the suite of powers that our agencies have to manage this risk. The continuing detention order scheme requires, quite rightly, given the significant deprivation of liberty involved in keeping someone in custody after their sentence has been discharged, it requires a very high legal threshold to be met uh, for a court to agree to an ongoing detention of an offender who continues to pose an unacceptable risk. The, con the control order scheme, currently issued by federal courts, only permits a defined set of conditions to be imposed upon a terrorist offender and it creates unintentionally an interoperability issue whereby the court considering an application for a continuing detention order is not able to impose conditions on the offender where it is not satisfied that a threshold for the continuing detention of the offender is met. This is really important and this bill will address this. Um, what this discrepancy continues to run the risk of is that some offenders may end up walking free with no ongoing supervision, even when the court has concerns that they may pose a serious risk to the community. Uh, the bill seeks to address these issues by introducing an extended supervision order scheme, which would allow a state or territory Supreme Court to make an extended supervision order in relation to a convicted, high-risk terrorist offender, if satisfied, on the balance of probabilities that the offender poses an unacceptable risk of committing a serious terrorism offence if released into the community at their end of their sentence. The ESO scheme provides the court with a wider range of measures that can be used to better tailor the response to a particular offender and their individual circumstances. And the evidence put to the committee is that those circumstances do differ and that different uh, restrictions or supervisions are appropriate to be tailored to meet the needs of that offender and to meet the needs of the community to be protected from that risk. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security reviewed the proposed legislation as well as some further government amendments that were provided to us partway through our inquiry. And we are strongly supportive of the introduction of an extended supervision order scheme to manage this ongoing threat of terrorist offenders. The committee received submissions from agencies such as the Australian Federal Police, as well as public interest groups such as the Law Council of Australia, which assisted us greatly in our consideration of this bill. And I thank them, uh, particularly those regular submitters to the uh, committee, for the way in which they assist us to do our important work. The AFP advised the committee that the terrorism environment in Australia continues to grow in its complexity, and I'll quote, while the national threat level has remained at probable, ongoing challenges to law enforcement include the demise of the Islamic State territorial caliphate and the need to investigate and prepare for the possible return of foreign fighters, continued investigations into domestic attack planning, the aftermath of the March 2019 Christchurch attack, the first mass casualty terrorist attack by an Australian right-wing terrorist, the increased threat of right-wing terrorism, 
the role of technology in propagating violent extremist ideologies and the heightened need to address the reintegration and continuing risks associated with the release of convicted high-risk terrorist offenders completing their head sentence." End quote. The committee noted in particular uh, the evolving nature of the terrorism threat and the increasing complexity associated with people who are unfortunately being radicalised online and, quite disturbingly, in evidence to the committee and since in public um, at a much younger age, which has unfortunately continued and we fear likely accelerated during the COVID pandemic. In considering the evidence provided, uh, what we recommended was, we think, practical and sensible amendments to the bill, including ensuring that issuing authorities consider whether an individual subject is already um, is an individual is subject uh, to a post-sentence order under a similar state or territory regime, and ensuring that the individual and combined effect of all of those conditions remains both proportionate and necessary. The government has accepted in full, in part or in principle, 10 of the 11 recommendations made by the committee. Uh, I want to thank the AFP, the Attorney General's Department and the Department of Home Affairs, as well as the other submitters for their engagement with and their contributions to the committee. And I want to thank the government for its constructive response to the committee's recommendations, which it has um, very sincerely tried to implement as consistently as possible uh, with our report. Um, and that's a very important part of, of what we do. The PJCS continues to strongly support the AFP and the important work they do, ensuring that they have the necessary tools to disrupt the activities of those who would seek to harm the Australian community and our way of life, while also ensuring that the appropriate safeguards and oversight mechanisms are in place. And these do go hand in hand, and the next bill on the agenda, which we'll talk about, relates to some of those oversight uh, and safeguard mechanisms. Um, this bill, uh, including the government amendments that have now been approved by a majority of states and territories in accordance with the intergovernmental agreement on counterterrorism laws, is a really important one to ensuring that the community remains safe and protected from this regrettably ongoing threat of terrorism. It will ensure that our agencies continue to have the appropriate and necessary powers that they need to com combat complex terrorist offenders, and Australians can therefore continue to have confidence in the ability of our law enforcement officers to keep them safe, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator McLaughlin. Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak to the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. Uh, the bill seeks to amend the Criminal Code Act, or the Criminal Code Act 1995, to introduce the concept of an extended supervision order, which may be imposed on terrorist offenders uh, if they are released into the community, and on a balance of probabilities if the court finds that they pose an unacceptable risk, they can, they can apply various conditions on the individual. And there's also ancillary amendments in the body of the bill, which expands monitoring and surveillance powers to support this initiative. As an old defence lawyer, these types of bills do always put a shiver up my spine. They always have the language of Orwell, and they should be considered at great length before passing any parliament. In this instance, in my review of the bill, I have found comfort not only in the process of the bill outlined by my friend and colleague, Senator Patterson, it is not a knee-jerk reaction to a supposed problem. It is a real problem. The foundation stone of this initiative is that there is an, increase, an existing and increasing terrorist threat to this country. As groups seek to take away and challenge our liberty with asymmetric warfare. And as my other colleague and friend, Senator Mullen, has expressed, it is only going to increase unfortunately, and become far more complicated. Also, which gives me comfort in relation to this bill, is that the parliament has already decided to have this type of order. So it would be presumptive of me, as a new member of the Senate, to rail against an order when the parliament has already settled on a regime of this nature. In fact, this provides an additional, less restrictive option for the courts not only because there is a potential a possibility for a, uh, a person that will not reject their, their ways of evil and violence, 
that they may fall between uh, the current legislative regime and return to civilian life, but also because it is less restrictive and gives greater options. We have already in this country control orders, interim control orders, preventative detention orders and continuing detention orders. So the fact that this is less restrictive and provides a less restrictive options should find favour with members of this Senate. It has gone through the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. It has been examined by the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. It comes uh, from a suggestion of the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. And it, of course, has been subject to an inquiry by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. The Parliament and this Senate has worked hard to bring this bill to the chamber without any unnecessary oppressive conditions and sought to balance the rights of the individual against the needs of the collective. That is, of course, always a difficult conundrum. There were two aspects of the bill which were, uh, if I can use the term, debated by the various uh, committees. One was that this is a form of punishment. There's always an objection if a person commits a crime, they are then tried, found guilty and punished, that, that once the, the punishment is complete, they shouldn't be punished again. The rationale for the bill by the government and it has some merit, is that this is a control order about future risk and not a compounding punishment. You have to accept that principle to accept this bill. Uh, I dealt with this sort of ethical dilemma when I was in state parliament and similar legislation was brought in by the Labor government in relation to sex offenders who weren't rehabilitated but leaving prison and posing a significant risk to the community. And the parliament similarly uh, settled on a like rationale. The other aspect of the bill which was subject to much debate, again in the committees or dialogue between the various parties, was the concept uh, of the lower uh, burden of proof on the balance of probabilities that there was an unacceptable risk or likelihood of an unacceptable risk. And the government's view, which was uh, accepted by, by um, members of the committee in, the, in, in its dialogue, in many of these committees in their dialogue, was that um, this is a lesser condition placed on the individuals. The others are detention orders and thus should have a higher burden. This is, this is a less restrictive condition which allows potentially these individuals to return to the community, albeit under a particular reporting conditions or, and, and or surveillance. So again, the resolution or the landing of both the government and the various committees has given me comfort and I, and, uh, I appreciate also the comments from across the aisle from members of the Labor Party similarly uh, take, taking a view that we, we appear to have landed at least in a position of uh, some balance. Now, speaking of balance, I've always had an interest in the debate about liberal democracies re restricting individuals' rights in the pursuit of the collective security. It's a fascinating topic and there are dare I say, hundreds, maybe more, articles on this topic. And in my, in my reading, when contemplating uh, my comments tonight in the debate, I came across an article by Christopher McCau Michelson, if I hope I've pronounced his cor uh, name correctly, and an article in 2006 which was balancing civil liberties against national security. He argues, interestingly, that the dichotomy between civil, civil liberties and 
uh, uh, civil liberties and restricting them for national security is a false dichotomy, a false debate, and not, not a rewarding one that will lead you down the path of a, a rational conclusion. And in fact, uh, he, points, he points out that people always argue that we must curtail civil liberties to combat terrorism. And on the flip side, others argue that if we curtail our liberties, we know better than the terrorists. That's an oversimplification of a complicated argument. But he does cite uh, various aspects of German law, and I do not profess to uh, be an expert in German law at all. It is something I have never studied. Uh, I do have a degree in Scots law, but it's unhelpful this evening. But German um, constitutional jurisprudence uses a proportionality test, and it consists of three main requirements. Any contail entailment of constitutionally protected civil liberties and human rights must generally be one, suitable, two, necessary and three, appropriate. I only raise this point uh, for the benefit of members and perhaps their future reading, but I think even if you apply that test, having regard to the various reviews by the committees, this bill should find favour of the Senate. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, and at the outset, can I say uh, I was privileged to hear three very thoughtful contributions to this debate before having the opportunity to uh, myself speak. Um, first, from Senator Fawcett, uh, who has been a long-standing member of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Uh, who gave a particularly thoughtful contribution, I thought, in relation to the practical matters of evidence gathering and how these need to be considered in the context of the particular case. Then from Senator Patterson, who I think is making an outstanding contribution as chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and provided some sobering reflections based on submissions to the inquiry in relation to Australia's current threat level and exhorted us to ensure that, as senators in this place, we have regard to what are the tools needed, what are the tools needed by our intelligence law enforcement agencies to combat the terrorist risk, both on an operational basis but also a legislative basis. And in that regard, I think the point that Senator Patterson made in terms of the two options currently available in terms of a continuing detention order as opposed to a control order and the need to have something else, something else uh, through being the extended supervision order, which provides a bit more flexibility, a bit more flexibility in relation to the controls which could be placed on a particular individual. And as Senator McLaughlin spoke so uh, intelligently about the fact is that that option actually provides the judiciary in particular with an order, an option to impose some sort of control which is something less than a continuing detention order. And that should really be borne at front of mind as we consider this legislation before the chamber this evening. And I think there were actually a number of uh, uh, contributions which Senator McLaughlin made during the, course of, uh, during the course of his contribution to the debate, which I think should give the Australian public great comfort. It should give the Australian public great comfort that when matters such as this come before this chamber, that there are senators such as Senator McLaughlin, Senator Patterson I referred to, Senator Fawcett, Senator McAllister, who is now Deputy Chair of the uh, PC, PCJ uh, Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence Security Matters, who think thoughtfully, thoughtfully about these matters and are alive, alive to the inherent tension between the inherent tension between ensuring the protection of our community on the one hand and on the other being mindful of every citizen's rights and liberties and the rule of law. And I think uh, a few of the points which Senator McLaughlin made, which I want to pick up, are first the process this bill has gone through. 
the process this bill has gone through. And I believe vehemently, passionately, that process is extraordinarily important when this place considers legislation. It is so important that the public peak groups, be it the Law Council of Australia or other groups, have the opportunity to make detailed submissions with respect to proposed laws and that those submissions are considered soberly and intelligently and where amendments are proposed, which should be considered uh, and, and adopted, that they are adopted and that necessary amendments are made and that governments of whatever persuasion don't simply stand on their dig and refuse to make amendments with respect to draft legislation. So I'm very pleased, I'm very pleased that Senator McLaughlin referred to that process, including the fact that the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security Matters made a number of recommendations to the government, and those recommendations were adopted, were adopted by the relevant departments and amendments made to this legislation, which we're considering this evening. And in addition to that, as Senator McLaughlin referred to, this bill has also gone in front of a number of scrutiny committees. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of the Senate scrutiny committee process. A big fan. The scrutiny of delegated legislation committee, where I serve uh, with my good friend Senator Davey, who's with us this evening, uh, and also the scrutiny of legislation and, and Senator Ciccone. Sorry, Senator Ciccone, um, but also serve. Uh, with, uh, with my good friend Senator Giacconi on that committee, who makes an outstanding contribution to that committee. And, also, and I, see, well, I see Senator McAllister there, there as well. I, I gave you a compliment. I didn't even know you were in the chamber um, in terms of serving as deputy chair on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Uh, and also the Human Rights Scrutiny Committee. So this legislation has gone in front of both of those scrutiny committees. And also the Security Intelligence Monitor has, uh, has considered uh, this matter as well. So that process, that process should give a lot of comfort to the Australian public. And I think also Senator McLaughlin made a very um, intelligent observation that similar issues have been considered in the realm of sex offenders. And this is not a case of compounding punishment. It's not a case of compounding punishment but as Senator McLaughlin says, of mitigating future risk. Mitigating future risk. And that needs to be considered. Mr Acting Deputy President, I think the most important duty of any government is to protect our law-abiding citizens, protect our nation against threats, be they external or internal. And in doing so, the appropriate balance must be, must be sought with respect to also protecting the rights and liberties of everyone residing in this country. I did reflect on three recent terrorist attacks and how this bill interrelates with what occurred in those three cases. The 2019 London Bridge terrorist attack, where the perpetrator had been serving a 16-year sentence on terrorist charges and had been released on licence and had notwithstanding uh, some of the observation <laughs> procedures which had been uh, implemented with respect to him, had uh, managed to perpetrate a terrorist crime uh, to great consequence and um, with a number of fatalities. Then there was the Streatham attack in 2020. Again, another a stabbing attack, terrorist attack. Again, someone who had committed a previous offence, terror, terrorist-related offence, was under surveillance but still perpetrated another crime against innocent people. And of course then the Auckland attack on 3 September 2021, closer to home, where eight New Zealanders were stabbed in a crime which was perpetuated by someone who'd been again released from prison, in this case in July of 2021 and had been followed for 53 days straight by the police force or security force in New Zealand. 53 days straight they followed him, but still, still they couldn't prevent that awful attack uh, on those eight people who were stabbed during that awful incident. And so this is a real issue. This is a real issue. And this place would not be, we in this place would not be discharging our duty if we weren't to soberly consider whether or not, as Senator Patterson put it, our intelligence agencies 
have all the tools at their disposal to protect Australians. So looking, at, and I have looked at the tests, as Senator McLaughlin has looked at the tests, and to consider whether or not there are appropriate checks and balance, balances. And as Senator McLaughlin came to the conclusion, I too have come to the conclusion that those checks and balances certainly are here. This only applies to high-risk terrorist offenders. The Supreme Court of a state or a territory has to be satisfied on the balance of probabilities that a convicted high-risk terrorist offender poses an unacceptable, unacceptable risk of reoffending, and that any conditions which are imposed are reasonably appropriate and reasonably necessary to protect the community. And I think that's an appropriate test. I think that's an appropriate test, and I don't think I'd be discharging my duty as a senator if I weren't to support the legislation which is before the chamber this evening. It should also be noted that there are other reforms, other amendments which are being brought in conjunction with this legislation around the use of search warrants, electronic surveillance, uh, and there has been appropriate consideration as to whether or not some of the decisions which are made under the course of this uh, legislation, implementation of this legislation, should be subject to judicial review. And uh, I think appropriate uh, consideration has been given in that regard and an appropriate conclusion reached in that respect. So, in summary, Mr Acting Deputy President, I think this, the regime in this legislation provides more flexibility. It allows courts to impose conditions which are more specific, which are more tailored to the idiosyncrasies of a particular case, and I think that's appropriate, and above all, protects the community and strikes the right balance in also protecting the rights and liberties of our citizens. I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And it's a pleasure to rise tonight um, to speak on the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. And I have been in, um, sitting in the chamber for some time now listening to, um, to the debate on this bill and uh, indeed looking around the chamber. And it's always nice to be in here on a night when we are debating legislation and we see senators from both sides of the chamber nodding along in agreement to each other's contributions. And it's certainly um, a testament to the uh, hard work um, in a bipartisan um, regard undertaken by the Parliamentary uh, Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. And, um, we've heard many considered contributions in here tonight on this bill. Um, Senator, senators uh, Molan, Fawcett, McLaughlin, uh, Scar, just now um, I listened along to and they all made uh, very um, very reflective contributions, very considered contributions um, that go to all of the complexities around dealing with these very significant national threats that we now find ourselves um, dealing with. And um, certainly um, Senator Patterson, as well as the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, um, again went through some of the nuances around this legislation. Um, and outlined the work that the PJCIS undertook to ensure that this legislation um, does strike the right balance. And um, I think it was Senator Scar who mentioned in his contribution the um, importance or indeed the, the primacy of government's role in protecting our nation against threats and that that is um, an incredibly important thing that motivates many people to seek election to this place and I think all of us um, to consider in the back of our minds when we are, um, when we are passing legislation through these chambers. And um, As a member of the coalition government, I am proud of everything that this government has done since I was first elected um, in 2019 to keep Australians safe. Um, indeed, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, previously um, in my role as a committee member on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Senate Committee, um, I had the opportunity of uh, questioning um, the Australian Federal Police, ASIO, um, Home Affairs, the Attorney General's Department and the like about um, the very issues that this legislation attempts to deal with, about 
the um, current security threat in our country and about um, what we can do to keep our community safe um, from those who seek to harm us in such horrendous ways. So this bill that we are uh, debating here this evening, I know is just um, another part of the another brick in the wall, so to speak, um, of us doing everything that we can um, to keep our community safe. Um, this legislation is one that we know is necessary to keep Australians safe, to keep our communities safe. We know that there are people in this country who want to kill and in injure innocent Australians in pursuing their extremist agendas. And we know this because many of them have been caught in the act of preparing to commit mass murder and violence. They've been found guilty by a court, they've been convicted and they've been sent to prison. And we also know that many of these convicted terrorists have been given sentences which allow them to be released from prison after just a few years behind bars. And we know that in many cases, security services will consider these people to be still committed to their dangerous ideology and determined to use their release to continue to pursue violence and murder. Um, and again, this is something that I have pursued with the AFP previously at Senate Estimates. It continues to amaze me, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we, uh, or that as a society rather, we insist on giving second and third chances to the worst kinds of criminals who have committed or planned to commit the worst possible types of crimes against innocent Australians. We see it all the time with sex offenders and child abusers. These dangerous criminals are sentenced to a few short years in prison. And then they're back in the community, despite the fact that many of the experts believe that such offenders will never be rehabilitated and will always be at risk of causing more harm. And terrorism is another type of crime where it is clear cut. If you've planned or participated in a terrorist act, you shouldn't be out on the streets. Not today, not tomorrow, not next year. And most of the responsibility for ensuring that uh, is the case of course, rests with the courts. And as a parliament, we can only do so much. But that's why it's important that we do exercise the powers we have as lawmakers to keep the community safe from those who we know wish to do us harm. This bill that we're debating here this evening helps to achieve this by improving the ability for our courts to make extended supervision orders, or ESOs, in relation to a convicted high-risk terrorist offender and, under that ESO, to impose any conditions that it is satisfied are reasonably necessary for the purpose of protecting the community. Sadly, we've seen around the world examples where known terror suspects and previously convicted terrorists have committed further atrocities when they've been released and we know that the risk of terrorist acts remains present. Last year, we saw the UK Parliament uh, having to rush through legislation to end the absurd practice of automatically releasing terrorists halfway through their sentence after one of those terrorists committed another heinous act following their release. There is little doubt that law enforcement and security agencies have serious concerns about the release of convicted terrorists who not so long ago conspired to murder innocent Australians. It has been reported that some retain active contact and influence with terrorist circles, including actively working to recruit other violent criminals to their terrorist ideology. This revelation demonstrates the problem with courts giving terrorists the benefit of the doubt at sentencing. There's every chance that they will walk out of jail on the date by which the court hoped they'd be rehabilitated, having spent their time in jail continuing to hold and expound to others the same murderous ideology. Mr Acting Deputy President, our security services and our police forces do a fantastic job tracking down terrorists and putting them behind bars. So why do we let them back out on the streets and tie up our law enforcement services tracking and monitoring the same terrorists that they've previously caught? They certainly don't deserve that kind of generous optimism. Our terrorists don't, and the Australian public doesn't deserve to be put at risk. For the large proportion of criminals who are not seriously dangerous and whose crimes are of lesser magnitude, rehabilitation is quite rightly a significant priority of the justice system. 
um, for those criminals, that is an appropriate, um, an appropriate avenue that, that we should um, pursue. But to prioritise the hope that a terrorist would have learnt the error of their ways after a few years in prison over the public safety of having them detained and off the streets is absolute madness. And our sentencing system and indeed um, the process that we have for dealing with these violent offenders on release needs to be able to deal with the potential that at the end of the initial head sentence there is still a serious community safety concern. And that's what this bill that we're debating here is all about. The courts and the parliament must be putting community safety first and keeping these dangerous criminals off the streets and behind bars. So to go to the detail of the bill, Mr Acting Deputy President, part one of schedule one of the bill creates the extended supervision order scheme, the ESO scheme, for high-risk terrorist offenders in Division 105A of the Criminal Code. A state or territory Supreme Court would be able to make an ESO in relation to a convicted high-risk terrorist offender if satisfied on the balance of probabilities that the offender poses an unacceptable risk of committing a serious terrorism offence if released into the community at the end of their sentence. Under an ESO, the court may impose any condition that it is satisfied are reasonably necessary and reasonably appropriate and adapted for the purpose of protecting the community from the unacceptable risk of the offender committing a serious terrorism effect. Again, Mr Acting Deputy President, what this bill does is minimises some of the guesswork that might have to be undertaken once a, uh, a, an offender's sentence has expired and instead creates a new opportunity to make that assessment and determine whether or not this, these, um, the individual concerned is still um, of significant risk to the community. And that is incredibly important. Um, part two of Schedule One um, does a number of other things, um, amending various pieces of legislation, the Crimes Act 1914, Surveillance Devices Act 2004, the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979, to extend the existing surveillance and monitoring powers which were available for control orders to apply to ESOs, including search warrants and warrants for various types of electronic surveillance. Law enforcement agencies will be able to seek electronic surveillance warrants under the uh, Surveillance Devices Act and the Telecommunications Interpretation and Access Act to inform the minister's decision um, whether to apply for an ESO or a CDO. Part two of Schedule One also amends the National Security Information Criminal and Civil Proceedings Act 2004 to extend the court-only evidence provisions and the special advocate scheme that applies in control order proceedings to ESO proceedings. And there are a number of uh, further amendments to other important pieces of legislation in the remaining schedules of uh, the bill, which in the nature of time uh, I will leave to others to go into, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, as I said, the government is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all Australians. Um, and in my opening remarks, I noted that um, as a member of the government commencing my term as a senator in 2019, I'm very proud of all of the work that we have done in this space. Um, we have seen recent terrorist attacks. I mentioned um, in the United Kingdom, but other colleagues have referenced in their contributions ones far closer to home in New Zealand where convicted terrorist offenders do continue to pose a risk to the community at the end of their sentence. And this bill will enhance the safety and security of every Australian by creating these ESOs to ensure that those high-risk terrorist offenders can be appropriately managed in the community at the end of their custodial sentence. As I've said, a Supreme Court will be able to impose an ESO for up to three years at a time if that court is satisfied on the balance of probabilities on the basis of admissible evidence that the offender poses an unacceptable risk of committing a serious terrorism offence. And the court will be able to impose any condition on any offender that it considers is proportionate to the risk that the offender poses. The bill also provides agencies with the necessary tools to monitor compliance with these orders and to protect sensitive national security information in ESO proceedings. And we know that this is incredibly important that our law enforcement agencies do have the tools 
um, all the tools that they should have available to them um, to be able to monitor compliance, because that um, can be a, an incredibly complex and an often incredibly costly exercise. So we should be doing everything that we can to make that uh, process easier for law enforcement. Um, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has considered this bill um, and made recommendations, and the government has accepted 10 of those in full, in part or in principle. So, um, again, it has been um, so, um, so interesting to be sitting here in this chamber this evening and listening to the debate on this incredibly important bill and um, seeing the, the, the fruits of the uh, PJCIS bipartisan process in, sitting, uh, in, um, in reviewing this legislation and ensuring that it, um, that it strikes that important balance between, um, as I think uh, Senator Scar said before me, um, ensuring that all our citizens are equal under the law and that we are all afforded the, um, the um, rule of law and natural justice on one hand, but on the other, ensuring that our community is kept safe. And I think that this bill, the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill, will go part of the way um, to keeping Australians safe. And I know that we as a government have already done so much to ensure that Australians are safe and will continue to do so into the future. We have a firm commitment to the Australian people that we will do whatever it takes to keep you safe and to ensure the safety of all Australians. And on that note, Mr Acting Deputy President, I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak on the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment, the High-Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2021. And, uh, it's great to follow some excellent contributions from my fellow senators. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to Senator Chandler and Senator Scar before her. And I was in the chamber earlier, uh, beginning of this bill, uh, and heard uh, Senator Keneally with her uh, opening for the opposition. And uh, it's, it's terrific to see the bipartisan way in which this bill uh, is being addressed. And, uh, and I thank uh, the Labor Party for their continued support for such important issues and important matters. Uh, particularly as they come before the Senate. Uh, I am proud to be part of a government that's so committed to a strong stance on national security. Uh, and I've seen that ever since I've been elected. Uh, since the beginning of, of my term, I've seen the, the, uh, the significant commitment that this government has to protecting uh, Australians against uh, uh, the atrocities of, of terrorism, ensuring that that is uh, dealt with, stamped out and certainly addressed. Uh, but we must always remain vigilant. Uh, this isn't just a set and forget uh, situation. Uh, we know that uh, these threats are continually evolving. Therefore, legislation has to keep up with that. Uh, our, the way that we address it, the way we police it, the way that we uh, uh, thwart uh, potential attacks uh, obviously has to continue to evolve. And, and this legislation goes, goes uh, some of the way to addressing some of, the, uh, you know, some of those evolving and changing circumstances. Uh, over the next 10 years, this government has committed over $270 billion uh, to defence spending, a figure that's up 40 per cent since 2016. Uh, we're a government that is absolutely committed to the security of our nation, committed to protecting Australians, whether it's here, uh, and on our own soil, or indeed across the world, in thwarting uh, the development and the rising up of uh, terrorist agents that would uh, actors that would uh, seek to disrupt our way of life, impede upon our freedoms, and sadly cause misery and attack upon uh, Australian citizens, indeed anyone in this country. Uh, the Morrison government is committed to ensuring the safety of and security of all Australians. Australia has a robust national security and counterterrorism framework that ensures our agencies have the powers that they require to prevent terrorist attacks and manage those who would seek to commit them. Now, since the terror threat level was raised to probable in 2014, the government, uh, the government has passed 19 tranches of national security legislation 
This legislation ensures agencies have the powers that they need, that they need to be able to prevent terrorist attacks. These laws are kept under constant review to ensure that our legal frameworks are appropriate and adapted to the evolving threat environment. Uh, protecting the community from terrorist attacks is, is ultimately one of its governments, the Australian government's highest responsibilities. Uh, it's certainly one of our highest priorities. If the Australian people know one thing about the Morrison government is that it has not shied away from the key task of keeping them safe. Uh, the last, latest piece in our national security and regional security puzzle, the AUKUS announcement, for example, is an important example of this. And I'll have more to say about AUKUS in, in just a moment. This bill will give our domestic law enforcement agencies an important tool in their toolbox to keep Australians safe. Uh, it will enable the creation of what is known as an Extended Supervision Order, or ESO. Uh, that high-risk terrorist offenders can be placed under, operating under Division 105A of the Criminal Code. Now, under this new scheme, respective state and territory supreme courts will be able to make an extended supervision order in relation to a convicted high-terrorist offender if they believe that, on the balance of probabilities, the offender poses an unacceptable risk of committing a serious terrorism offence if released into the community at the end of their sentence. This will ensure the ongoing safety of the community from these criminals in situations where the court is not convinced that ongoing detention is necessary, but where a risk is still present. As we've seen in recent years, convicted terrorist offenders uh, can continue to post a significant risk to the community, even, even after they've served their sentences of their initial crimes. This was played out, sadly, in the tragic consequences of the 2019 London Bridge attack and also uh, recently, more recently, in the, uh, the recent terror attack in New Zealand. And we must ensure that Australians are safe from convicted terrorists. With several convicted terrorist offenders due to complete their custodial sentences of imprisonment in the next five years, the need for effective risk management measures to keep our community safe is greater than ever. These people can never be allowed to perpetrate such an attack on Australian soil. If anything should or could unite all of us in this place, it should be that. And as I said before, I'm very pleased to see and hear that the Labor Party is supporting this bill and, and indeed for their approach on the, the committee, the Security Committee, the Joint Select Committee, is, uh, is, is very is very important, and, uh, and I thank them for the way that they approach this on a, on a bipartisan nature. Uh, the, the implementation of an extended supervision order can be ordered order. for up to three years by a relevant court and can involve any condition on any offender that it considers proportionally risky. Now, that is, any condition can be applied to any convicted terrorist that a court feels is necessary to keep Australians safe. Now, these conditions can include prohibitions, uh, restrictions or obligations. And we need uh, law enforcement agencies uh, need to be able to uh, have the legal operations to make decisions to keep Australians safe. And this is what this bill is enabling. This is exactly what this bill is doing. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has considered the bill and made 11 recommendations. The government is accepting 10 of those recommendations in full, in part or in principle. Now, the Greens' refusal to support this bill is disappointing. It's, it's predictable, but it is nonetheless disappointing and, and shameful, in fact. They point out that many counter-terrorism laws have never been used. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Thank God for that, that we actually haven't had to use them. Because that would mean that there's been an atrocity that's occurred on our shores. Now, I return to the AUKUS agreement. Minister Dutton signed just hours ago an official agreement with the United Kingdom and the United States to access their nuclear submarine technology. This is a big step for our country, a very big step. Uh, we are taking it, uh, taking it in lockstep. We're going in lockstep with two of our closest allies. 
helping to ensure that the safety and the security of our nation, as well as our, for our region and our regional allies. I just want to commend uh, Minister Dutton, uh, the Prime Minister, Minister Payne and all those involved in the negotiation of this very important and indeed historical agreement. There really has been an agreement like this uh, for many, many years. It's emblematic, emblematic of Australia's commitment to uphold our role in the Asia-Pacific while recognising the importance of our traditional allies. It also emblematic of this government's commitment to national security, and I must admit uh, Labor's commitment to that as well on that, in this regard to AUKUS is also commendable. Uh, and their bipartisanship, as I've said already, on this bill is also uh, much appreciated. This is, uh, but it's not only in submarine technology that uh, we are increasing our cooperation with the US and the UK. In 2019, it was announced that the United States and Australia had entered into formal negotiations for a bilateral agreement under the United States Clarifying Laws Overseas Use of Data Act, the Cloud Act. Uh, as the first step towards significantly boosting law enforcement cooperation between the two allies, uh, with strong protections for the rule of law, privacy and, importantly, for civil liberties. Now, contained within the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment, this bill, the High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2021, is a schedule amending the framework that facilitates Australia's entering into cross-border access to data agreements. This will make it easier for data sharing between the United States and Australian law enforcement and border security personnel. This data can also be used to monitor ESO orders uh, and would cover all supervisory orders related to terrorism and terrorism-related activities made under Part 5.3 of the Criminal Code. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, this bill is an important addition to the government's response to the terrorism threat that the amendments to the Criminal Code have been approved by a majority of states and territories, we've heard, and as required by intergovernment uh, governmental agreement on counterterrorism laws. Uh, to enable the Parliament to give full consideration of this bill, it was referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, who have point, uh, reported back. Uh, as I said before, nearly all of the recommendations of this report uh, of, the, of this committee were implemented. And it really is time for this uh, legislation to be dealt with here and to, to be passed. And so I certainly do commend the bill to the Senate. But in closing, can I uh, just thank the dedication of, of that committee? Uh, Senator Keneally, in her uh, opening remarks, uh, made reference to the, the way that that committee works so well together and uh, particularly pointed out that a lot of the, the heavy lifting of this was, was done by the the, the previous chair, uh, now Minister, uh, Defense, Assistant Defence Minister, Minister Hasty, uh, in his role. So I, I certainly thank him, uh, the, the, the now chair, uh, Senator Patterson, uh, for his commitment as well uh, to this. Uh, the work that they do on that committee is so important. Uh, we carry, uh, they carry such a, a, a quite a significant administrative load and, and uh, the work that they do uh, really is to be commended. Uh, and the dedication that I think um, in particular I'd single out uh, Minister, Minister Hastie, the, the former uh, chair of, of this uh, important committee, the, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Uh, I know uh, he, he absolutely committed himself to this committee uh, as a former SAS uh, officer himself, someone that uh, was very uh, very, very, very committed. Uh, we, we, he knows uh, security uh, and his dedication to this, as, as indeed all members of that committee, is very much appreciated. So I pass on and I thank them very much indeed. And in that, I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, can I thank my parliamentary colleagues for their contributions to the debate on the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Defenders Bill? 2020. Protecting the community from terrorist threat is and will continue to be one of the government's highest priorities. This bill will be an important addition to the government's response to protect the community and keep Australians safe.
from terrorist threats. Extended supervision orders will, will complement and add to the existing tools available to manage high-risk terrorist offenders at the end of their custodial sentences. I would like to thank the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security for its detailed consideration of this bill. I also thank my colleagues across the chamber for recognising the need for these important measures. This bill reflects the government's ongoing commitment to protecting the Australian community from terrorists and ensuring our law enforcement and security agencies have the power they need to respond to the evolving threat of terrorism. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question before the chair is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Thorpe. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment, amendment moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to, to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. There being uh, seven noes and 29, um, sorry, there being seven ayes and 29 noes, the uh, matter resolved in the negative. Uh, <laughs> uh, the question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the I think that the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davy Teller for the ayes and Senator McKim Teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 30, no 7. The question is resolved in the affirmative. No amendments have been. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter terrorism and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Are you calling a division? Your position can be noted. Uh, as opposing, uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to counter-terrorism and for related purposes. 